Finally, critics, for example, Yates 1991, 14, often claim affirmative action substitutes equality of outcome for equality of opportunity, instead of giving everyone a right to strive with no guarantee of success, affirmative action gives blacks the right to succeed. It should be clear by now that compensation theorists countenance no such shift. The whole problem, they claim, is that blacks lacked equal opportunity for centuries, and imposing equal outcomes now simply yields what opportunities equal in the usual sense would have produced. If Prospector Jones has more nuggets than Prospector Smith because Smith was kept from panning in the stream, asking Jones to back away from the stream for a while to let Smith pan by himself is not a new kind of equality. By traditional criteria Smith deserves the time he should have had earlier. Thus Hettinger. Affirmative action takes away the greater than equal opportunity white males generally have, and thus it brings us closer to a situation in which all members of society have an equal chance of succeeding through the use of their talents. It is not the purpose of affirmative action. To disadvantage white males in order to take away the advantage a sexist and racist society gives to them. 23 But noticing that this occurs is sufficient to dispel the illusion that affirmative action undermines the equality of opportunity for white males. 1997, 311. Compensation theorists do not see themselves as changing the rules. If blacks are innately as able as whites, unequal outcomes indicate unequal opportunity. When will it all end? As soon as the unfair advantage is gone, affirmative, action, will stop. The elimination of unfair advantage can be determined by showing that the percentage of blacks hired and admitted at least roughly equaled the percentage of blacks in the population, Harwood 1993, 82, as Justices Thunder from the bench, asked and answered. By the racism hypothesis. 8.8. .8. Racism, race differences and the attainment gap. Let us review the considerable evidence against the amorphous claim that racism explains the attainment gap. 24. The gap in attainment between blacks and whites in Africa is wider than the American racial gap, yet blacks were not enslaved in Africa and colonialism, which began in the 19th century, ended after World War II. Extensive economic investment in black Africa has not been accompanied by economic growth, nor prevented Africa from reverting to pre-technological conditions. Occam's razor, pairing away multiple explanations of the economic failure of similar populations, implies that oppression is not a significant cause of the attainment gap in the United States. The sheer passage of time makes reference to slavery progressively less plausible. Slavery in the United States ended almost a century and a half ago, yet the attainment gap, while narrower than decades ago, has persisted, and other mistreated populations, conspicuously Jews and Asians, have come farther in less time. The Asian comparison is particularly telling, since Asians, like blacks, are visually identifiable. Sheer identifiability cannot be the factor distinguishing blacks from more successful ethnic groups. The allegedly unique American black experience of slavery and Jim Crow is not unusual in global perspective. Enslavement and subjugation have been common occurrences throughout history, and judged wrong only by their morality developed recently in Western Europe. About 400,000 blacks were shipped to the United States during the 18th century. The height of the slave trade, read 1969, and about 750,000 in all. The usual estimate for the death rate among transhipped slaves is 1 in 5, a rate 3 orders of magnitude lower than that of the Nazi extermination of the Jews. The archives at Tuskegee University contain records of 4,709 lynchings of blacks between 1886 and 1966. Applebaum 1992, the highest testament I have seen for the number of lynchings of blacks is 5,000, an unremarkable level of violence, historically speaking. 1,300 whites were also lynched in this period, Taylor 1992-92, so lynching was not the war of whites against blacks it is usually represented to have been. 
The Jim Crow era began with Plessy v. Ferguson in 1896, following great federal efforts to aid blacks during Reconstruction, and ended with school integration in 1954. Private discrimination against blacks became illegal in 1964, preferences favoring blacks were in place by 1970. It is difficult to recall another instance in which a dominant group voluntarily restricted itself in this way. Since 1970 blacks have received set-asides, special programs, and the sympathetic attention of academics, the media, and business. I mentioned earlier the $2 billion spent by the National Science Foundation and NIH since 1972 to stimulate the intellectual development of blacks. By now hundreds of billions have been spent on Head Start. Publications such as Directory of Financial Aid to Minorities, Schlachter and Goldstein N.D., and Directory of Special Programs for Minority Group Members, Garrett N.D., list literally thousands of training programs, scholarships, fellowships, internships, and awards reserved for blacks, and, usually, non-European Hispanics along with women. Twenty-five blacks at Pennsylvania State University are given $500 for every grade over C, Taylor 1992. Although their high school records are much worse, blacks are admitted to college at much higher rates than whites, in 1995, for instance, Rice took 25% of white applicants as against 52% of black applicants while Amherst took 19% of white applicants and 51% of black, Zelnick 1996, 133 to 134. The mean law school aptitude test score of first year black law students is 1.5 SD below the mean white score, Henstein and Murray 1994, 455. White elites strive to put blacks in a favorable light, Producers of movies and television programs go out of their way to portray blacks as able, high status figures, the black computer whiz has become a staple of action movies, and advertisers scrupulously include blacks in group photos. A willingness on the part of whites to give blacks a chance would seem to be shown by the election in recent decades of black mayors in New York, Los Angeles, Trenton, Philadelphia, Chicago, Cleveland, and Denver and a black governor in Virginia. The Joint Chiefs of Staff has had a black chairman. Most of the budget of Howard University, the best known black college, is supplied by the federal government. For many decades the legal staffs of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People and their, now unaffiliated, NAACP Legal Defense Fund have been mostly white. The acid test of what someone thinks of a situation is what he does about it, and blacks clearly prefer the United States to other countries, including those in which blacks are the majority. Thousands of Haitians risk the trip from Hispaniola to the American mainland in rickety boats, and the immigration quotas of African nations are always filled. At the same time, American blacks have shown no interest in emigrating to Haiti, the Ivory Coast, Botswana, or Rwanda. This is not the behavior of a group whose prospects are limited by oppression. All told, as W. J. Wilson, 1987, 11, has remarked, it is difficult to maintain that racism has increased in the United States since World War II.26 Objectively speaking, a black born after 1965 has experienced, not oppression, but unparalleled privilege, yet by many standards, including crime, marital stability and illegitimacy, blacks are worse off. Indeed, American blacks at the end of World War II may usefully be compared to the Germans and Japanese of that period, whose countries lay in ruins under the occupation of foreign powers. Japan had suffered two atomic attacks, a collective psychic trauma, if one believes in such things, as severe as any in black history. Contemporary black father absence is often traced to the disruption of families during slavery, by way of comparison, 25% of the adult male population of Germany had been killed in the war, and hundreds of thousands of German women raped by Russian soldiers. By any measure, 
Japanese and Germans were worse off than the American black population in 1945. Yet by 1950 Germany had attained its 1936 production level, Spania 1962, 43, and within three decades Germany and Japan had become world economic leaders. Family stability is not a problem in either country. It seems plausible to attribute the different trajectories of their three cultures to the traits of Germans, Japanese and blacks. Post-war European prosperity is often traced to the Marshall Plan, now almost a metaphor for what blacks need, as in for today's inner cities, perhaps only a domestic Marshall Plan will do the job, Popeno 1992. This comparison only highlights the investment that has already been made in the inner cities. Between 1948 and 1952 the United States spent $12 billion rebuilding Europe, Spania 1962, or $204 billion in 1990 dollars.27 in 1990 the total outlay for aid for families with dependent children, food stamps, housing and other subsidies for the poor, what is colloquially called welfare was $215 billion. Blacks received 41.3% of this, rec to 1,992b, or about $88 billion. The black-white income ratio stabilized at 57% in the early 1970s, James and Williams 1989, 287, Curry and Thomas 1995, Table 2, as federal and state income taxes are progressive. Blacks may be assumed to pay about 50 cents in taxes for every dollar whites do. So blacks, at 12% of the population, collectively pay about 6% of the cost of welfare, or roughly $13 billion, for a net annual white to black transfer of roughly $75 billion. This is in effect a Marshall Plan for the inner cities every three years. Another way to conceive the actual situation is that the black population, constituting 40% of welfare dependency and paying 6% of its costs, receives about 41 6 equals $6.83 for every $1 it pays in welfare, while the rest of the population pays 94% of the cost of welfare to receive $0.59 slash $.94 equals $.63 for every $1 paid. The net black rate of return for spending on public assistance is thus roughly 10 times the white rate, a ratio which increases when non-European Hispanics are excluded from the white population. According to Hacker, 1992, even today, America imposes a stigma on every black child at birth and he implies that the casual killing of blacks is a common occurrence. He remarks, in mock surprise, that the odds are that, a black traveling across the heart of white America will reach his destination alive, extravagant claims of this sort are commonplace. Yet virtually the only specific evidence still cited for the prevalence of racism consists of white mistrust of blacks. The grievance literature tells story after story of white women clutching their purses when black men approach, of taxis passing blacks by, of clerks watching black customers, of policemen suspicious of blacks. Hacker 1992, 48, Harper 1994. 28 A case can be made, I make it in the next chapter, that black crime justifies this mistrust, but, warranted or not, slights of the sort recounted seem insufficient to explain black failure. They are trivial in themselves, and other groups have responded to disdain with intensified efforts to attain higher status pressed for evidence of continued oppression, hacker cites disparate injustice, expressed in riots and paranoid beliefs, for instance in the conviction held by two-thirds of blacks that the government encourages black drug use, and the conviction held by one-third that AIDS may be a creation of scientists to annihilate blacks, hacker 1992, 49. Yet feelings of injustice, whatever their evidentiary value would be, do not seem to be what actuates the black behavior it is said to. Many if not most racial disturbances nominally staged as protests end in stealing and looting, whereas people seeking to make a moral point do not use the occasion for theft. 
The men who savaged Reginald Denny during the 1993 Los Angeles riots stole his wallet. If their beating was a gesture of defiance, they would have left his wallet alone. There is a test of sorts that Hacker, 1992, Fisher et al., 1996, and perhaps others, for Fisher et al., credit to an economist, although they may be thinking of Hacker, propose for measuring the disadvantage borne by American blacks. How much, they ask, would the reader want to be paid to become black while otherwise retaining his present personality and abilities? Hacker, a university instructor, reports that his students put the figure at $1 million. Perhaps so, but the rational white acquainted with the facts would willingly pay for the suggested exchange. A moderately bright white child scoring slightly above the white mean on standardized tests would, were he black, be eligible for a program called Prep for Prep, which pays all costs of attendance at elite private elementary schools. Value, at least $30,000. He would then get to go to an elite private preparatory school for four years, again at no cost. Value, at least $60,000 college scholarships available to him that are unavailable to similarly able whites may conservatively be estimated to be worth another fifty thousand dollars even before entering the job market where affirmative action kicks in being black is at a conservative estimate worth one hundred and thirty thousand dollars speaking purely behaviorally blacks in current american society are more highly valued than whites in short the historical record alone suggests that the attainment gap is due to factors other than white oppression. Since there is also overwhelming evidence that races differ in the achievement relevant traits of intelligence and time preference, these traits present themselves as alternatives. Occam's razor cuts away other causes. Some compensation theorists have registered awareness of this possibility, but their preceding undaunted does not mean that they have met it or tried very hard to. In fact, there has been a noticeable declension towards slovenliness in their treatment of the subject. Recall that, in an essay first published in 1974, Block and Dawkin recognized that some arguments for quotas do rely on assumptions concerning the causes of phenotypic differences. Compensatory arguments assume that some proportion of the phenotypic differences between groups is due to past unjust treatment. To the extent that arguments are advanced for proportionate to population quotas which rely on assumptions about the distribution of genotypic abilities, it becomes relevant to assess the validity of such assumptions. 1976, 512 their main topic was not preference and they say no more about it, but this passage contains the whole issue in a nutshell. Writing in 1978, Boxill found it necessary to defend some general assumptions of the illicit advantage argument. The most obvious is that the black and white groups are roughly equal in native talent and intelligence. If they are not, then unless differences in native ability between the groups are remediable and justice requires that they be removed, see section 9.9 .9 below, it is not at all clear that the lower qualifications of blacks are any indication that they have been wronged. Fortunately, this difficulty can be avoided. The weight of informed opinion is against Jensen, but even if it is ultimately shown to have some merit. His theory that as a group blacks have less native intellectual talent than whites is for now, extremely controversial. Jensen himself, though regrettably not chary enough in proposing policies based on this theory, is tentative enough in stating it. Consequently, given its present uncertainty and the great injustice that would be wreaked on a people if it proved false and educational policies were based on it, I submit that we are not warranted now in basing any policies on it. 1978, 165 Boxill cites no reference for his claim about informed opinion. His sudden allusion to education pulls the argument off course. He fails to consider that environmentalism might also promote injustice, and, unlike Block and Dawkin, he seems to think genes explain all racial variation or none. Still, the key idea is present. 
but few subsequent defenses of affirmative action have referred in any way to the challenge of race differences in intelligence. Green R. Walt, 1983, does not mention the topic. Wasserstrom, 1985, a, denies in a footnote that the races differ in any socially important characteristics. By recent standards the passage cited in chapter 4 from 24 to 27 of Hacker, 1992, is candid, and the passage from Rosenfeld, 1991, cited in section 8.7, for all its vagueness about the other causes, concessive. But Rosenfeld says no more about alternative hypotheses, and eventually stipulates that anyone admitted to the dialogical process designed to determine the legitimacy of affirmative action must accept the proposition that the substantial underrepresentation of blacks in education, employment and business is due to past and ongoing first order discrimination against them, 309. So the state of play is this. Some compensation theorists realize they must deal with genetic variation in intelligence as an explanation of the race gap in achievement, but they have made no serious effort to do so, and are increasingly complacent about needing to. My guess is that in the time since the appearance of the papers of Block and Dawkin and Boxill, hasty and inadequate as they were, it has become less acceptable to mention intelligence differences even for purposes of repudiating them. 8.9. Intelligence and Race Differences in Attainment Chapter 3 mentioned that the correlation between the mean IQ of incumbents in an occupation and its prestige rating is 0.9, and the correlation between individual IQ and occupational status is 0.3. 5. The R between IQ and social status runs between 0.3 and 0.4. Although I have seen no studies with unrestricted range correlating IQ with income, income is correlated with schooling, which is correlated with IQ. In prestigious occupations, those above the 90th percentile in IQ out in those below by about 30%, a finding replicated for those in less prestigious occupations, Henstein and Murray 1994, 98, 685. IQ correlates with on-the-job success, the tie strengthening as the IQ demands of jobs increase. True R between academic attainment and IQ exceeds 0.6. The achievement correlates of IQ makes it unlikely that they are biased artifacts, and the variety of its non-social correlates across as well as within races makes it unlikely that IQ slash achievement correlations are socialization artifacts. Intelligence is an attainment relevant trait that blacks on average have less of than whites which promises to explain lower average black attainment. The question is how much of the gap is explained by differences in intelligence, and how much of the remainder by differences in time preference. The strongest bias hypothesis, that IQ explains none of it, predicts that black representation in a field remains constant when ability is controlled. This seems to be the view of compensation theorists, 29 and, given that black IQ is lower than white IQ, it is demonstrably wrong. Compensation theorists could consistently hold that racism explains some but not all of the achievement gap, but it is understandable why they seldom do, take from whites their ill-gotten gains is a more galvanic slogan than take from whites that proportion of their gains corresponding to the variance in attainment left unexplained by cognitive and temperamental variables. Still, in point of logic blacks might deserve compensation for their large remainder if IQ explains only a small proportion of the variance. The proportion of the attainment gap explained by IQ can be determined by examining the hypothesis that IQ explains it all, the more closely this hypothesis fits the data, the more IQ explains. Assuming the mean IQ of whites to be 1 ST above the black mean, for a black mean of 1 Z, and equal variance in both populations, 16% of the black population is at least as intelligent as 50% of the white population. There are then 50 sixteenths equals 3.125 whites for every black with an IQ over 100, population size held constant, implying that, absent discrimination, 30 there should be about 3 whites for every black on jobs requiring an IQ of 100. 
Since there are about seven whites for every black in the United States, whites should outnumber blacks in those jobs by about 21 to 1. However, because the normal distribution is curved, the race ratios on jobs predicted by a 1 SD difference in mean IQ vary with the IQ range from which job incumbents are recruited. Notice how in figure 8.1 the IQ curve falls faster at point x1 than at x0. Also bear in mind that the number of individuals at or to the right of a point on the x-axis is represented by the area under the curve to the right of that point. Next, figure 8.2 superimposes the two bell curves W height and B lack, whose variances are identical and whose means are 1 SD apart. Here, x0 is the mean for B but minus 1 SD for W, x1 is the mean for W but plus 1 SD for B and x2 is plus 1 sd for w but plus 2 sd for b. As before, 50% of the w population and 16% of the b population lie to the right of x1. However, because b is falling faster than w at x1, there are relatively fewer b's than w's to the right of x2. This effect intensifies further to the right. As x2 is 1 sd to the right of x1 but 2 sd to the right of x0, 16% of the W population but only 2.3% of the B population lie to the right of X2, yielding a ratio of the populations to the right of X2 of 16 halves.3, or about 7 to 1. Above 2Z from the W mean, which is 3Z from the B mean, the ratio is 17.5 to 1. It is possible to compute the ratio of the proportions beyond a given point of two normally distributed populations with unequal SDs so long as their mean difference and the ratio of their SDs are known. If for instance, the SD for B, call it SDB, equals 0.81 SDW and X2 equals 0.743 SDW equals 2.28 SDB, the W, B ratio to the right of X2 is about 20 to 1. Small differences in variance have large tail effects. Figure 8.1 Change in slopes The higher the minimum intelligence for a job, the larger the predicted ratio of white to black incumbents, as derived from the black and white IQ distributions and the range of IQs from which job incumbents are recruited. The proportion of a population suitable for a job is the area under the segment of the curve between the high and low ends of its IQ range. After that proportion is derived from Z tables, the black-white ratio is calculated as before. The fit between these ratios and the actual ratios for various jobs measures the proportion of variance in vocational achievement explained by the race difference in IQ. This fit has been studied by Gottfriedson, 1986. 1987, 1988, Table 8.1 is adapted from Table 2 of Gottfredison 1986. Figure 8.2 Relative Cutoffs Table 8.1 B, W ratios of male employees versus B, W ratios predicted by IQ. Take the rows marked physicians and engineers. As determined by the general intelligence scale of the general ability test battery, used by the U.S. Department of Labor in studies of job performance, column 2, indicates that male physicians and engineers are recruited from the population whose IQ is 114 or above, a range with no ceiling. Columns 3 and 4 give the proportions of the black and white populations above that cut off using a white IQ mean of 101.8, a white SD of 16.4, a black mean of 83.4 and a black SD of 13.4, derived from Hitchcock, 1976. Observe that SDB equals 0.81 SDW. 114 is 0.743 SDW above the white mean and 2.28 SDB above the black mean. 23% of the white population and 1.1% of the black population lie above that point. Columns, 5, and, 6, indicate the proportions of the populations within the recruitment range for physicians and engineers, 
which, since this range has no ceiling, are again 1.1 and 23. The ratio of blacks to whites in that range is then 1.123, rounded to 0 0.05 in column, 7, this is the number of black physicians there would be for every white physician, holding population size constant, were physicians recruited solely by intelligence. Using Census Bureau data, columns, 8, and, 9, display the actual ratios of black to white physicians in 1970 and 1980 again with populations constant. The actual ratio of black to white physicians in 1970, shown in column, 8, was 0.23, or 23% of the proportion required by racial parity, and, coincidentally, the absurdly small number Dork insights as showing the need for affirmative action, 1977 a, 140 to 141. Yet 23 is more than four times greater than the proportion expected were the recruitment of blacks based solely on intelligence. The same effect is seen elsewhere. Comparing columns, 7, and, 8, 2, 9, in 16 of 18 cases blacks are more numerous than they would be if recruitment were based solely on intelligence. This over prediction is clarified in column, 10, the expected black white ratios when blacks are recruited for jobs from an IQ range whose cutoff is 0.5 SDW below the cutoff of the white range for those same jobs. Take the physician row again, once more holding population size constant, there are about 100 whites whose IQs are 114 or over for every 22 blacks whose IQs are 107 or over. So, if white doctors were recruited from the IQ range 114 plus, and black doctors from the IQ range 107 plus, the would, according to column, 10, be about 0.22 black doctors for every one white doctor. That is near the actual 1970 ratio. The desire to keep blacks down should intensify with job status. Since IQ demand correlates positively with job status, a measure included in Gottfredison's original study, the discrimination hypothesis predicts that the gap between the numbers in columns, 8, and, 9, and those in, 7, will increase as one ascends the columns toward higher status jobs. This is not found. Controlling for intelligence explains all the discrepancy and more between the black white ratio in the general population and in a wide assortment of occupations. The data fit the hypothesis that race differences in representation are due to the intelligence gap, and strongly suggest that blacks are recruited from an IQ range lower than that from which whites are drawn. IQ over predicts black presence only among firemen and electricians in 1970, but the discrepancy is too small for bias to have much to explain. In the most discrepant case, firemen in 1970 proportionality predicts 3.7 times as many black firemen as there were, 12% instead of the observed 3.2%, populations varying. But this prediction is halved, to 6%, when IQ is fixed. Even in this case IQ explains two-thirds of the discrepancy between proportion of population black and occupational representation. Table 8.2 race differences when IQ is controlled for. Henstein and Murray, 1994, have also compared black to white performance on a number of educational and economic variables before and after controlling for IQ. Their results are summarized in Table 8.2. Like Gottfriedson, Henstein and Murray show that the mean IQs of blacks in various job categories are systematically lower than those of whites which means that blacks are more numerous in various categories than they would be if recruited solely on the basis of IQ. For instance, although 84% of whites have graduated high school against 73% of blacks, 93% of blacks whose IQ is 103 have graduated high school, but only 89% of whites at that IQ have. Although the average annual black income is lower than the white, they give $20,954 as against $27,372.
the income gap shrinks to $25,001 versus $25,546 when IQ is fixed at 100. Indeed, Henstein and Murray find discrepancies in job representation larger than Gottfriedson's, as shown in Table 8.3. When these discrepancies are recomputed using the IQ and jobs of individual blacks and whites rather than group means, they find that a black is over 1.5 times more likely than a white with the same IQ to be employed in the professions, a technical occupation, or a clerical job. 1994, 489 to 492. There were fewer black doctors and policemen in 1900 than IQ would have predicted redundant, evidence that in 1900 able blacks were not reaching desirable positions. But according to the data assembled by Gottfriedson and Herrnstein and Murray, discrimination explained a minute portion at most of black vocational failure in 1970, and ceased altogether to be a factor by 1980. Ability and representation apparently intersected some time after World War II but before the start of affirmative action by which time the effects of slavery and discrimination had been attenuated to non-existence. Herrnstein and Murray estimate that employment opportunities equalized in the professional fields in 1963, and clerical jobs in 1967, see 1994, 490, it is reasonable to conclude that there are now at least as many black doctors and other professionals as there would have been absent slavery and discrimination. If a per impossible the blacks selected over Allen Back had existed absent slavery, they would probably have gotten roughly the grades they did get. Table 8.3 Mean race differences in IQ in various occupations. Job category B. W difference in SD. Professions 1.3. Managerial 1.1. Technical 1.5. Sales 1.4. Clerical 1.1. Protective Services 1.4. Other Service Jobs 1.4. Craft 1.1. Low Skill Labor 1.1. Source, Herrnstein and Murray, 1994. There is also striking agreement between the present analysis and data from the upper tails of the IQ curves. In addition to the failure of the National Science Foundation's multi-billion dollar preference program to increase the number of blacks in science, the Johns Hopkins Center for Talented Youth, which identifies the brightest 12-year-olds across the United States on the basis of SAT scores, reports concern about the low number of minority children, mostly from inner-city schools, that meet CTY criteria, Mills 1992. 189. Jensen, 1991 A, 184, also C 1980, 112, gives 130 as the IQ predictive of success in an academic career, operationalized as earning a PhD, which covers 2.3% of the white population and 135% of the black. As there are about 420,000 black youths in any one year cohort, fewer than 600 blacks are predicted to be capable of earning a PhD in any one year. The anticipated ratio of black to white PhDs is 135 halves.3 times.12 equals.007. In fact, Blacks earned 838 doctorates in 1990 and whites earned 35,199, De Palma 1992, A18, a real world ratio of 0 0.023, three times greater than predicted. In 1987, 1988 and 1989, respectively, blacks earned 767, 813 and 811 doctorates. This discrepancy may indicate lower standards for blacks, a cutoff for PhDs below 130, a concentration of blacks in the less intellectually demanding areas, or some combination of these factors, but the discrepancy is not in the direction it would be if able blacks were being denied degrees. 
Another attainment discrepancy conventionally blamed on bias is the absence of blacks from mathematics, which in turn limits black participation in science. In a typical year three or four blacks earn the PhD in a mathematical science, sometimes as many as seven do, sometimes none. The mean IQ for mathematicians is 143, Jensen 1980, 342. Using the Gottfredes and Hitchcock estimates for the black and white IQ distributions, this is 4.59 SD above the black mean, corresponding to about 0.0001% of the black population. Assuming the black SD to be as large as the white reduces Z to 4 and increases the proportion of the black population with an IQ of 143 to 0.00317 which predicts about 13 blacks in any one year cohort as intelligent as the average mathematician. Considering the small numbers involved, this prediction fits the data remarkably well. One may reflect that as the below replacement birth rate for black females attending college and the higher birth rate of low IQ black women lowers the mean black IQ further, more aggressive preferences will be needed to sustain the present representation of blacks in high status jobs. Furthermore, although birth rates vary inversely with education for white women as well, the proportion of all black women who are both low IQ and having children is greater than that for the corresponding white female cohort. This discrepancy may widen the race gap in IQ in coming decades so that maintaining current levels of preference will require the recruitment of ever less competent blacks. Environmentalists will presumably interpret any decrease in black representation as a recrudescence of the racism that proves the need for stricter quotas. The race difference in mental ability also explains most or all black over-representation in low-status areas. Rosenthal and Jacobson's well-known Pygmalion in the Classroom 1968, CSP, 53-54, argued that normally able black children are placed in remedial classes because of low teacher expectation, where they internalize these expectations and perform accordingly. This theory of learned failure has become a dogma for many educators, although the Pygmalion effect has not been replicated, Fleming and Danton 1971. But Jensen, 1980. 91 to 92, cites a striking example of the IQ discrepancy predicting the precise racial contours of remedial placement. In the early 1970s, blacks made up 28.5% of the population of San Francisco, and 66% of the classes for the educable mentally retarded, EMR. EMR classes recruit from an IQ range of 75 and below where 4.8% of the white population and 25.4% of the black population fall, a ratio of about 1 to 5. Including Asians in the non-black population reduces the ratio further, since the proportion of whites to blacks in San Francisco is about 2.5 to 1. There should be fewer than one white child for every two black children in EMR classes, a proportion slightly smaller than observed. The IQ gap predicts the race discrepancy in EMR classes with reasonable accuracy. The curvilinear character of the distribution of mental ability explains two further features of the attainment gap commonly attributed to discrimination. 1. The race difference in selection error rates on apparently unbiased predictors, was discussed in Chapter 3. The second is the average black-white attainment difference within job and education categories. For example, the failure of black scientists to win peer-reviewed grants in proportion to their numbers. This phenomenon is quite general, on average blacks earn less than whites with the same number of years of schooling, Jaynes and Williams 1989, 288, 301, and less than whites in the same occupation. As credentials seem to have been controlled for in these cases, bias is a natural suspect. But looking again at figure 8.1, one sees that at points X where the bell curve is falling rapidly, the mean IQ of the population beyond X will be fairly close to X, since almost everyone above X clusters near it. For a point X at which the curve is falling more slowly, the mean value of the IQs above X is considerably higher than X, 
since many members of the population lie well to its right. This effect is strongest between 2Z and plus 2Z, which includes the recruitment ranges of most jobs. Thus, when the black and white curves are superimposed as in figure 8.2, the average IQ of blacks above the cutoff point for most jobs is lower than the white average above that point, as blacks cluster nearer the point itself. Since IQ correlates with income within as well as between occupations, whites out in blacks when occupation is fixed. A more refined model, Brown and Reynolds 1975, premises that each IQ increment on a job is worth more as the minimum IQ for the job rises. This model predicts smaller within occupation variance for black wages than for white wages since black IQs cluster near the cutoff point while white IQs are dispersed more widely, an effect Brown and Reynolds document, 1975, 1003, also 1005 to 1006. The intuitive point is that brilliant college students do better than less brilliant college students and brilliant policemen do better than less brilliant policemen. Among blacks and whites able to handle the demands of college or a job, proportionately more black sub early able, so mean white performance exceeds mean black performance. The higher the minimum IQ for a task, the greater the black, white attainment discrepancy within it. That is a simple explanation of why proportionately fewer black scientists conceive research projects good enough to win grants in blind competition. By the same token, the average black SAT scores and grades in any college class should fall somewhat below those of whites, since qualifying blacks will cluster nearer the qualification cutoff than will whites. However, this does not however explain the overprediction of black performance, or, contrary to Fisher et al. 1996, the black-white credential gap in college classes. Computational experiments in Fisher et al. 1996, 246 to 7, show a mean 85-point SAT gap under unbiased admissions, and a mean 103-point gap if blacks are given a 50-point advantage. Since the gap between the mean SAT scores of blacks and whites currently admitted to college is about 200 points, blacks clearly benefit extensively from racial preference. We may go further. By Fisher et al.s own reckoning. A boost of 50 SAT points knocks out 1% of better qualified whites. As the relation of the boost given blacks to the percentage of whites disqualified is almost certainly non-linear, we may suppose that more than 4% of better qualified whites have to be displaced to create the mean 200 point SAT gap between blacks and whites currently admitted to college. Since roughly 3 million students apply to college each year, this means that, each year, at least 120,000 whites are displaced. Discrimination on this scale against blacks, even discrimination against 1% of black college applicants, would be considered a national scandal. 8.10. Motivation and Race Differences in Attainment the overprediction of black performance by standardized tests leads from cognitive to temperamental race differences. Those who have speculated as to why blacks do less well than whites with identical objective test scores offer one of two explanations. Miller, 1992, considers it a byproduct of test imprecision and regression to the mean. Since the mean mental ability of blacks is lower than that of whites, an outstanding black performance on an ability test is more likely to have resulted from a lucky guesses than the same performance from a white. Defining an individual's true test score as the average of a series of retests, a black's true score is apt to be lower than that of a white earning the same nominal score. Retesting 100 blacks and 100 whites who score, say, 115 on a single test will tend to yield lower scores for the blacks. When IQ is used as a predictor, the blacks' criterion performances will be more in line with their true score, hence lower than that predicted by the 115. This hypothesis implies that overprediction of black performance should become more pronounced for test scores higher above the black mean, although I know of no relevant data. 
Alternatively, overprediction may be due at least in part to motivational factors of the sort discussed in Chapter 3, Work Habits, Self-Discipline, Impulse Control. I am aware of no study resembling Gottfredison's of the cross-racial effect of time preference on achievement, but certain personality traits are reported to explain some of the variance in academic achievement that remains when IQ is controlled for, Jensen 1980, 242. Socioeconomic status correlates less strongly with IQ for blacks than whites, Jensen and Reynolds 1982, 429 consistent with race, personality interaction. Occam's razor again requires that some of the residual attainment gap is explained by personality traits on which the races are known to differ. Certainly many writers, including defenders of affirmative action, cite impulsivity and lack of self-discipline as contributors to black failure. Banfield 1974, argues that the primary cause of black poverty is that the lower class person lives from moment to moment, and, is either unable or unwilling to take account of the future or to control his impulses. 54. Black teenagers are distracted by the manifold opportunities that the Negro district offers for action. 114. 31. Box Hill, an advocate of compensatory preferences, cites chronic tardiness. 1978, 164, as a paradigm negative black work habit. Hence Tyne and Wilson report. In the slums, some persons may attach not simply a low value to reinforcers available from outside their neighborhood but a negative value. Straight jobs are for suckers, outsiders who are robbed deserve what they get, and having an arrest record is a badge of honor and a measure of toughness. 1985. 304. Referring to studies of the poor conducted by others, they continue. Every boy interviewed had been employed at one time, but the turnover was very high. When asked why they left a job, they typically answered that they found it monotonous or low paying. Being able to make it while avoiding the work game is a strong, pervasive, and consistent goal. 335. A 1991 study by W. J. Wilson, reported in Whitman 1991, and eventually appearing in W. J. Wilson 1996, found that 40% of employers familiar with blacks found them apathetic or arrogant, and that 75% of black fathers expressed the view that people have a right to receive public aid without working. Repeatedly, Black respondents told ethnographers that their unemployed friends were lazy and questioned the diligence of those who quit jobs or had been fired. Michael, for example, said that most of his friends don't want jobs. He mentioned how several jobless friends failed to even apply for temporary slots at a downtown food festival after he arranged to have them hired. Clive summed up a typical criticism when he claimed that many black males don't want to work. And when I say don't want to work, I say don't want to work hard. They want a real easy job, making big bucks. Generally, ghetto males felt little or no obligation to marry the mothers of their children, preferring to chase other women and hang out with buddies. Several men candidly talk about Mother's Day, when men temporarily cozy up to ex-girlfriends after their monthly welfare check arrives. Whitman, 1991. W. J. Wilson, 1996, blames the difficulties of the new urban poor on the disappearance of jobs, cn. 26, but on his own evidence the problem seems to lie with the traits of the unemployed. The attitudes he describes obviously impede attainment. Box Hill offers the only account of these unproductive habits open to a compensation theorist, that they are further disadvantaging effects of racism. In order to survive and retain their sanity and equilibrium in impossibly unjust situations, people may have to resort to patterns of behavior and consequently develop habits or cultural traits which are debilitating and unproductive in a more humane environment. I see no reason why these cultural traits, which may be deeply ingrained and extremely difficult to eradicate, should not be classed as unjust injuries. 1978, 164. This hypothesis faces by now familiar objections. 
First, young blacks currently disinclined to work were born after the passing of the circumstances Boxill has in mind. Second, not all groups respond to unpopularity by disinvesting in work. Jews and alien cultures have been so ambitious that what makes Sammy, Glick, run has become a cliché, and the industriousness of 19th century Chinese immigrants vexed white laborers. Such differential responses to similar environments indicate non-environmental differences in response readiness. Third, there are pre-social race differences in temperament, and the within-group heritability of many personality traits relevant to attainment such as cautiousness and achievement orientation, is high enough, near point 5, to suggest a genetic element in between group differences. Environmental factors reinforcing temperament may themselves be partly genetic in origin. Finally, the attitudes of American blacks toward time and the support of offspring resemble those reported in Africa and the Caribbean, so are unlikely to be caused by uniquely American factors. On balance, Unproductive black personality traits are probably not unjust injuries. 8.11. W.H.Y. Genes? The burden of proof again. Attentive readers will have noticed that I have used differences in phenotypic intelligence and temperament, not genes, to explain the attainment gap, an explanation consistent with these phenotypes being caused by environmental factors for which whites are not responsible. It follows that hereditarianism, while sufficient to exonerate whites, is not necessary. So why raise the contentious genetic issue at all? It must be raised because it is widely, and reasonably, assumed that, among environmental factors, only oppression can produce an attainment gap as large as the one between the races. Boxhill construes the phenotypic race difference in punctuality as an indirect effect of racism, and one may be sure that poor diets for black babies, should that prove to be an immediate contributor to the IQ discrepancy, would also be attributed to racism past or present. This construction is natural, even inevitable, once biology is ruled out. Adventitious factors should distribute randomly across races, cancelling each other and leading blacks to excel whites in some respects, to fall behind in others and to perform equally well in the rest. Yet blacks almost always do worse, and what, besides biology, can explain systematic failure except intentional imposition of disadvantage? Once environmentalism is accepted, the compensation argument returns at one remove, superior ability may give whites an advantage but, the cause of the superiority was a wrong, a wrong that must be annulled. This is why a thorough sifting of the compensation argument always finds the genetic issue. I do not wish to beat the point into the ground, but it is of fundamental importance. Imagine a supporter of preferences confronted with hard phenotype data like Gottfredesen's and Herrnstein and Murray's, indicating that blacks achieve less because of lower mean intelligence. He could reply, and the phenotype data give him no reason not to that low black intelligence is an unjust injury caused by the impossibly unjust situations whites have created. The excessive cost of preferring blacks in competitive situations, he might insist, merely shows that reparation may have to take some other form. That is why Herstein and Murray could not be more wrong in saying that the existence of the race difference has many intersections with policy issues. The source of the difference has none that we can think of, at least in the short term, 1994, 313. 32. It cannot be proven beyond all doubt that intelligence is a valid construct measured by IQ, that the races differ with respect to it, that this difference explains race differences in outcome, and that this difference is due significantly to genes. But certainty on these points is not required. All that is required to rebut the compensation argument is that these propositions, taken together, offer an account of the attainment gap at least as plausible as the racism hypothesis. Claims of damage must be sustained, a burden carried by the plaintiff. Jones cannot just hobble into court, accuse Smith of breaking his leg, and expect to collect damages, he must show that the condition of his leg is due to an action of Smith's. 
compensation theorists must likewise show that whites damaged blacks. As the claim is one of tortious liability, the showing need meet only the relatively undemanding civil standard of the preponderance of the evidence, it must be more likely than not that white misdeeds opened the attainment gap. But show this the compensation theorist must, which means that a rebuttal need not prove categorically that white misdeeds did not open the gap, merely that it is at least as probable as not that the attainment gap was created by some innocent factor, such as genes. The hereditarian analysis need not be demonstrative, only as likely as racism a conclusion that will be drawn, I believe, by any impartial student of the evidence. Arguably a weaker defense suffices. Given the scope of the demands based on charges against whites, and the extraordinary harshness with which these charges are brought, claims against whites might well be asked to meet the higher standards of a criminal trial. The racism theory would then have to be proven beyond a reasonable doubt, and it would be a sufficient defense of whites that the hereditarian analysis cannot reasonably be rejected. The verdict under that standard seems obvious. Lest placement of the burden of proof seem legalistic quibbling in its own right, the reader should reflect that over the past three decades a great many whites have watched jobs and resources go to less qualified blacks because of the racism theory. It is only fair to ask that this theory be shown to be more plausible than its rivals before more sacrifices from whites are demanded in its name. 8.12. Final Reflections on the Compensation Argument Suppose whites are more successful than blacks because of past misdeeds, and that the racial nexus makes exploitation of this advantage wrong. It might still be permissible for whites to retain this advantage, for two reasons. One concerns a white action that may have already repaid much or all of whatever debt white so blacks, and the other concerns actions of blacks that may cancel most or all of the debt remaining. The white action was the civil war, fought, as the popular idea has it, to free the slaves. Its immediate cause was the secession of the confederacy, justified as an assertion of states' rights but the confederacy seceded because of the federal ban on slavery in the new territories and fear of an eventual ban on slavery in the south itself. The suffering in this war of hundreds of thousands of white northerners for the benefit of blacks, one of the rare examples in history of one group sacrificing itself for another unrelated by kinship or nationality, would seem to have discharged part of whatever obligation whites as a group may have to reduce their net advantage over blacks. The suffering of non-slave owning southern whites, the vast majority, must also be included. Imagine it is 1870. Over here is an ex-slave, worse off than he should have been, but also better off than he would otherwise be because of the Union soldier over there, who lost a leg at Shiloh. Surely the cost to the soldier and his family of helping bring the slave closer to where he should have been has reduced whatever illicit competitive advantage the soldier and his descendants might once have had over the slave and the slave's descendants. It is amazing that discussions of the duty of whites to even the playing field by worsening their own prospects rarely mention the role of the North in the Civil War. If those sacrifices are too negligible to consider, one wonders how much preferential treatment will be deemed enough. Suppose now that whites retain an illicit advantage after the cost of the civil war is deducted. An example makes plain why they may still be entitled to keep this advantage. As a result of Jones' father having injured Smith's father, making it harder for Smith's father to educate his son, Jones now excels Smith in ways he should not have. He got the college education Smith should have gotten. The causal nexus is appropriate and the illicit advantage principle is ready to kick in to demand recompense by Jones, but for one thing, Smith has recently robbed Jones and vandalized his house. Smith did not do this to exact vengeance or rectification, but he has harmed Jones anyway. Common sense would deduct Smith's damage to Jones' house from Jones' debt to Smith. If the education Smith should have gotten and Jones did get is worth $500,000 in lifetime earnings, but Smith stole or destroyed $500,000 of Smith's property, they are quits. In theory two separate actions might be required, 
Jones might have to pay Smith $500,000 in redress, and then Smith might have to hand it right back. But one way or another, their debts cancel. Any advantage Jones still enjoys over Smith is Jones to keep. By that precedent the damage done to whites by black crime, and the destruction by blacks of property created by whites, reduces the illicit advantage of whites, hence the obligation of whites not to use the advantage they do have be lack on white robbery and murder rates are several times the white on white rates.33 since half of all black robberies victimize whites and the black robbery rate is many times the white, whites experience greater losses than they would if they had no contact with blacks. There is a steady flow of stolen resources from whites to blacks. In addition to its monetary losses, black crime imposes the psychic cost of anxiety. Most whites living in large cities are more fearful in their everyday existence than they would be if the black crime rate were as low as the white. The negative effect of black crime on non-criminal blacks does not reduce its effect on the white debt. Smith's robbing Jones reduces Jones' obligation to compensate Smith even if Smith steals from his own family as well. In addition, the inability of blacks to maintain housing stock, apparent in any black neighborhood originally occupied by whites, amounts to some, probably significant, portion of the accumulated advantage in income of whites over blacks. The power of race differences to explain ostensible damage to blacks remains the most forceful reply to the compensation argument. But when the civil war, black crime and black destruction of property are added in, blacks may turn out to owe whites. 8.13. Distributive Justice A forward-looking perspective, although irrelevant to compensation, is not entirely misguided, Perhaps distributive justice or utility demand efforts to equalize the phenotypic intelligence of the races, or in some other way to annul the effects of the genetic difference. Opening this issue assumes that the black and white intelligence gap can be significantly narrowed, which now seems unlikely in view of the failure of intervention programs to date. But to engage the moral question I will suppose that effective intervention is possible. Would it be obligatory? The supposition that intervention is feasible opens more possibilities than is usually envisioned in statements of the interaction argument. Laser, 1973, 200, Maguire and Hirsch, 1977, 91, Block and Dawkin, 1976 A, and Block, 1995 all speculate about the existence of some one environment in which white and black genotypes express themselves similarly. Each of these authors displays a hypothetical graph of the reaction ranges of black and white polygens for IQ, that is, of black and white IQ phenotypes against environments, in which the phenotype lines meet. The A coordinate of the intersection is an, hypothetical, environment in which the mean IQs of blacks and whites would be equal, so that creating this environment for both races would close the race gap. But, see section 4.234, the race gap might be reducible even if there is no one environment which equalizes black and white IQs. Distinct environment C and E such that the expression of the mean black genotype in E is identical to the expression of the mean white genotype in E, would do, IQs could be equalized by creating E for blacks and E for whites. This latter option, separate environments for whites and blacks, is the one more likely to present itself, and to bring with it problems of equity. Conflating for now the different types of intervention. The first question is whether distributive justice requires any intervention at all. Finding distributive justice an obscure notion, I will follow Ben, 1967, 4-298, in taking it to mean what is obligatory in the initial distribution of goods. As for what specifically that is, many contemporary writers take the inertial distributive state to be equality, any deviation from which needs justifying. Weak as this precept is, it merely requires treating two individuals alike when they are alike in relevant respects, a condition that merely shifts the issue to that of specifying relevant respect it is plausible only when some agent is doling out the goods. 
there seems nothing prima facie wrong with two identical individuals at opposite ends of creation happening to end up unequally well off. A stronger case for equality is needed. Egalitarianism that opposes inequalities on the ground that they symptomatize prior wrongdoing assumes that inequalities cannot be explained by natural differences. Joe Baker for instance writes in Arguing for Equality, 1988, 88, of the virtual impossibility of accumulating wealth by consent. Anyone who thinks that's how capitalism got going in the first place should read Marx's description in Capital. Capitalism came into the world dripping from head to toe, from every pore, with blood and dirt. He goes on, 119 to 121, to question innate non-anatomical sex differences, and is confident that they cannot explain sex roles if they do exist, on this theory. Equality is good because as it restores things to where they would have been but for wrongdoing, leaving egalitarianism a compensatory claim of the sort already treated at length. Any form of egalitarianism worth the name must consider equality good in itself, not good merely because it signals or promotes some more fundamental value. Egalitarianism of this sort would have the further advantage of targeting any factors that contribute to variation in outcome as race differences in intelligence do, without inquiring into their origin. Yet egalitarians of this sort are extremely rare, and, despite appearances, may be non-existent. Some seeming egalitarians, Temkin, 1986, may be an example, take great pains to expound what equality entails without presenting any reason to think it is intrinsically desirable. Other egalitarians resemble Fisher et al. 1996-35 in expressing great shock that inequalities exist in society, but never explaining why they are so distressed. And to judge by their metaphors and other rhetorical devices, ostensibly ground floor egalitarians willing to defend their commitment rely on independent values that equality is tacitly, perhaps unconsciously, assumed to serve, and inequality to violate. Documenting this properly would take a book of its own. But consider this central passage from Eric Rakowski's Equal Justice. People at the brink of death, dragged to the precipice despite every effort to remain safe and hail, seem entitled to assistance from those who were luckier if they did not bring misery on themselves and cannot live without help. It appears self evident that a little girl suffering from polio or a collapsed lung should be given medical assistance even if her parents cannot or will not agree to cover the costs. No one should be condemned to anguished poverty or worse as a result of chance events against which she could not defend herself. From the standpoint of politics, people's lives matter equally, and the only way to accord them equal consideration is to grant each an equal bundle of resources. 1991, 94-95 Insofar as Rukowski opposes condemning the innocent and pushing them over precipices, he is protesting aggression. Most people would agree that little girls who have done nothing should not be dragged anywhere, but, since polio viruses don't literally drag anyone, this has naught to do with distributive justice. Taken literally, Rukowski is saying that the involuntarily poor and sick have an enforceable right, politics, to other people's money which is hardly self-evident. Or consider Waltz's view, 1973, also see 1983, that it is a kind of tyranny that people with more money should be able to get better medical care, it is tyrannical of the rich to gather to themselves social goods that have nothing to do with their personal qualities, 1973, 402. Again, it is not literally tyrannical for a rich man whose qualities are more apt than Waltz supposes to be estimable, given the income, IQ correlation, to consult a pricey specialist. He does not forcibly and arbitrarily prevent poor men from consulting the same specialist, who presumably chooses his own patients, nor is he unrestrained by law, the dictionary definition of tyranny. Opposition to despots is welcome, but it too has nothing to do with inequality. There is also the curious willingness of many egalitarians, noted by both their critics, Czardic 1993a, Frankfurt 1986, 
and friends, Curly 1996, to relax the demand for equality so long as everyone is reasonably well off. The underlying value of egalitarians of this sort looks like improvement of the lot of the very badly off, or reduction of the gap separating the very badly off from the well off, or a minimum level of well-being for all, but not equality per se. This impulse can be seen in the passage just cited from Rukowski, and Frankfurt, 1986, offers a particularly acute analysis of Nagel, 1979, along these lines. Self-styled egalitarians impelled by concern that everyone reach a minimum of well-being are not really egalitarians at all. A recent attempt to state a pure form of distributive egalitarianism is Curley's, 1996, 36 who bases equality of outcome on a moral claim to an equal enjoyment of the good. When inequality is objectionable because it violates the claim of the worse off person. That person has less than a fair share. 294 to 295. Curley says that this account is teleologically concerned with the value of equality rather than with the duty to distribute goods equally, but he recognizes its deontological sound. Moreover, he objects to inequality wholly explained by natural causes, see section 8.13, on the grounds that such inequality is opposed to the relationship that should exist between different lives thereby, violating individual claims, 296. Surely, however, the language of fair shares and claims makes sense only for goods handed out by a human agent obliged to apportion them in a certain way. So Curley has not formulated, let alone defended, the view that equality per se is good, rather, he is thinking metaphorically, in terms of some agency somehow obligated to distribute equal shares who the distributor is and why he should distribute equal shares to actual persons are questions Curley does not reach. A very common form of deviationism involves appeal to criteria. For instance, Nielsen, 1997, repeatedly demands that each person be treated with equal respect irrespective of desert, 209. So, does Nielsen think that? When A and B both need blood transfusions but there is only enough plasma for one, we should just flip a coin. Not at all. He assures the reader that equality does not mean that in treating them, people, with respect you treat them in an identical way. In treating with equal respect a baby, a young person, or an enfeebled old man out of his mind on his deathbed, we do not treat them equally, that is identically uniformly but with some kind of not very clearly defined proportional equality. 21037. If there has been a more frequent blood donor, giving him the plasma does not run counter to justice as equality. If A is a young mother of three and B is a 90-year-old, more needs would be satisfied if A gets it than B. If A is a doctor and B an unemployable drunk, we again quite rightly appeal to social utility to justify favoring A. All equality demands is that we not simply favor A because he was A, 216. Presumably Nielsen, a university instructor, gives his better students higher grades. He would no doubt explain that this practice duly respects everyone's achievements, and that inequality would be, for instance, a huge fuss made over the good students and scorn for poor ones. Nielsen's radical egalitarianism has degenerated down to the truism that individual differences in treatment must be warranted by differences between the individuals treated. There is nothing wrong with the warranting criteria Nielsen chooses, but his choices are ad hoc, and anyway people are patently unequal with respect to them. We may cease classifying egalitarianisms, for opposing them all, at least as they bear on racial equality is the common sense principle that the sheer possibility that a more favorable environment might make someone better off, or as well off as average, does not by itself oblige anyone to create it. Perhaps better training in his youth would have made clumsy Smith an average athlete, and some millionaire who knew young Smith did not hire him a coach. Surely the millionaire violated no canon of distributive justice. People have no right to be as athletic as other people, or as intelligent, so there is no correlative duty to make them so. 
Special circumstances create special obligations to create favorable environments, as parents are duty-bound to give their children the best education they can, but attractive possibilities, including possible environments that equalize groups, have no natural right to exist. As there is no general obligation to create more favorable environments just because they can be created, 38 whites are not obliged to enhance the mental development of blacks simply because it may be possible for them to do so. Does past mistreatment of blacks create a special distributive obligation for whites? Not because of burdens it has placed on contemporary blacks, for then we are back to compensation. Perhaps a scheme consciously contrived to allocate goods should give any two individuals the same amount, other things being equal, and, by keeping slaves from learning to read and forcing their descendants to attend segregated schools, use inferior facilities and endure second-class citizenship, whites contrived an inegalitarian allocative system. So now they are specially obligated to raise black IQs if they can. This argument too sails dangerously close to compensatory regions, for why does the fact, assuming it is a fact, that blacks in the past got less than their fair share impose an obligation to intervene in behalf of other blacks now, unless the situation of blacks now resulted from these past inequities in a way that illegitimately advantages contemporary whites. But rather than repeat objections to the compensation argument, Two other points bear more directly on distributive justice. First, slavery was endemic in black Africa, probably more so than in Europe or Asia, see Baker 1974, 364-365. African chiefs selling captives taken in tribal warfare were complicit in the overseas trade, European slavers apparently never had to use force directly. Hence. Any obligation to contemporary American blacks imposed by the slave trade weighs less heavily on contemporary whites than on descendants of African kings. Since enslavement in America was not an obviously worse fate than capture in tribal warfare, blacks taken to the United States were not made grossly worse off than they would have been had they stayed in Africa. 39. Second, the limits placed by whites on black education prior to 1954 did not on the evidence, suppress an environment as favorable to mental growth as any that blacks would have found themselves in had they been left undisturbed in Africa. Black slaves on their own would almost certainly not have developed multi-story buildings, written language, mechanical devices, the wheel, firearms, or a legal code, all features of the antebellum South. The blacks witness democracy and a tradition of free discussion not found in their natural environment. Since no African society ever developed a written language, forbidding slaves to learn to read probably did not stifle a development that would otherwise have taken place. People should be allowed to learn skills useful in the environment in which they find themselves, so slaves should have been allowed to learn to read, but that is not to say blacks would have acquired literacy on their own. Segregated schools having become an icon of injustice, it takes considerable imaginative efforts to appreciate that no African society ever developed educational institutions remotely comparable in quality to the segregated schools of the Jim Crow era. Old, discarded white textbooks are better than no textbooks at all. Continuing to use as a baseline the environment that blacks attending segregated schools would have developed had they remained in Africa, those schools were abnormally stimulating, outside the range of environments in which blacks evolved. Relative to this same baseline, today's public schools in black neighborhoods are also abnormally stimulating, for they too would evidently not have been available to blacks had whites never contacted the ancestors of the black children in attendance. Many of these schools are dilapidated, but since the dilapidation is caused mostly by black students, it is not an external impediment. Whites have invested more resources in the education of blacks than blacks could have done themselves. In 1904, the heyday of segregation, 20% of the public education budget in southern states was reserved for black schools, 
which served the 33% of the population that was black. Forty each black child thus received $1.60 in schooling for every $1 received by a white child. This would have violated the principle that other things being equal an allocative scheme should give everyone the same amount of the good being allocated, but other things were not equal. The mean per capita wealth of blacks in 1904 was $34 that of southern whites $885, $1320 nationally. As public schools were and are funded primarily through property taxes, even today federal spending accounts for only 6% of spending on schools, southern whites may be assumed to have spent $885.34 equals 26 times more for schools, per capita, than southern blacks. In other words, each black child received 0.6 times 26 equals $15.60 in schooling from taxes paid by whites for every $1 he received in schooling from taxes paid by blacks. Southern whites had a reason and, one would think, a right to spend more on white than black children, virtually all the money spent on education was their own. In 1984 white per capita wealth was still 4.7 times that of blacks, James and Williams 1989, 292, black children thus continue to have access to buildings, labs, books, computers, and other facilities that the black population left to itself gives no sign of being able to produce. It might be replied that distributive racial equity does not depend on what would have been available where American blacks might have been, but what is available where they are, contemporary America. Black Scott, and get, more in the United States than they would have gotten in Africa, but they got, and get, less in the United States than American whites do, and that is the inequity. Now. The holdings of one's contemporaries may be an appropriate baseline for the distribution of resources in a state of nature, but schools, housing, and the other goods blacks are said to have too little of our products of human effort, and it seems a fixed point of everyday morality that the work of human hands should go to the hands doing the work. This is really the heart of the matter, the distribution of wealth should reflect the contributions of its creators, and whites create more wealth per capita than blacks. When Kozol, 1992, complains, contrary to fact, of unequal funding for black and white schools, he writes as if whites were greedily monopolizing wealth that appeared out of nowhere, by ordinary standards, the level of funding for schools attended by blacks shows white generosity. 8.14. Natural Inequalities. There is an ancient argument 41 for divorcing an individual's share in wealth from his contribution to it, recently revived by John Rawls, 1971, 101 to 104. Productivity is due to talent and effort. But talent and the capacity to exert effort, Rawls insists, are largely genetic in origin bestowed by the natural genetic lottery rather than earned. The natural lottery is not wrongful, the lucky possessors of talent have not misappropriated anything, nor were the unlucky cheated, but it is arbitrary. From this Rawls concludes that natural gifts and their fruits belong to everyone, and that a productive individual may justly keep only as much of the net gain from his gifts as is needed as an incentive to remain active. Conjoining Rawls' conclusion to hereditarianism, whites just lucked into the genes that make them more intelligent and persistent than blacks, so do not deserve the advantages those genes bestow. This racial consequence has not to my knowledge been explicitly drawn by Rawls or his followers, but its obviousness may contribute to the prestige Rawls, 1971, enjoys. At one level this deduction of socialism from determinism collapses without a push from empirical data, for it confuses entitlement with entitlement to entitlement. An example clarifies this distinction, also see Levin 1979, 257, Levin 1992b, 12, Levin 1994. Suppose you find a gold nugget by glancing into a stream. It was fortuitous that you rather than someone else looked where and when you did, you had no right to be the one to find the nugget. 
you did nothing to deserve finding it. Yet, having found it, it is yours. You are entitled to keep it. Perhaps only those who cultivate alert habits deserve to be nugget finders, but all you need do to deserve the nugget is to be a nugget finder. You don't have to deserve to have found it. The rules in question, why give Einstein credit, when he didn't choose his brains? falsely assumes that Einstein is admired for choosing his brains, or for something that requires that he chose them. In fact, Einstein is admired for discovering the theory of relativity, not for making himself clever enough to do so. He didn't deserve to be clever, or to make that discovery, but, having made it, he deserves whatever credit is owed discoverers. Ah, replies the Rawlsian. The question is whether Einstein does deserve any credit, and whether you deserve the nugget. He was lucky to be born into a propitious environment with a superb brain and the will to use it. Why honor a triple dose of luck? But here the Rawlsian oversteps himself, for in pushing the argument this far he pushes it beyond a genetic causation. To remain consistent, he would have to deny people titled to the product of their talents even if they did somehow choose their genes, so long as they did not choose the factors that caused them to choose the genes they do. Those who choose good genes would still just be lucky to have been caused to choose good genes by those unchosen factors, hence still deserve no credit for or profit from their genes accomplishments. This same verdict would follow if people chose not only their genes but the factors that cause their gene choices and cause those choices as well, so long as at some point choice ends, as it presumably must, with the natural causal lottery resuming control. Rawls' reason for denying people a right to the fruits of their genetically controlled labors is an equally good reason for denying them a right to the fruits of any labors, any trait whose ultimate cause lies outside their own wills, whether that ultimate cause is genetic, environmental or some third thing. The Rawlsian position is, at bottom, that no one deserves the fruits of extravolitional factors, from which it follows that, if all behavior is caused by extravolitional factors, no one deserves anything. It also follows that no one deserves the fruit of any uncaused behavior as nothing could be more fortuitous than a random event. Only completely self-determined choices merit reward or profit. Despite perennial attractiveness to philosophers, see Campbell 1957, Chisholm 1964, Thorpe 1980, Notesick 1982, 294 to 362, a self-determining will is inherently obscure. It invites but cannot answer the question of what makes such a will determine itself to choose one way rather than another. Not external factors, for then the will is not self-determining. Not nothing, for a will acting by chance is not self-determining. Not a prior act of the will to choose its choice, for that launch is an infinite regress. The alternatives exhausted, a self-determining will is impossible, and should such a will be necessary for desert, no one deserves anything at all. That many people find this conclusion compelling rather than an occasion to rethink their premises shows that Rawls' argument touches a nerve. Why should some people, or groups, come into the world cleverer, more able than others? One can imagine Hamlet brooding over this. But the question, as posed, is unanswerable. Evolution cannot be shown to be fair. It just happened. However, unless it is already assumed that all persons should be equally endowed, evolution cannot be shown to be unfair, either. To repeat, it just happened. There is no positive reason to let its work stand, nor any positive reason to seek to undo it. Rawls sometimes shows awareness of this. The natural distribution is neither just nor unjust, he says, the positions people are born into are simply natural facts. 1971, 102. Yet to argue for annulling the effects of the natural lottery because it is not just erroneously equates not just with unjust. A situation may be not just in not being required by justice, without being forbidden by justice, that is, unjust. And, precisely as Rawls says, the natural genetic lottery is neither just nor unjust.
that whites never earned their superior intelligence means that their title to it is not required by justice, not that their having superior intelligence is wrong. There is nothing right or wrong about it. But the role of genes in behavior undermines the natural lottery argument in more concrete ways. Rawls derives the difference principle, the duty of the well endowed to use their talents for the good of the least fortunate, 1971, 102, from the supposed fact that social contractors ignorant of their eventual positions in a society they are designing will reason as if they were going to find themselves in the worst possible position. 42 But a case can be made, see Gautier 1984. 249-43 that this derivation also assumes the factors shaping individuals to be entirely social. Certainly, if you think other people helped Jones develop his talents, you will be more inclined to feel he owes those others some of what his talents produce than you will be if you think Jones came by his talents some other way, for instance genetically. Genetic ability is not a gift from society, so does not demand reciprocation. Hence Caucasoid advantages seem less like resources available to others when conceived as significantly genetic. In any event, the difference principle is not egalitarian, allowing only those advantages for the better off that help the worst off gives the worst off a veto denied other strata. Assuming blacks among the worst off in America, the difference principle gives priority to helping them. But here the argument takes a final turn. On its face, Priority for helping blacks assigns the slums first claim on, say, the next education dollar, and commentators influenced by Rawls, for example, D. Richards 1973, 1977, do consider spending more on slow learners obligatory and spending more on the gifted unfair.44 yet together with relevant facts, a contrary conclusion may follow. Technical innovations? whose origin is the high tail of the bell curve, tend to help the worst off more than anyone else. In previous centuries, a peasant was unlikely ever to stray more than a few miles from his birthplace, the invention of the airplane has enabled everyone to travel great distances. Vacuum cleaners most benefit women unable to afford domestic help, see Fulda 1993, 1-3. The computer, that latest world transforming product of Caucasoid ingenuity, most dramatically boosts the productivity and with it the earning power of workers whose talents confine them to routine clerical tasks. Giving that next dollar to the almost entirely white and Asian gifted might well benefit blacks more than giving it to blacks, in which case the difference principle awards it to the gifted. 8.15. Utility. What needs to be fed into the difference principle to decide where education money should go is whether intervention programs help blacks more than investment of the cost of those programs in the mostly non-black gifted. Utilitarians, who weigh all policies on straight bang for the buck calculations of overall effect, need similar data about the comparative educability of black and non-black children. The Hanstein murray argument against intervention is wholly utilitarian. Although common sense is not utilitarian, these issues deserve examination. Utilitarian arguments for intervention often presume a threshold effect, so many more blacks than whites are extremely poor at raising the mean black environment gives hope of raising the IQs of black children dramatically, whereas there is no comparable intervention for whites. But the evidence does not support threshold effects concentration of blacks below a threshold across which the expression of the intelligence polygene changes markedly would mean lower heritability for IQ among blacks than whites. The deprived environment in which blacks live would swamp individual genetic differences between them, cf. The starving extremes in section 4.2. Yet the within race heritability of IQ for blacks appears to as great as that for whites, Jensen 1973. 175 to 188, Osborne et al. 1978. Black children are apparently not exposed to deprivation severe enough to affect mental development. Absent threshold effects, environmental intervention that raised the IQs of black children would probably raise white and Asian IQs comparably. 
therefore, reducing the IQ gap would require an extraordinary sort of affirmative action, the restriction of IQ raising measures to blacks. Let us continue to assume that some measure, perhaps training in verbalization during problem solving, see Carlson 1985, or training in mental self-management, see section 4.13, or enhanced nutrition in infancy, boosts IQ. For any such measure to narrow the race gap, black children would at the very least have to have more access to it than white. Black children could be assured of greater access without race preferences were black parents to seek the regimen more avidly than white parents, but that scenario is unlikely. Black parents now are less apt than white to expose to their children to written matter, despite the highly publicized benefits of reading, an outcome predicted by parental interest in education being an environmental correlate of genes. So allowing the market to allocate IQ raising resources would probably widen the IQ gap, necessitating legal restrictions on white access to IQ boosting techniques, through government programs available only to blacks, or bans on private purveyors, who would be preponderantly white, serving whites. The special treatment problem is apt to run deeper. As we have seen, Despite optimistic talk of gene, environment interaction, 45, there are no known environments in which black and white IQs converge, or grow appreciably closer than 1SD. Closing the race gap would therefore almost certainly require, and even this might not suffice, an inversion of environments, with black infants and children raised in especially rich ones and white infants and children raised in deprived ones. Goldberger and Mansky tiptoe up to this proposal, 1995, 764-765. When individuals observed IQ test score Y is the sum of her genotype Z and her environment U, so Y equals Z plus U. Imagine that Z and U are uncorrelated, so the variance of Y equals the variance of, of Z plus the variance of U, VY plus VU. Herrnstein and Murray's thought experiment called for equalizing environments, making VU equals zero. Suppose instead that we preserve VU at its current value, but make U perfectly negatively correlated with Z by introducing an extreme compensatory policy. Then IQ variance would fall from VY, H2 plus E2, to VY, H2 plus E2 to E, equals VY, H. E2. So with H2 equals 0.6 and E2 equals 0.4, this intervention would reduce IQ variance to 0.6-4 equals 2% of its current value VY.46. The suggestion here, couched in opaque jargon and unconventional notation, is to reject the equalization of environments in favor of placing high genotypic intelligence into poor environments and vice versa. What would this intervention look like? Many commentators explain the achievement gap by pointing to the more stimulating character of white households. Would equalization then mean giving black children to white parents, and white children to black parents? Letting white parents keep their children but limiting the amount of printed matter kept in the home? It is hard to imagine anyone, white or black, agreeing to such steps. Although the white majority in the U.S. tolerates affirmative action, so the possibility cannot be ruled out. Coercion on a large scale would certainly be required. What is inconceivable is that turning society upside down in this way, with the attendant destruction of individual liberty, could yield a net advantage. The utilitarian case for raising everyone's IQs must be distinguished from a utilitarian case for raising the IQs of blacks only or raising the IQs of blacks while lowering everyone else's. The presumed increase in black productivity and law abidingness attendant on a higher mean black IQ is also a reason to raise the IQs of whites and Asians, whose productivity and law abidingness would also presumably increase. On utilitarian grounds, low IQ children of all races would merit treatment. The benefits of raising black IQ insofar as they are benefits of raising IQ period, do not justify special efforts aimed at closing the race gap. 
There is also no reason to think the gains for blacks per resource unit invested would exceed those for whites or Asians. One might anticipate an initially greater marginal payoff for black children because they have so far to go, but the difficulties of black children in coping with the elementary school curriculum and the failure of enrichment programs to date suggest that black children would be more resistant to IQ boosts. Chapter 4 noted the finding of Curry and Thomas, 1995, that Head Start benefits in standardized test scores and grade retention are more lasting for whites than black children. If all unit increases in children's IQs are equally desirable, but the resources needed to boost the IQ of a black child one point could boost the IQ of a white child 1.1 points and that of an Asian child 1.2 points. Utility dictates that resources flow toward whites and Asians. Curry and Thomas calculate that Head Start costs $3,500 per child, and remark that. When viewed strictly in terms of lasting benefits provided to children, Head Start programs serving African American children are not cost effective. In contrast, the results for white children suggest that the potential gains are much larger than costs since even a small decline in the high school dropout rate has the potential to pay for itself in terms of future wage gains. 36147. Other studies do not permit cross-racial cost-benefit comparisons. Using such indicators as employment, average salary, and avoidance of arrest, the net benefit to one individual of one year of the Perry program was calculated to be $2,515, Spitz 1986, 197. The net benefit of two years of the program was minus $1,180, since there were no gains on the criteria after the first year. In the Milwaukee program, the average cost of raising one child's IQ one point was $23,000, implying an annual cost of $100 billion to raise to 100 the mean IQ of the approximately 400,000 black children in any one year cohort. Prototypes are often misleadingly expensive, but since the creation of stimulating environments requires physical facilities and personnel. It is not clear how massively replicating the Milwaukee pilot project could reduce unit cost to any significant extent. More important, these figures, calculated against black controls, shed no light on the opportunity cost of closing the race gap. Whatever one child point of black IQ costs, the utilitarian also needs to know the cost of one child point of white and Asian IQ. Again, the initial average gain of about 10 points in the experimental group over the control group in the Perry program may be assumed to yield a mean payoff of $250 per IQ point per black child in the first year. Boosting the IQs of blacks for one year thus earns back its cost, but the utilitarian also needs to know the mean payoff of one point of white and Asian IQ. These comparisons would require more studies of white and Asian experimental groups with same race and other race controls. Pursuit of equality together with awareness that few blacks can meet demanding academic standards has in recent decades led to lavish attention to inferior, disproportionately black students at the expense of abler, predominantly white and Asians ones. Richardson 1993 what attention is paid to the gifted often takes the form of worries about finding the black gifted, Richardson 1993. The 8% of New York City public school students classified as disabled account for 23% of the school budget. Stuyvesant and the Bronx High School of Science, two New York City schools for the gifted, receive no more than other city high schools, many of whose students are barely capable of literacy. The Board of Education runs special tutorials closed to whites to help blacks and Puerto Ricans pass the entrance exams to these schools. Of the $8.6 billion spent directly on students by the federal government, 92% goes to the disadvantaged, and 1% to the gifted, Henstein and Murray 1994, 427 to 435. This disproportion is frequently defended with the demographic argument that, as blacks and Hispanics become a larger proportion of the population, 
sustaining the American standard of living requires that they be prepared to enter the technical professions. From the utilitarian point of view the reverse conclusion follows, as the population changes, it becomes more important to see cable individuals where the evidence shows they are to be found. The demographic defense of affirmative action is like arguing that when current oil wells begin to be exhausted, we should search more intensely where oil is unlikely to be found, and sink fewer new wells in the diminishing regions where it is likely to be more plentiful. Actually, sensible utilitarians disregard populations, and expect that educating each child in accordance with his objectively determined abilities will maximize general well-being. The compensatory demand that a claimant be made better off makes clear who should finance the improvement and why, whoever harmed the claimant, because he did. Distributive justice cloaks the need to answer the same questions. Any intervention to equalize IQs, or raise black IQs, will be costly, and there is no one else to bear the cost except the white majority. Why should they? Not to annul illicit white advantages. Since distributive justice was invoked precisely to find non-compensatory grounds for reducing the IQ gap, not correction of the natural genetic lottery, which is not unjust, merely not just. Interventionists like Bloch and Lewontin urge that we, unidentified, keep experimenting with interventions, as if experiments consumed no resources that might be put to other uses. Repeated efforts to raise black IQ would consume white resources that whites might prefer to direct elsewhere, and there seems no reason why they should not do so. Compensatory indemnity at least is a chance of justifying the cost to whites, which is why all discussion of white debts sooner or later reverts to compensation, and why the failure of the compensation argument relieves whites of all burdens. Notes 1 about sex differences in parental involvement. 2. Preferences for women are discussed in Levin, 1987, 1992. 3. The rationale for banding is that, since tests are imperfect predictors, there is some chance that a score of 1250 indicates as much ability as a score of 1350. See Cascio et al. 1991. The width of the band can be adjusted to accord with a desired confidence level in prediction. However, while it is not certain that the true score corresponding to an observed 1350 exceeds the true score corresponding to an observed 1250, it is more probable, so candidates chosen by top-down are likely to be superior to those chosen by banding. 4. Specifically, the performance mean in 1990. 5. In this I follow Green R. Walt, 1983, who defines discrimination and reverse discrimination as, respectively, a difference of treatment, that, is to the disadvantage of members of some group, and a difference in treatment that reverses the pattern of earlier discrimination. 16. 6. Rosenfeld's index lists affirmative action as defined on 335 of his text, where it is described as remedying, systematic deprivations of equality of opportunity for which the government can be held responsible. This unusually narrow definition is nonetheless compensatory. 7. Shaw also offers, as secondary arguments, that blacks who have not suffered discrimination themselves have been affected by discrimination, and that our whole history of racial and sexual discrimination cannot be ignored. We will find that these appeals come down to compensation. 8. Chapter 10 argues that certain forms of private racial discrimination are not injurious, which implies that their consequences do not merit redress. However, nothing in the present chapter depends on that conclusion. For present purposes I allow discrimination to be a compensable wrong. 9. Also see the Lewis Sindor case in Podgeman, 1992, 185. 10. If a man wants both to smoke and to want to stop smoking, most people would say that the desire manifesting his autonomy and true self, and the one he should heed, is the second one, see section 9.11. To be sure, 
A's preferences about B's preferences cannot manifest A's autonomy, but they can serve another function of self-directed second-order preferences, namely evaluation. Just as a person's opinion of himself depends in part on his opinion of his own desires, his opinion of others depends in part on his opinion of their desires. Frankfurt, 1971 makes a plausible case that man differs from the brutes in having second-order preferences. Being second-order is as much a virtue as a defect of desires. 11. He adds, t the associational preference of a white law student for white classmates. May be said to be a personal preference. But it is. Parasitic upon external preferences, except in very rare cases a white student prefers the company of other whites because he has racist, social and political convictions, sick, or because he has contempt for blacks as a group, 236. 12. Endorsed, unenthusiastically, by Jenks, 1992, 61. 13. Walter Block has pointed out to me in conversation that testers have strong psychological and financial interests in provoking differential treatment, under current law, discriminated against testers, although never actually intending to accept a loan, a job, or housing of standing to sue. Hence black testers have an incentive to act uncreditworthy, cocky and rude, while white testers have an incentive to be respectable. 14. The classical justified true belief analysis of knowledge prevents a man who sees a mountain from knowing there is a mountain there unless he knows how vision works. Reliabilism lets a man ignorant of optics know about the mountain by sight. 15. When specified, these benefits often justify symmetrical preferences for whites. One common referent is consumer choice. Defending quotas in medical school admission. Herbert Nickens writes, minority physicians, may, function in different ways compared with majority physicians. Minority healthcare providers are likely to be more culturally sensitive to their populations, 1992, 2394-2395. A similar argument is made for preferring black teachers for black children. But white doctors may be more sensitive to whites and white children may be more comfortable with white teachers. 16. Graglia, 1988, expands on this circularity. 17. Biting this bullet, Rosenfeld rejects the tort law standard, 1991, 81, deny men enforcement should presumably read enforce in the sentence under such. If there are no women in a field that should have been half female, he asks, why isn't firing half the men as fair as firing none? Either way, 50% of some population is treated unjustly. One answer is that doing wrong is worse than letting wrong happen, especially when the doing is coercive, as all government action is. Also, given the statistics on black crime, Rosenfeld's approach would justify extreme measures against blacks. Finally, the argument permits random redistribution of holdings in any imperfectly just society. If 20% of the average person's holdings are improper, or 20% of all holdings are, someone with dollar n should only have dollar dot eight n. Switching his dollar n with someone else's dollar m leaves total licit holdings at point eight n plus m. No injustice has been done. 18. So the shackled runner analogy was defective from the start. The runner's competitors could protest that they were not the ones who caused his lameness, which, relative to anything they did, could have resulted from an accident. 19. Thompson does not realize that the fecklessness she imputes may explain the circumstances of blacks. 20. From the standpoint of the distributive system's efficiency, it might seem preferable to foreclose compensating victims of past education discrimination with jobs for which there are other persons who are more qualified. From the standpoint of the system's legitimacy, however, it may be inadequate to rely entirely on some other form of compensation, such as monetary damages. Indeed, the award of damages, even if coupled with better educational programs for subsequent generations, 
may relegate too many members of the discriminated against group for too long to subordinate positions, and thus fail to ameliorate their sense of self-respect or to increase their confidence in the system. What is needed is a way to reintegrate the victims of past discrimination into the mainstream of society, which entails a share of the jobs allocated by society, Rosenfeld 1991, 288. 21. I have occasionally asked black students benefiting from quotas how they feel about being selected over better qualified competitors. Their reactions have ranged from it's a job and I'm happy to have it to anger at the suggestion that they do not merit special treatment. I have found no sense of stigmatization. 22. See for example Gross, 1977A, and Sowell, 1981. Rosenfeld argues that, rather than be answered, Sowell should be excluded from the dialogical process because he is a successful black, successful blacks who oppose affirmative action do so because they wish to project the image that they are exceptions, so their opposition is strategic rather than oriented toward communicative action, 1991, 312 to 313. Professor Rosenfeld has informed me in conversation that he has not offered to resign his position in favor of a black. Is he then arguing in bad faith, and deserving of exclusion from the dialogue? 23. I do not see how to reconcile this sentence with the previous one. 24. Readers dissatisfied with the following material should consult Taylor, 1992, and Zer, 1995, who build similar cases more elaborately. 25. A five-minute tour of the bulletin boards near the author's office turned up announcements of the Mellon Minority Undergraduate Fellowships, the Ford Foundation Doctoral Fellowship for Minorities, the Ford Foundation Postdoctoral Fellowship for Minorities, the Gaius Charles Berlin Fellowship for Minority Graduate Students at Williams College, Project Focus for Minority College Freshmen and Sophomores of the American Society of Newspaper Editors, the General Motors Endowed Fellowship to Provide Aid to Minorities, the National Science Foundation Minority Graduate Fellowships, Graduate Fellowships in Business Administration for Minorities of the Consortium for Graduate Study in Management, the American Society for Microbiology Predoctoral Minority Fellowship Program, and the Wayne State University Post Baccalaureate Program for Minority Students. 26. Even by the late 1960s Banfield could write racial prejudice today is a different order of magnitude than it was prior to the Second War, 1974-78. W. J. Wilson traces black difficulties to the disappearance of manufacturing jobs, without explaining why blacks have not adapted to a more service, information economy. The explanation suggested here is that the mean intelligence required for manufacturing tasks is closer to the black mean than that required for the jobs created by the new technologies. 27. Bureau of Labor Statistics, Telephone Interview, August 6, 1992. 28. There is often a threat in the telling. Revenge and anger are the first two feelings I sometimes have, when a clerk follows me in a store. Diami, the author's son, said. I'd like to yell and scream and curse that person out, maybe. But I know that doing that probably wouldn't solve anything, and, if anything, would make the situation worse. The sales lady at the game store, like shop clerks and store owners throughout the city and the country, was lucky. Today. Harper 1994. 29. When a wrong has been as persistent and pervasive as racial discrimination and segregation in the public school systems, it seems beyond serious doubt that the wrong in question is the cause of a substantial reduction in the prospects of success of blacks in the employment market, Rosenfeld 1991, 289. Substantial here can be taken to mean some proportion of the race difference, although Rosenfeld clearly intends the entire race difference which is substantial. 30. 
since there is no reason to think blacks are on average more qualified than whites with respect to other job qualifications, IQ-based predictions of occupational representation are good proxies for predictions about bias effects. 31. The lower class forms of all problems are at bottom a single problem, the existence of an outlook and style of life which is radically present-oriented and which therefore attaches no value to work, sacrifice self-improvement, or service to family, friends, or community, 235. 32. Brody too is amazingly short-sighted on this issue. He writes, 1992, 310, that there are three critical questions. 1. What are the reasons for the difference, in IQ? 2. Can we eliminate it? 3. If we cannot eliminate, it. Can we design an environment in which, its, effects are mitigated? It is possible that the answer to the first question might enable us to eliminate the difference. He does not see a fourth question, are whites to blame for the difference? Or that the answer to the first question might answer this one as well. 33. To anticipate some data from Chapter 9, blacks in 1992 murdered about 1,500 whites while whites murdered 5,000 whites, Je Adler et al. 1994, 26. As blacks are 12% of the population and whites 88%, blacks murdered whites at 1,500 5,000 times. 88 slash. 12 equals 2.2 times the white rate. 34. Compare the distinction between, 5, genetically diverse individuals being phenotypically identical in some common environments and, 6, genetically diverse individuals differing phenotypically in all common environments, yet phenotypically identical when exposed to different environments. 35. Their title, Inequality by Design, is disingenuous. It makes them appear to be claiming, adventurously, that inequality is the motive of some powerful agency but the authors later explain that all they mean is that inequality is a byproduct of certain intentional actions, usually government policies. That is like saying Columbus brought smallpox to the new world by design because the spread of the disease was a byproduct of his intentionally crossing the Atlantic. 36. One of Curley's main worries is egalitarian leveling down harming the well-off without benefiting the badly off simply to minimize the difference between them. He appears to settle for a combined strategy, other end states as well as equality are good, which in some circumstances, however, prescribes leveling down. 37. He adds, it is difficult to say what we mean here. 38. Kagan, 1989, detects an almost unlimited obligation to help the worse off. See section 7.1, n. 2. 39. Whale, 1960, cites evidence that, as measured by birth, death, and infant mortality rates, the average health of slaves was better than that of manumitted freemen in the North. 40. These data from the entry Negro in the 11th edition of the Encyclopedia Britannica, 1914. 41. To judge from the tone of Aristotle's discussion of this argument in Nyamakine Ethics 3, it was familiar by his time. See Nagel, 1987, 78 to 79, for another contemporary statement. 42. Rawls gives two reasons for not letting the contractors maximize the mean expected utility of positions, 167 to 175. A calculation of the relevant expectations requires each contractor to assign probability 1 slash n to his occupying each of the n possible positions in the society being formed, and the principle of indifference is irrational in a state of total ignorance. This restriction seems ad hoc, and anyway Rawls contractors are stipulated to know a great deal of a general nature about society, for instance that they will have descendants, b. Since no contractor knows his utilities, he cannot estimate his payoff in any position, hence cannot calculate average utilities for himself. This problem can be overcome by calculating the mean value of a position over all utility functions, 
and averaging those values over all positions. Let, by, I n be the set of positions in a given society and, huge, j k, the set of utility functions any contractor may have. The mean utility of positions is, the number maximized by contractors who are not pure risk avoiders. 43. Gautier, 1984, 221, comes close to invoking pre-social genetic factors in individual productivity. 44. D. Richards, 1973, argues that spending extra money on the disabled denies them equal opportunity by denying them an equal chance to realize their good. Surely, bright students in boring classes geared to the less able are also denied an equal opportunity to realize their good. 45. In the technical sense, pairs of genotypes responding differently to the same environment, hence the difference in response of two genotypes varying with environment. 46. Goldberger and Mansky immediately add of course, such calculations are fatuous. But they never explain why they think so, or disown the calculations, or withdraw them as a reason for declaring that heritability sets no limits on the effectiveness of environmental change. 47. They conclude, if the factors preventing African American children from maintaining the gains they achieve in Head Start could be removed, the program could probably be judged an incontrovertible success. One is reminded of the operation that succeeded but for the death of the patient. 9. Crime. Important as is the issue of justice, many people find the relation of race to crime of equal concern. This topic raises basic questions of risk avoidance, rights to self-defense, the use of race in judging individuals, the function of government, and, ultimately, free will. 9.1. Black crime. The impression that young black males are disproportionately likely to commit crimes against persons is supported by, and almost certainly results from intuitive awareness of, the relevant statistics. Every study of the subject finds a positive correlation between race and serious victim for crime, LS 1987b, 531-532. Blacks commit most of the FBI indexed offenses, accounting for half of all arrests for assault and rape and 62% of arrests for robbery, Rushton 1988 a, 1016, Hernstein and Wilson 1985, 461 to 466, Hacker 1992, 181, Jest 1995. Blacks commit more than 57% of all murders, Jest 1995, Hacker, 1992, puts the figure at 55%, also the proportion derived from the FBI data for 1992, at 12% of the population, the average black is thus, 0.62 slash dot 12. 0.38 slash dot 88 equals 12 times more likely than the average non-black to have committed a robbery and 0.55 slash dot 12.45 slash dot 88 equals 9 times more likely to have committed a murder. In Washington, D.C., Los Angeles, and Detroit the rate of homicide by firearms among 15 to 19 year olds exceeds 220 per 100,000. According to Jud. Adler et al., 1994, the national homicide rate for black males 15 to 24 is 160 per 100,000, as against 16 per 100,000 for white males. In addition to accounting for most violent crime, blacks are also disproportionately represented in all categories of felony except those requiring access to large amounts of money, such as stock fraud. Hacker 1992. More than half the U.S. prison population is black, Klein, Peter Cilia, and Turner 1990, Walensky 1995, Butterfield 1995, Gilead and Beck 1995. Of black males over 18, 6.75% were held in federal, state or local jails in 1994 while 86% of white males were Gilead and Beck 1995, 7, 
a ratio of 7.8 to 1. Some criminologists use the rule of thumb that a black male is ten times more likely than his white counterpart to be involved in homicide, rape, robbery, and aggravated assault, Berger 1987. Taylor notes that many of these comparisons understate the white-black difference by counting non-European Hispanics, whose crime rate exceeds that of European whites, as white. A black is more than nine times more likely than a non-Hispanic white to be in a federal prison. More than 30% of black males between the ages of 23 and 29 are incarcerated for the commission of a felony, Jest 1995, Ma and Huling 1995, Table 2, while the incarceration rate for white males in that age group is usually put below 3%, for example, T. Moore 1988. 54, Walensky 1995. The black incarceration rate increases with high black population density, at any time, 42% of the black male population of Washington, D.C. is in jail, on parole, on probation, or being sought by the police, in Baltimore the figure is 56%, between 45% and 55% of black males in Detroit, Los Angeles, Philadelphia and Chicago spent time in jail, on probation, or being sought on arrest warrants, Raspberry 1992. In Little Rock, Arkansas, blacks, at 33% of the population, commit 83% of the homicides and 93% of the robberies, making a black 25 times more likely than a white to have committed a robbery. Since the black population is about 58,000 and 7,500 blacks, virtually all young males, were arrested for violent crimes between May 1991 and April 1992, Uita Brook 1993, about 25% of the black male population was arrested for felonies in that one year. It has been estimated that 85% of black males in the District of Columbia will be arrested once in their lives, Walensky 1995. There is a disparity between popular beliefs about black victimization and the facts. Georgia is thought to be populated by violent rednecks, threatening to blacks. But of the 2,484 murders committed in Georgia between 1973 and 1979, 1,676, or 67 percent, were perpetrated by blacks, Baldus, Woodworth and Pulaski 1992. At 26.5 percent of the population of Georgia in 1,980,2 blacks committed murder at, 67 26.5, 33 73.5, equals 5.6 times the white rate. The data do not sustain the idea that blacks are arrested more frequently, hence tried and convicted more frequently, because of police bias. Prevalence rates by race in arrests parallel prevalence rates by victims reports, so do not represent bias in arrests, Hindling 1978. In a California study, Klein, Peter Cilia, and Turner, 1990 found no race differences in incarceration rates or sentencing when such variables as number of previous convictions and age of earliest conviction were fixed. Three, When black population density is high, blacks commit literally scores of times more murders than whites. Murder rates for European countries run between 2 and 5 per 100,000 annually, Rushton 1994, Whitney 1995. In states like Utah whose residents are virtually all of European descent it falls below one, in areas with mostly black populations, such as Washington, D.C., and Atlanta, Georgia, homicide victimization exceeds 60 per 100,000. The homicide rate among 15 to 18 year old black males reached 272 per 100,000 for Detroit in 1987, Rop et al. 1992, 2908. The correlation between murder rate and percentage of population black for the 50 states is 0.77, Whitney 1995, rising to 0.82 when Washington, D.C., is added, 
Whitney 1990b. For the 170 most populous cities the correlation is 0.69, Whitney 1995. In these same cities the correlation between percentage of population black and rape and robbery are 0.52 and 0.75, respectively, Kleck and Patterson 1993. The major jump in black crime, along with increased racial divergence in rates for homicide and all arrests, occurred between 1966 and 1972, immediately after passage of the major civil rights legislation, C. Murray. 1984, 116, figure 8.2, Henstein and Wilson, 1985, 465, figure 2, James and Williams, 1989, 458 to 459, figures 9 to 1 and 9 to 2, and Whitney, 1995, figure 3. 9.2 intensity of preference for other race victims. Black crime concerns both blacks and whites, but three factors amplify white apprehensions. One is the option enjoyed by whites but less available to blacks of fleeing black crime. Whites can in theory avoid contact with blacks, whereas in everyday life, kinship, if nothing else, prevents blacks from altogether avoiding young black males. Hence, it is more pertinent to ask whether whites are entitled to flee black crime than to ask this question of blacks. The second is the character of the worst quintile of black criminal behavior. Like other race differences, differences in law abidingness can be represented by two overlapping bell curves. That mean white conformity to laws against personal violence is ten times that of blacks amounts to a leftward shift of the black mean by as much as 2 SD, for a displacement inducing profound tail effects, the lowest black quintile should display viciousness almost unknown among whites. This expectation corresponds to a reality reported daily in the media, black males killing out of irritation, girlfriends cranky babies, out of petty greed for money to buy running shoes, out of anger, over a basketball call, Lee, Sip, and Tabor 1992. Whites are alarmed not only by the frequency of black crime, but by the extremes of depravity and indifference to human life it reaches. It is true that whites monopolize serial killing and have produced uniquely deranged specimens like Jeffrey Dahmer, but these instances are extremely rate. Casual brutality is far more common among blacks. The third concern is the asymmetry in interracial crime. It is widely publicized that blacks are more likely than whites to be crime victims 5 and that their victimizers are more likely to be black than white. In 1989, for instance, 81.7% of aggravated assaults against blacks were committed by blacks as opposed to 13.1% by whites.6 what is less widely known is the preference of blacks for white victims. More than 97% of white crime is committed against whites, while one half to two thirds of black crime is also committed against whites. In 1987, 50.2% of simple assaults by blacks had white victims semicolon 7 between 1979 and 1986. 2,416,696 of the 4,088,945 simple assaults committed annually by blacks were directed against whites, Whitaker 1990, tables 1, 16, a cross racial rate of 59%. Since blacks are 12% of the population, 88% of the victims of black, and white, crime would be white if victim choice were random. Thus, whites attacked blacks at about one quarter the rate predicted by random victim choice, while blacks attack whites at about two thirds the predicted rate. Taking the ratio of these fractions, 0 0.66/.25, as a measure of intensity of preference by race, blacks may be said to prefer white victims more than 2.6 times as intensely as whites prefer black victims. Informative as this ratio is, it seriously understates the racial asymmetry because of the absolutely greater crime rates of blacks. 
Since the average black is more than 2.5 times more likely to victimize a white than the average white is to victimize a black, and 10 times more likely to have committed a crime, the average black is about 25 times more likely to have victimized a white than the average white is to have victimized a black. These measures indicate how much blacks prefer white victims as compared to how much whites prefer black victims, but not compared to how much blacks prefer black victims, and I have not found data that permit direct comparison of black and white preferences for black, or white, victims. Assuming these are the same is at the moment a convention. Whether black criminals prefer white to black victims also depends on questions of opportunity but residential patterns do not present blacks with disproportionate contact with whites. Correction must also be made for assaults following prior personal contact, as in bar fights, as opposed to assaults with no prior contact, as in robbery, blacks predominating in the latter category, Cats 1989. Expected payoff is also a factor in robbery, with white victims likely to have more money than black, but, Unlike opportunity, this factor would not mitigate the greater preference for white victims on the part of black criminals. The intensity of preference ratio is robust. According to Ingrasa, 1993, whites in 1992 murdered 5,967 other whites and 392 blacks, while blacks murdered 6,600 other blacks and 1,216 whites. Hence, while the proportion of black victims of white victimizers was 392 5,967 equals 0.0616, the proportion of white victims of black victimizers was 1,216 7,816 equals 0.184, yielding an intensity of preference ratio of 0.184 slash.0616 equals 3. According to a survey described in the FBI's October 1993 Uniform Crime Reports, of 11,250 incidents of homicide in 1992. 47.3% of the 23,760 total committed that year, whites committed 4,855, which included 291 black victims, while blacks committed 5,984, which included 794 white victims. Again, assuming victim choice ought to be random. The intensity of black preference for white victims was 2.35. Proportionally, blacks killed 22 times as many whites as whites did blacks. Interracial rape statistics also show a pronounced preference on the part of black males for white victims when compared to white victimizations of blacks. The relevant figures are given in Table 9.1, from Tables 1 and 16 of Whitaker, 1990. Black women are victimized by 3% of white rapes, or 3 twelfths equals 0.25 the expected rate if victim choice is random, while 48% of black rapes victimize white women, at 48, 88 equals 0.54 the expected rate, yielding an intensity of black preference for white victims of 2.26. Since blacks are reported as committing about 40% of all rapes, so that a black is almost 5 times as likely as a white to have committed rape, a black is about 11 times more likely to have raped a white woman than a white is to have raped a black woman. Whitaker cautions, incidentally, that the figure for white on black rape is based on fewer than 10 sample cases in the 125,000 households surveyed a number too small to permit calculation of a standard error, 1990, 10. Many people, for example, Leslie 1990, use the belief that black men strongly desire white women, once prevalent in the American South, to illustrate the psychopathy of stereotyping. In fact, this belief seems empirically correct. At the same time, the low incidence of white on black rape undermines the claim that one way whites oppress blacks is by treating black women as fair game. Table 9.18 Interracial and Intraracial Rape Black Victimizer White Victimizer 
Black Victim 26703337 White Victim 25032 Source, Whitaker, 1990. The asymmetry in preference for other race victims moderates but is far from reversed in the infamous American South. Using figures for Georgia from Baldus, Woodworth, and Pulaski, 1992, 258, Table 13.1. 233 whites were murdered by blacks between 1979 and 1982, while 60 blacks were murdered by whites, meaning that a white was 233 60 equals 3.9 times likelier to be murdered by a black than vice versa. However, as the ratio of blacks to whites in Georgia at that time was 26.5 73.5 equals 0.36. Random victim choice predicts that whites would be murdered by blacks 36% as frequently as blacks by whites, so a black was 3.9 slash dot 36 10 times more likely to kill a white than vice versa. Contrary to the impression given by extensive media coverage of a small number of white on black attacks, the great majority of serious interracial incidents involve blacks attacking whites, Bormister, Smart, and Bowden. 1996, estimate that 80 to 90 percent of all interracial crime is black on white. Casual perusal of newspapers over a one year period turned up numerous instances of black on white mayhem. Nine seemingly more heinous than the Rodney King case, the killing of Yusef Hawkins, or the death of Michael Griffith in Howard Beach. 10 There are other asymmetries in media coverage. The perpetrator's race is often omitted or mentioned fleetingly in accounts of black on white crime, stressed in descriptions of white on black crime. Black on white crime is not used to prove anti white feeling on the part of blacks, as the King, Hawkins, and Griffith incidents continue to be used to demonstrate white racism. 9.3 Assessing Risk the statistics in section 9.2 indicate that anyone of any race encountering a young black male in isolated circumstances is more warranted in considering himself a potential victim, in taking precautions, and in seeking to escape, than when encountering a white in like circumstances. One is justified, absolutely speaking, in believing himself in danger from a black and whites are justified in believing themselves in more danger than they would be if they were black. Recall from chapter 2 the statistical rule that an hypothesis can be rejected only when its probability falls below 0.05. Since the odds now exceed 0.3 that any given black male is an offender, the possibility that a randomly encountered black male is an offender cannot be rejected. This sort of reasoning is common at the informal level. If one in three Acme automobiles breaks down in traffic, you cannot ignore the possibility that the Acme you are about to step into will break down. Failure is not worth worrying about only if fewer than five Acmes per 100 break down. The failure rate for Acmes does not mean, nor need you believe, that the Acme you are thinking of taking on a test drive will conk out the instant you leave the showroom but it does justify mistrust of a car that might fail at some inopportune time. While not always quantitative, common sense recognizes that an outcome need not be certain, or even more probable than not, to be taken seriously, so acting as if the Acme might break down, perhaps by preparing an alternate form of transportation home, does not require believing that it actually will. Acting as if a black might be a felon does not require believing he actually is one. It requires just the belief that the chance that he is one is great enough to take seriously. Objectors to this reasoning might seize the concession in chapter 2 that 0 .05 is not a magic number. Bayesian statisticians reject talk of accepting and rejecting hypotheses altogether, replacing it with talk of the expected value of behavior. To compute this quantity for an action A, first multiply the payoff of doing a given hypothesis H by H is probability, the sum of these weighted payoffs over all H is A's expected value, and the best act is the one whose expected value is highest. 11 here probabilities are used neat, 
without reference to further epistemic assessment. Much scientific practice is Bayesian in spirit, scientists report the probability of data given hypotheses under test, or the level at which the data are significant, without presuming that any probability deserves or amounts to belief. Nothing important in the race, crime issue changes, however, under a shift from binary accept, reject mode to expectations, comparative acceptability judgments are invariant under choice of confidence level, or abandonment of confidence levels altogether. No matter what makes a judgment reasonable, it is more reasonable to act as if an Acme might break down than as if a Mercedes might, and more reasonable to be wary of blacks than whites, the expectation of wariness of blacks always exceeds that of wariness of whites. Nor is Bayesianism without its critics.12 so nothing is altered by assuming a confidence level of 0.05. A useful generalization of expected value is expected morality. Assume the world is in state W. The moral worth of an act A in W is the difference between the rights protected in W and the rights violated in W by doing A. Now multiply A's moral worth in W by the probability that the world actually is in W. The sum of these products for every world state is A's expected morality, and A is morally preferable to act B when A's expected morality is greater. 13. Suppose, then, that jogging alone after dark, you see a young black male ahead of you standing on the running track, not dressed in a jogging outfit and displaying no other information bearing trait. Knowing nothing else about him, you must set the likelihood of his being a felon at point three. Since felons are not always on the prowl, the conditional probability that he will attack if he is a felon is less than one, so your chance of being attacked is under point three. Still, should the conditional probability that he will attack under the circumstances exceed 0.16, the all-in probability of danger, the product of the probability that he is a felon with the conditional probability that he will attack if he is, still exceeds 0.05. On the other hand, it is rational to trust a white male under identical circumstances, since the probability of his being a felon is below 0.05, and, since whatever factors affect the probability of a felon attacking you, the isolation, your vulnerability, the chances that you carry money, are presumably invariant, the all-in probability of the white attacking likewise falls further when circumstances are considered. It remains rational to be more wary of the black. The jogger case is not a contrivance to make a philosophical point. Many real-life situations resemble this one in requiring instant decisions. A woman is alone on an elevator, the door opens, a black male enters. Should she step out? A man alone in a subway car sees four black teenagers get on. Stay or go? Should a store owner keep a sharper eye on a black chauffeur about whom he knows nothing except his race? Should cab drivers be more reluctant to pick up black males? especially young ones. In these situations, race, sex and age are the only variables to go on. In each case it is rational to be more wary of blacks. In fact, the analogy between race and sex brought out by these cases is very strong. Females are known to be much more law-abiding than males, so you will see three teenage girls walking toward you late at night as less dangerous than three teenage boys. I dare say no one would deny that it is rational and sensible for a female hitchhiker to shun a ride with a male but accept one from another female. Anyone who denies the rationality and prudence of discriminating by race in the running track, elevator, shop, subway, and taxi cases must explain why it is worse than discriminating by sex in the hitchhiker case. The probability of a black attacking you in any one running track like encounter might be less than 0.05. Still, since this probability is, much, greater than that of a white attacking in a similar situation, the number of such encounters one permits becomes important, since the number needed to raise above 0.05 the probability of being attacked eventually is smaller for blacks than whites, if blacks are n times more likely to be criminals than whites. The necessary number of encounters is 1 slash n in that for whites.
This inequality is of practical importance because rational conduct requires policies, general rules adopted in advance to cover all cases of a given sort. While adherence to policies guarantees a few costly errors, the long-run cost of trying to decide each case on its merits is greater, even if the chance of attack in a single case is slight. The chance of attack sooner or later becomes ponderable more quickly if one avoids blacks no more frequently than one avoids whites. The extreme undesirability of even one attack thus warrants a policy of greater caution toward blacks. It cannot be repeated too often that, although the odds are 7 out of 10 that the black on the running track is not a felon, you do not violate probabilities by acting as if he might be. The odds are 7 out of 10 that the prophet Acme will hold up in traffic, yet you do not violate probabilities by reserving other means of transportation. The presence of a raspy cough that indicates an operable tumor 30% of the time makes it more likely than not that you don't have lung cancer, yet in these circumstances you would quickly agree to a biopsy, since you are now much more likely to have cancer than if you did not cough at all. The odds of cancer have grown sufficiently high to initiate countermeasures. Expressions of statistical intuitions, like stereotypes, must be interpreted charitably. People may say you can't trust acmes when they mean that enough acmes, it need not be 50%, break down to bring all under suspicion. When, some, people say you can't trust blacks, they probably mean, not that most or all blacks are criminals, but that blacks are likely enough to be criminals to warrant extra suspicion. The black on the running track is definitely a felon or definitely not. Ideally, you would base your behavior on knowledge of which, just as, ideally, you would base a decision to buy the Acme in the showroom on determinate information about its reliability, and your decision to undergo a biopsy on information about the cause of your particular cough. But in none of these cases do you have this information. So far as you know, the black is a typical member of a class one third of whose members are felons, and the probability to be assigned to a typical member of that class being a felon is one third. 9.4. Some technical issues. A number of technical objections might be brought against running track reasoning. Objection 1. This reasoning assumes indifference, the principle that, Absent any consideration to the contrary, the probability of each of n mutually exclusive, jointly exhaustive outcomes is 1 slash n. Reply, the principle of indifference can indeed be abused, but it is legitimate here. The chief fallacy to which it lends itself is asymmetric partitioning of the reference class, the partition of throws of a die into two and not two, which yields a probability of 0.5 or a two, is asymmetric. However, Treating the black on the running track as typical does not asymmetrically partition the reference class of black males or humans generally, any more than treating a sight unseen acme as typical asymmetrically partitions the class of acmes or automobiles generally. Objection 2. The jogger is reasoning in ignorance, and according to John Rawls, the indifference principle should not be used under conditions of ignorance. See Chapter 8, N. 42. Reply, this Rawlsian premise is either untrue or inapplicable here. When reasoning in ignorance about the Acme, when all that is known all about the Acme is that it comes from the Acme factory, common sense does treat it as chosen randomly. In any event Rawls' restriction on indifference applies at best to reasoning in complete ignorance, whereas we do know something about Acmes, or at least cars in general, for instance that they are mass-produced. This background knowledge justifies treating any given one as typical. Likewise, we have enough background knowledge about people to justify appeal to indifference in everyday problems involving human behavior. Objection 3, mistrusting the black turns objective observed frequencies into subjective assessments. Reply, so it does, but frequencies are ordinarily taken to support subjective assessments whatever conceptual gulf may divide them. The frequency of defectiveness among all acmes supports a criminal assessment of this particular one. 
Objection 4. Many contributors to the epistemic decision literature agree that an inquirer should seek more information when it is readily available, or when reliance on current information would be immoral. A father should require more evidence than a jury before believing his son guilty of murder. It is possible to get more information about the black by approaching him, and arguably immoral not to try to do so. Reply with regard to the first rule, the second is discussed in 9.5, among the factors that may put information out of reach are cost of acquisition and time. Perhaps all acmes that run for a week last 10 years, but you may reasonably form a snap judgment if you need a car today, or if the salesman won't let you test drive one for a week unless you promise to buy expensive options. In general, Extra information to guide a decision is too costly when the expected cost of acquiring the information exceeds the expected cost of deciding wrongly without it. It is silly to pay an investment counselor $1,000 for advice on averting a $500 loss on the stock market. Consequently, no one need take steps to acquire data when the purpose to which the data will be put is that of helping to decide whether to take those very steps. No one buys an ACME to determine whether ACMEs are worth buying. You want the data, presumably, because action taken without them is unacceptably risky, but action taken to acquire them must be done without their benefit, which is, by hypothesis, unacceptably risky. Yet this is just the situation on the running track. The problem is whether to continue toward the black, the only way to decide this is to find out more about him. The only to find out more about him is by continuing toward him. You know beforehand everything you need to know to make a decision about how to proceed. Defending the obvious with complicated rejoinders to abstruse complaints, as is done in this and the previous section, invites ridicule. The reader may feel he is being led from New York to New Jersey by way of Alaska. Where race is concerned, however, people seem capable of doubting what they elsewhere find self-evident, so argumentative overkill is difficult to avoid. 9.5. Private Morality What a private individual may do to avoid possible harm from blacks should be separated from what the state may do to protect citizens from harm, which raises additional problems. Ordinary standards sanction private precautions against the anonymous black on the jogging track. Flight from perceived danger is always permitted so long as it harms no innocent bystander, and turning around harms no one. Indeed, the perception of danger is not required to be rational. A necrophobe who accidentally wanders onto the observation deck of the Empire State Building has a right to flee so long as he tramples no one on the way down. Be that as it may, the association between race and crime often makes a perception of danger in the presence of blacks perfectly rational. The jogger, the woman in the elevator and the man in the subway do nothing irrational, or injurious, in using race as a reason for flight. What of the possibility mentioned in the last section, that flight is immoral because it risks offending an innocent black, or, in armors, 1994, jargon clotted words, that not waiting for the black to clarify his intentions destroys what Professor Patricia Williams refers to as the fullness of African Americans' public, participatory selves, 795. 14 A perfectly adequate reply is that the jogger is not the one imposing the risk, or, should it occur, the harm of offense. Responsibility for a harm is borne by the author of the first rung in the chain of events leading up to it. The jogger's flight was caused by fear of being victimized, caused in turn by the criminal acts of other blacks. The jogger may be said to initiate the offense since he flees voluntarily, but only in the sense in which, in Aristotle's example, a storm beset captain voluntarily jettisons his cargo. Ideally, the black on the track will realize that he is not being judged, since the jogger knows nothing about him, but is merely a stand-in for a statistical judgment based on the behavior of others. The unwillingness of cab drivers to pick up blacks is one of the staple proofs of persistent racism, but understanding racism as irrational race-based aversion, this unwillingness is not racist. Cab drivers refuse blacks because they believe, rightly given the evidence, 
that black fairs are more dangerous than others. Ideally, an innocent black unable to hail a cab will resent the individuals whose wrongful acts have caused his indignity, namely the blacks who have robbed so many taxis that cab drivers now fear all black males. But let us grant that you the jogger are the one responsible for insulting the black you avoid. Your second exemption from blame is that the expected morality of flight exceeds that of continuing ahead. The moral cost of continuing is, at a first approximation, the odds that the black in front of you is a felon, namely 0.3, times the wrongness of assault, while the moral cost imposed by flight is 0.7 times the wrongness of insult. Insulting criminals is not wrong, if an attack is more than seven thirds times worse than an insult, as common sense surely agrees, fleeing minimizes expected moral cost. As I have already conceded, the expected moral cost of jogging ahead must be discounted by the odds that a felon will not attack, but the cost of flight must also be discounted by the odds that an innocent black will not notice, not care, or interpret your behavior charitably. Such calculations cannot be made entirely precise, but the right to avoid victimization by violence is so much stronger than the right not to be insulted that avoiding the risk of attack justifies inflicting a racial insult. 9.6. State Action In asking whether the right to use race in seeking safety extends from the individual to the state, I am not proposing any specific race-based policy. In practice, the best responses to black crime may simply be the best race neutral responses to crime, period. The question of race based anti crime policies is of interest because there is no guarantee that the state can always ignore race in this regard and, more important, it raises general issues about race consciousness and equal treatment. State use of non racial information bearing traits in suspect profiles, searches for probable cause, and internal revenue service audits sets a precedent for the use of race for the same purpose and in the same manner. Customs agents may subject people carrying violins to special scrutiny if the suitability of violins for hiding contraband increases the chance that anyone possessing one is a smuggler. A glimpse of radio stacked in the back seat of a car entitles the highway patrol to search the car. The state discriminates on the basis of possession of violins and occupancy of cars with stacked radios in the sense that it calibrates its treatment of individuals by these traits. The IRS uses statistical data in deciding whom to audit. Once the ratio of deductions to income passes a certain, secret, threshold, the government discriminatorily calls the filer in. Indeed. Officials charged with preventing and detecting crime are obligated to use relevant information in screening. Customs agents would be remiss in letting violin cases through airports unchecked in the circumstances described. But race bears information. Knowledge of race redistributes probabilities about past and potential crimes. So, absent countervailing considerations, the state seems entitled, indeed obligated to use it in screening. Reportedly, the New Jersey Highway Patrol at one time subjected young black males in expensive new cars to drug searches. 15 Given that the presence of a young black male in an expensive car makes involvement with drugs somewhat probable, and more probable than does the presence of a young white male, ordinary standards mandate searches of blacks while leaving optional, or precluding, searches of whites. If the probability of finding drugs in a vehicle varies with the driver's race, state agents may stop vehicles on the basis of driver's race, just as state agents may search violin owners if the probability of finding contraband varies with type of luggage. Gun control advocates and the police agree that much of the violence in black neighborhoods is due to the number of young black males carrying guns. It therefore seems reasonable to allow the police to use race as a factor in deciding whom to frisk for weapons. This conclusion seems to contradict a consensus in the literature on statistical proof in law, see, for example, Tribe 1971. Much of this literature concerns the Blue Cab Co., which owns 60% of the taxi cabs in a given city. When an accident involves an otherwise unidentified cab, there is, a priori, 
a 60% chance that the cab is a blue. Yet, the consensus goes, use of this statistic as evidence of blue's culpability is plainly improper. The principal guiding judgment here, I believe, is that evidence sufficient to convict must not only raise the probability of guilt above some minimum, which statistical evidence might do, but must also be a specific symptom of guilt. That is, the evidence must be made more probable by the hypothesis of guilt. A paradigm-specific symptom is a causal trace, like a chip of blue paint at the accident scene, which is more likely to be found if a blue cab was involved than otherwise. 16 statistical probabilities, on the other hand, are not specific symptoms, the hypothesis that a blue was involved in the accident does not materially raise the probability that 60% of accidents involve blues. 17 That seems to be why statistical probabilities do not convict. However, the issues on which the blue case turns are irrelevant to those raised by racial screening. Screening is not a determination of guilt or the imposition of punishment, so the evidence that warrants screening need not meet the specific symptom condition. In addition, stipulating that 60% of accidents involve blues only because 60% of cabs are blues is to assume that blues, taken individually, are no more accident-prone than greens, whereas blacks are more likely to commit crimes than whites. 18 Under the properly parallel assumption that blues drive more recklessly than greens, while it would be unreasonable to accuse blues every time there is an accident, it would be reasonable for traffic officers to keep a sharper eye on them. If the state is allowed to deter blue heedlessness by imposing higher insurance premiums with expedited payments, expedited appeals procedures and more severe punishment might be warranted for convicted black offenders. Think of this test case. A policeman on his beat sees three adolescent black males enter store 1 and three adolescent Chinese males enter store 2. He wants to take preventive action against shoplifting by making his presence known, but has time to walk by just one store, walking by one will leave the other vulnerable. What should he do? It seems absurd to say that he should do nothing or flip a coin. Surely he should go where, using the facts available to him a crime is more likely to occur, and that is store 1. J. Adler, 1994, a critic of race-conscious crime prevention, concedes that the policeman may walk past store 1 so long as he does not more actively interfere with the blacks in it. But the line Adler seeks to draw is inadequately motivated. Suppose the policeman sees one of the blacks ostentatiously keeping one hand in his pocket, either holding a gun or pretending to to taunt the store owner. The policeman has often seen black teens, but seldom boys of other races, taunt storekeepers in this way, in other words, he has found the provocativeness of a hand in a pocket to vary with the hand's color, is the policeman then permitted to enter store 1? To approach the boy with his hand in his pocket? May the boy be asked to empty his pockets, but not forced to if he refuses? or may the policeman make physical contact. Once the predictiveness of race is allowed into the policeman's initial deliberation, banning the use of race thereafter is arbitrary. 9.7. The Purpose of Government The presumption favoring race consciousness created by suspect profiles can be rebutted by a relevant difference between race and other information-bearing traits, and we will presently examine a number of such proposed differences. Before that, however, a more systematic argument for racial screening is in order. The argument begins from the premise that government exists primarily to ensure security. Hobbes and Locke, whose justifications of the state are the ones currently most favored, agree on this. They differ in that Locke sees the state as protecting antecedent natural rights, while for Hobbes the state is a device to end an inherently amoral war of all against all common 19 but both insist that the point of government is to keep each man safe from invasion by another. Furthermore, both are contractarians who derive the state from an agreement between individuals to transfer, to a single enforcer, their right, lock, or liberty, Hobbes, to punish wrongdoers or invaders of natural liberty. Both may grant that there never was a state of nature, and that the prisoner's dilemma would prevent rational egoists from ever leaving it. Their point, 
rather, is that the only reason men in a state of nature would want to create civil society, the one benefit of a sovereign unavailable from voluntary association, is security. One right each man transfers to the state is the use of information to gauge threats. Locke never explicitly mentions this prerogative, but traces of it remain in civil society, where anyone may preempt a clear and present danger to himself, as when in the absence of police a man may disarm a stalker advancing on him with a knife. Now, Locke accords everyone a natural executive right to enforce everyone's rights. On this theory, Although my right to use information in civil society does not extend to my entering a car in which I see burglars' tools, I did have this right in the state of nature, since I had a right to act against perceived threats to anyone. The state acquires its right to preempt both non specific threats, a man carrying burglars' tools, and threats to unknown targets, a burglar concealing his destination, from these antecedent rights of individuals. A simpler derivation might trace the state's general right to preemption to each man's natural right to preempt threats to himself only, all of which have been transferred to the state, having everyone's right to self-defense. The state may move against non-specific threats and threats to unknown targets because any threat endangers someone. Twenty, however derived, there is a police right to protect property by preemptively stopping cars with burglar tools. The right to protection is not conceived as a correlative duty of the state. Individuals do not transfer their rights to the state by contracting with it, it is an artifact, but by contracting with each other to form a state. The effect is much the same, however. The state acquires each citizen's right to self-defense, with the understanding, between the citizens, that it will enforce those rights. Individuals thereby acquire a right to the enforcement of their rights by the state. An automobile dealer's promise that the car he is selling will work gives the purchaser a right to a reliable car, although the promise binds the salesman, not the car. Moreover, the state needs agents to perform its duties, and these agents, the police, quite literally promise to enforce the rights of other members of society. They are our deputies to whom we have transferred our right, lock, or liberty, Hobbes, to defend ourselves against attack. However the agreement to be a peacekeeper is understood, in making it each policeman obliges himself to protect everyone. Twenty-one agents of the state are thus obliged to provide security, and, since what is obligatory is permissible, the state as embodied in its agents may use otherwise permissible means to achieve this end. Given the relation between race and crime, the state's primary protective function permits and probably demands that it attends to race. 9.8. Strict Judicial Scrutiny. This argument may be pursued by way of the U.S. Supreme Court's distinction between two rationales for government classification of individuals, corresponding to two levels of scrutiny, intermediate and strict to which a classification may be held. There is also a less demanding rational basis test, but not since Plessy has this test been deemed sufficient to warrant racial classifications, a classification is benign when intended to serve important governmental objectives, substantially related to the achievement of those objectives, and, not intended to burden any individual or group on the basis of race. Metro Broadcasting v. FCC 1990 the Supreme Court upheld benign racial classifications in Metro, where preferences for blacks competing for broadcast licenses were permitted as serving the state's interest in diversity. 22 A Lockheen or Hobbist acquainted with this holding would insist that, if the state may identify individuals by race to enhance diversity, it may identify individuals by race to control violence. Controlling violence is a more important governmental objective than diversity. The race crime correlation shows classifying by race to be substantially related to this goal, and this classification is not intended to burden blacks simply for being black. Yet the court has also held that race is a suspect category, that racial classifications must be scrutinized strictly and that such classifications are permitted only when necessary for a compelling state interest. 
the court resolves this seeming inconsistency by construing as benign those racial classifications beneficial to blacks, and as suspect those burdensome to blacks, see below, insistence on this more stringent standard does not disrupt the argument from Locke and Hobbes. Protecting the innocent against aggression is a compelling state interest, it is why the state exists. Black homicide and robbery rates ten times those of whites, indicating that aggression is disproportionately black aggression, suggest that race consciousness of some form is necessary for its adequate control. Greater police readiness to frisk young black males that decreased the incidence of murder, robbery and assault might carry these practices past strict scrutiny. The court's main reason for striking down burdensome race-based classifications is that they may reflect racial antagonism, rather than, pressing public necessity, Kuematsu v. United States 1944, a finding that presumes that any such classification expresses only racial antagonism. Behind this presumption is the idea that classifications burdening blacks almost certainly have no rational use. What crime statistics show, precisely, is that special attention to young blacks can be driven by more than antagonism. Stopping crime, which young black males are more likely to commit by an order of magnitude, is a pressing public necessity if anything is. Federal court decisions, it may be said, are a good guide to actual current Caucasoid standards. The courts resolve to forbid classifications burdensome to blacks and to permit, sometimes mandate, classifications burdensome to whites, shows that the value underlying this resolve has become a fixed moral point. To rephrase this claim less tendentiously, the Supreme Court, and our morality, finds benign those racial classifications whose purpose is not to burden whites, but to help the disadvantaged or increase diversity. Yet whatever the purpose of a legal classification, racial or otherwise, some individuals are better off because of it, and some are worse off. Under the racial classification permitted in Metro, whites are worse off than they would have been had that classification been struck down. At the same time, the court has not been as ready to permit classifications under which blacks would be worse off than otherwise. Indeed, since Griggs v. Duke, 1971, the court has repeatedly applied the disparate impact test to classifications burdening blacks, finding practices, however intended, to be discriminatory when they affect blacks adversely. It is this asymmetry I mean when I speak of the impermissibility of just those classifications that burden blacks. The point of contemporary morality allegedly fixed by recent court decisions is that just those racial classifications burdening blacks should be scrutinized strictly. Allowing that the courts have embraced asymmetric scrutiny, vast differences remain between this value and such moral fixtures as honesty. Honesty seemed as obligatory to the Greeks as it does to us, whereas strict scrutiny is only a few decades old. More time than this is needed to establish fixity. Indeed, the period of asymmetric strictness may turn out to be a transitional one, during which the court saw blacks as needing protection from whites and discrimination as the cause of all race problems. To historians a century hence, the asymmetry may seem as time bound as Plessy's separate but equal doctrine seems to us now. Second, the paradigm fixed points of morality as a class, give hope of subsumption under a single general principle, such as maximization of happiness or the golden rule. One-sided strict scrutiny does not seem to instance any general rule. The same point differently expressed is that strict scrutiny is complex whereas the familiar fixed points of morality are simple. There seems no clear, principled way to distinguish classifications burdening blacks from those burdening whites. Of course, any reasonable rule recognizes exceptions and gray areas, the injunction to honesty permits little white lies. However, hard as it may be to draw precisely, the line between forbidden and permitted lies is itself a principled, whereas classifications burdening whites differ from those burdening blacks only in the race of the burdened.
At this point I will be reminded of all the reasons I myself cited in chapter 8 for distinguishing discrimination against blacks from discrimination against whites. Ironically, these reasons generate the deepest difference between asymmetric scrutiny and paradigm fixed points. Unlike the rule of honesty, one-sided color consciousness rests on the historically specific factual assumptions that blacks were seriously mistreated in the past, that classifications burdening blacks reflect harmful stereotypes, and that these classifications can be motivated only by racial hostility. The factual assumptions behind the rule of honesty, by contrast, are universal, that lying undermines trust, that lying pays only when it is the exception that lying is parasitic on truthfulness because the meaning of a word is determined by its standard use. I am not, at this juncture, challenging either the empirical assumptions behind one-sided scrutiny or their ability to sustain it, I am pointing out that these assumptions carry too much of the weight for one-sided scrutiny to be a fundamental value. The most striking proof of the importance of these assumptions is that when they are relaxed, as when it is observed that whites were never mistreated by a dominant group, color consciousness is allowed. Unlike the value of honesty, the value of one-sided scrutiny is not inherent in the human condition. But let us allow that strict scrutiny for classifications burdening blacks has become integral to morality and law. We recur to the point that racial screening and other forms of race consciousness might yet be permitted, for they might be found to survive strict scrutiny. At this writing, they almost certainly would not. In the few cases where screening has been tested before the courts, such as the one involving the New Jersey Highway Patrol, it has been struck down. Yet times change, and someday the Supreme Court could, while continuing to scrutinize racial categories strictly, find control of black violence a compelling state interest and some racial classifications necessary to serve it. Were that to happen, strict scrutiny and race consciousness would coexist. 23. Private and, especially, state race consciousness for crime control draw many other objections, most directed against the analogy between racial screening and ordinary suspect profiles. I turn to these objections with the reminder that they should be viewed from two perspectives, as bearing on the specific issue of crime and as raising general issues about race consciousness. 9.9. .9. Racism again. The analysis of racism in chapter 5 sheds light on whether stopping blacks but not identically situated whites is racist. Since so describing a practice implies that it is unjustified, justified screening isn't racist, so, as usual, to criticize racial screening on grounds of racism begs the question. Screening must be found wrong for some independent reason before the epithet can apply. Alternatively, should one decide to use racism of all forms of race consciousness good or bad, racial screening is certainly racist, but racism in this sense has ceased to be a defect, so again cannot by itself support censure. Either way, asking whether screening is racist does not help in determining its propriety. 9.10 Rights precede utility. It may be objected that rights against racial screening and frisking override their potential benefits. This objection rather boldly begs the question of whether there are rights against racial screening, but that is not its main defect. Its main defect is that the argument for both ordinary and racial screening is not utilitarian at all, but rights maximizing. When push comes to shove, According to section 7.4, common sense tolerates local invasions of rights to minimize rights invasions overall. Rights maximizers are prepared to admit that detention without specific evidence of wrongdoing violates the detainee's rights, but insist that it is acceptable when on net it strengthens everyone's rights. Detaining typhoid Mary violates her rights, but keeps her from negligently endangering others racial screening pits, what we may temporarily grant is, a right against race-based screening against the right to be secure, nothing is pitted against utility. Seeing this, the screening critic might decide to refight the battle between absolute and goal-directed rules, arguing that certain rights, immunity to racial screening among them, 
are never to be compromised. This argument too begs the question of rights against race-based detainment, but, once again, there is no need to press that point. It is more instructive to stress the depths of our maximizing intuitions about the role of the state, to which end a glance at Robert Note 6 seemingly absolutist justification of the state, 1975, 78 to 84, 110 to 113, is illuminating. Initially accepting a categorical duty not to aggress, Notzik insists that the state is legitimate only if it can emerge from anarchy in a way that does not involve coercion. He easily shows how a dominant protective association might form by free association, but he cannot get it to become an enforcement monopoly, the mark of the state, without letting it impose its rules on independence. To warrant this imposition, Notes excites the anxiety created for association members by independents living among them who conduct their affairs by their own rules. He deems this anxiety so acute that the association may impose its rules on erstwhile independents, so long as it compensates for the imposition by protecting them as well. Note 6 derivation thus requires that there be levels of myth threat serious enough to warrant a bit of preemptive aggression by the proto-state, essentially the rationale of screening. What is more, the proviso about compensatory protection corresponds to the common sense demand that the state protect all other rights of screening detainees. While hardly an inadvertent proof of anything, Note 6 appeal to maximizing shows how deeply maximizing intuitions inform our ideas of permitted state action. 9.11. Slippery Slope. Racial criteria are said to grease a slope that bottoms out amidst concentration camps. This criticism can hardly be decisive, for slippery slope problems dog any legitimate policy susceptible of abuse which in practice means almost any policy whatever. Reasonable search and seizure can be interpreted over broadly, yet, despite this danger, wiretaps are tolerated. Three possible tests have already been suggested to keep race consciousness within acceptable bounds, one might require race conscious measures to be substantially related to an important government objective, or necessary for a compelling state interest or, moving beyond constitutional interpretation, to maximize expected morality. Each test can be misapplied in its turn, but so can any rule for interpreting a rule. The invocation of Hitler is particularly obnoxious in connection with crime. It is a fact, not a speculative possibility, that the murder rate in American cities, and this largely means the black murder rate, has increased tenfold in the last half century. These are real, unhypothetical deaths, and it seems perverse to reject steps that stand a real chance of reducing them because of a possibility, in context, of unimaginable remoteness. When was a death camp last directed on American soil? 9.12. Race is causally irrelevant to crime. This objection develops the proof by statistics issue discussed earlier. Unlike skin color, Familiar probable causes such as concealed rifles and stacks of car radios are causally related to the commission of crime. A stack of car radios carries information because it results from a crime. It is a specific symptom. Few crimes produce stacks of radios in the back seats of cars, but most such stacks are produced by crimes. The presence of a gun carries information because it is either a cause of crime, or, along with crime itself, an effect of criminal intent. But race is not a cause or an effect of crime, or, let us grant for now, a co-effect along with crime of some underlying cause. The felt unfairness of race consciousness is due in part to this causally relevance. Reply. The assumed causal independence of race and crime still leaves race its predictive value, and it is predictive value that warrants use of a trait in screening. Traits are listed in suspect profiles because they carry information, why they carry information is a separate question. Even though a rifle is informative because of its causal role as an instrument in crime, it is the information the rifle carries, not the reason it does so, that justifies a search when a rifle is discovered. Probable causes strike us as more trustworthy than unexplained correlations because, 
absent knowledge of a causal mechanism, we suspect that any correlation between two traits may be coincidental. But there are grounds other than a known mechanism for trusting a correlation. One is sheer persistence, indeed the very persistence of a correlation is evidence of an underlying mechanism at work. So long as we are confident of the probabilities generated by a crime relevant trait, those probabilities, not the reasons for confidence in them, justify attending to the trait. Suppose fedoras attain popularity among drug couriers but hardly anyone else because most couriers hail from the one city in the world where fedoras are back in style. Neither a cause nor an effect of drug trafficking, nor a co-effect along with drug trafficking of some underlying cause, fedoras at airports become a reliable sign of drugs. Although it is an accident that fedoras are correlated with drugs, basing drug searches on headgear would surely be justified. These searches would of course be rational if the correlation were liable to break down at any moment, and it is hard to imagine smugglers not noticing sooner or later that their headgear was giving them away. Nonetheless, so long as the couriers remained oblivious, reliance on the correlation would be reasonable. Having held for many decades and across nations, the correlation between race and crime appears secure enough to support reliance. The causal relation of race to crime is examined in below and in chapter 10. 9.13. Race is involuntary. People should not be penalized for what they cannot help, it is said, and blacks can't help their race. This is another component of the feeling that screening is unfair. Both premises, though true, are irrelevant, for screening and allied forms of race consciousness are not punishments. Were an at-large murder suspect known to bear an ineradicable birthmark, it would be proper to watch for men with such birthmarks, even though birthmarks cannot be helped. Caught and convicted, the suspect will be punished for murder, not for having a birthmark that betrayed him. If race must be ignored because it is unchosen, it is also impermissible to identify suspects by race, a practice now permitted, by eye color, by height, or should there be a genetic disposition to obesity, by weight, consequences I assume are absurd. The involuntary trait of age, usually 16, is used as a criterion for licensing drivers, in the interest of protecting the public from recklessness. Denial of the right to drive is a state-imposed burden, and an age floor is unjust to mature 15-year-olds. The reason an age standard is accepted is obvious, testing everyone for maturity is impossible, and age is a reasonable proxy. Of course, the denial of justice to a mature 15-year-old is temporary, since he will eventually become 16, whereas blacks do not become white. Still, the justice denied mature 15-year-olds is real, and permanent for mature 15-year-olds who die before turning 16. Perpetrators of actual crimes differ from merely potential criminals in point of culpability. But identification, as it is not punishment, does not require culpability. Still, while it is one thing to keep an eye on a man with a birthmark when an actual crime is known to have been committed by some man with a birthmark, it seems quite another to keep an eye on a man who merely might do something that hasn't happened. A thought experiment helps clarify matters. Assuming such a thing were discovered, would it be permissible to use a genetic predictor of homicidal aggression to track potential criminals from birth? Initially this question cuts against racial screening, since many readers will say no right off. Yet it is far from clear that reliable tracking would be widely rejected were it concretely available. A decision is made by officials of the justice system to ignore the marker because nobody chooses his genes and every year post-conviction testing shows that 12,000 murderers, committing half the murders in the United States, had the crime gene. Does the reader think it likely he would continue to object to tracking after he saw the corpses of victims who might have been alive had potential murderers been tracked? Question mark 24 Suppose, not that half of all murderers turn out to carry the gene, but that half the carriers eventually commit murder. Suppose 90% of carriers do. Would the reader still object to tracking because nobody chooses his genes? 
I suspect that at some point the average person would endorse severe restrictions on carriers. If so, intuitions about genetic tracking support racial screening. 9.14. Root causes I, stereotypes, racism, self-esteem. On the popular view that black crime is a direct or indirect effect of white misdeeds, racial screening becomes a classic case of victim blaming unfairly persecuting a group for its reaction to persecution. This view is also thought to explain why non-stigmatizing traits like birthmarks and fedoras differ from race, the association of these traits with crime was not caused by wrongs. Racial screening is worthy of the potter of the rubaiyat who threatens he will toss to hell the luckless pots he marred in making. Having made criminals of blacks, this popular view concludes. White society should address the root causes of black crime instead of picking on its victims, black criminals. The first difficulty here is that addressing root causes, however important that may be, does not prohibit more immediate race conscious steps. The root cause of arson in a city may be a depressed real estate market, but the fire marshal may stay alert anyway for suspicious cans of gasoline while economists work to buoy property values. If poor education contributes to black crime, schools can be improved at the same time that victims of past miseducation are stopped from harming other innocents. Second is the selectivity of appeal to root causes. One seldom hears of measures against crime associated with other groups, the Italian mafia, Chinese gangs, white collar fraud, being judged by their attention to causes. Understanding black crime as an effect of social forces invites a parallel understanding of, say, insider trading as an effect of a materialistic culture that leaves Porsche-less stockbrokers feeling deprived. Lynching had its causes, as does everything in nature, yet an FBI investigation of a lynch mob is not called blaming the victim. Why isn't violent dislike of blacks excused, on grounds of anger caused by black crime? Why isn't attention paid to the root causes of the Holocaust? If some criminals are victims of the past, why aren't all? Special pleading about the causes of black crime suggests the belief that its causes partially justify or excuse it. And many people do think something's very like this, that, since black crime is the effect of past injustice, either the two wrongs cancel out or else that past injuries done to blacks have left them unable to refrain from crime. The latter idea is particularly powerful, all the complaining in the world about double standards does not still the sense that black muggers differ in degree of culpability from white embezzlers, an intuition taken up in section 9.17. These cross currents complicate the root cause issue. I eventually conclude, in section 9.18 that the causes of crime of any sort are irrelevant except as they suggest means to reduce it. People have a right not to be victimized, and a right to expect the state to prevent victimization. They do not care why victimizers act as they do, and they expect the authorities not to care. At the same time, the belief is so widespread that black crime is a response to white misdeeds, and that this fact limits what may be done about it that it must be considered in their own right. There are four basic root causes hypotheses. Blacks commit crime because whites expect them to. This theory, and the replies to it, echo the discussion of chapter 3. Whites admittedly do believe blacks are relatively crime prone, the issue is why. If the causal arrow runs from expectation to crime, the origin of the expectation itself becomes obscure, although the expectation, once established, may reinforce black criminal behavior. On the other hand, the expectation is explained most parsimoniously as an effect of observation of black crime. The self-fulfilling prophecy theory of black crime has the defects of the self-fulfilling prophecy theory of stereotypes. But assuming black crime is a self-fulfilling prophecy would not undercut race conscious measures to prevent it. These measures seem wrong on the self-fulfilling prophecy hypothesis, because no one should be penalized for a wrong created by the penalty itself. When a crime is created by the punishment, it is the author of the punishment, not the nominal criminal, who is responsible. 
What if the beat cop's suspicions of a group of black teenagers are well founded only because these suspicions, by labeling the teenagers, dispose them to crime? The cop can ensure that the blacks behave properly simply by ceasing to expect them to misbehave. Preventive screening is a generalized form of entrapment. This seemingly solid argument collapses when two very different types of self-fulfillment are distinguished. A particular expectation may be called specifically self-fulfilling when that very expectation causes its own fulfillment, whereas a particular expectation is merely generically self-fulfilling when it is fulfilled because of other expectations like it. A policeman's expectation that black teenagers on the corner will harass passers-by is specifically self-fulfilling if the teenagers harass passers-by in response to the very expectation, generically self-fulfilling if those blacks harass passers-by because the suspicions of other policemen have alienated them from society. Now, the rule against entrapment only forbids acting on specifically self-fulfilled prophecies, if the blacks' potential for criminality was caused by the expectations of other policemen, not the expectations of the policemen now dispersing them, he is not responsible for the criminality he anticipates, others may be, but he is not, so in dispersing them he does not burden them for an inclination he himself has created. Perhaps those earlier suspicions should not have been harbored, but they were harbored and have had their effects. The policeman on the scene is obliged to prevent those effects from erupting into crime. Armors, 1994, treatment of these issues deserves mention in this connection. He considers a white woman, an intelligent Bayesian, in the phrase armor borrows from Walter Williams, who shoots a black she fears is about to mug her an extreme case involving private aggression, unlike my paradigms, and asks whether a legal defense can be based on the reasonableness of this fear. Struggling mightily with the statistics, 25 armor seems to allow, equivocally, reluctantly, and merely for the sake of argument, that fear of blacks is rational. Yet he concludes that the 14th Amendment, see below, prohibits this defense lest race-based statistics tap into jurors' prejudices, subvert the rationality of the fact-finding process, 796, also 798, and further entrench stereotypes about blacks as criminals, 794. Armour backs up this judgment by citing the literature on the irrationality of stereotypes. So in the end he fails to take the crime statistics seriously, a failure that prevents him from properly engaging the issue of state action. Racism The claim that white racism has contributed to black crime, like the claim that it has handicapped blacks competitively, must be distinguished from the claim that racism is the sole cause. The serious issue is proportion of variance explained. Measures ruled out because black crime is an effect of victimization by racism are ruled out only to the extent that black crime is an effect of racism. Finding that white misdeeds explain only 10%, say, of the race difference in crime rates might leave race conscious measures legitimate. These measures would not burden victims of racism, as black criminals would then be victims of racism only to a negligible extent. As I hope the reader is by now convinced, this explanation is highly implausible. Black crime rates in other countries, including all black countries, are comparable to those in the United States, Rushton 1988 A, 1988 B, 1994, 1995, Hernstein and Wilson 1985. It is possible although ad hoc to hold that in the United States alone racism is a sufficient condition of black crime, or a necessary part of a more complex sufficient condition, but then black crime should decrease as racism abates. Yet black crime has increased in recent decades as discrimination has decreased, and increased most sharply after the passage of the Civil Rights Act, affirmative action and busing ordered by the judiciary to improve the education of black children. The incarceration rate for blacks is now higher than in 1904, Encyclopedia Britannica 1914. Most black criminals have been blacks raised in a society in which they enjoy preferential treatment. 
so it is doubtful that racism explains more than a tiny portion of black crime. Poverty and Unemployment Crime is often explained by poverty, and black crime by the greater poverty of blacks. In this century, however, changes in the crime rate have varied almost inversely with poverty. Murder and robbery tend to increase with the employment rate. Rubinstein 1992. Prison admissions rose during the prosperous 1920s, fell steadily between the early 1930s and the end of World War II, and have risen sharply since the late 1960s, even though the unemployment rate has held steady or dropped slightly. Unemployment fell from 6.6% 6 .6 in 1961 to 3.4% in 1969, but the crime rate doubled, and the rate for robbery tripled. At this writing it seems to have fallen slightly during the early 1990s. Many studies have measured the relation of crime to economic factors in more sophisticated ways, some do find a positive correlation but none that explains as much as half the variation in the crime rate. One literature review concludes. The bulk of the studies examined here show some connection between unemployment, and other labor market variables, and crime, but they fail to show a well-defined, clearly quantifiable linkage. In studies that include measures of criminal sanctions and labor market factors, Sanctions tend to have a greater impact on criminal behavior than do market factors. Freeman 1983, 106. Another concludes, unemployment may affect the crime rate, but even if it does, its general effect is too slight to be measured. Therefore, the proper inference is that the effect of unemployment on crime rates is minimal at best, also 1980, 183. A standard textbook judges the findings contradictory, Vold and Bernard 1986, 134. The strongest general statement that can be made is that, at any given time, chance of arrest varies inversely with income, which is consistent with low income and high criminality being joint effects of underlying causes. The factors causing high individual time preference may manifest themselves as a desire to steal. Banfield's persons who want small amounts now and as aversion to labor. The weak relation between poverty and crime has held specifically for blacks. In 1904, when the black incarceration rate was lower than at present, the mean per capita wealth of blacks was about 2.5% that of whites, whereas it is now about 20% that of whites. Jaynes and Williams 1989, 292. Between 1930 and 1990 the proportion of the black population counted as living in poverty fell steadily from over 90% to about 33%, Jaynes and Williams 1989, 278, figure 61, as did the ratio of blacks to whites living in poverty, while the proportion of black prison inmates rose steadily from just under 25% to just over 50%, Hacker 1992, 197, Rubinstein 1994. I have been unable to locate data on race differences in criminal behavior when income is controlled for, but as the ratio of white to black mean hourly wages is 1.33, Jaynes and Williams 1989, 295, Table 65, while the black crime rate is roughly 10 times the white, crime is almost certainly more prevalent among blacks at most or all income levels. Moreover, black crime, like white crime, is committed primarily by young, unmarried men. According to a Los Angeles Times survey, looters during the 1992 Los Angeles race riot primarily targeted electronic gadgets and liquor, only 9% of the stores ransacked carried food, Whitman and Bauer Master 1993, 58. The idea of starving blacks stealing necessities does not correspond to reality. The experience of turn-of-the-century Jewish immigrants fleeing European anti-Semitism partially confirms the poverty-slash-oppression-slash-crime nexus claimed for blacks. Jews lived in great poverty on the Lower East Side of Manhattan and displayed unusual levels of crime in the sense that Jewish crime of that period exceeded Jewish norms elsewhere. It was not, however, disproportional relative to the overall American population, 
Joslet 1983, 32, as black crime is. Moreover Jewish crime, unlike black crime, was directed primarily against property rather than persons, Joslet 1983, 33. Finally, the relative prevalence of Jewish crime subsided by World War II, Joslet 1983, 158 to 159, the period 1900 to 1939 being less than that between Brown and the present. Low self-esteem. As discrimination and material deprivation have lost their plausibility as explanations of black crime, psychic deprivation has replaced them. On this theory, young black males steal and sometimes kill for flashy goods because they must do something to stand out in a society that disdains them. This theory is undermined by the almost unanimous finding that black self-esteem is higher than that of whites, see chapter 3. In fact, Bormister, Smart, and Bowden, 1996, present a powerful case for associating violent aggression with high self-esteem, 26 and address black crime in this connection. They note that the large preponderance of interracial crime, they estimate 80 to 90 percent, is now black on white, a reversal of the pattern at the beginning of the century which they tentatively attribute to the growth in black self-esteem relative to white. They describe juvenile delinquents, primarily black, at length. Delinquent boys, are, more likely than control boys to be characterized as self-assertive, socially assertive, defiant and narcissistic. The thoughts and actions of juvenile delinquents, suggest, that they held quite favorable opinions of themselves. Jankowski, found gang members were violent toward people whom they perceived to show a lack of respect or to challenge their honor. T. He code of the street centers about respect, which gangs regard as an external quality involving being granted the deference one deserves. G. Ang members believe they deserve to be treated as superior beings, respect enhanced by, nerve, which is essentially a matter of acting as if one is above the rules that apply to others and as if one disregards the rights of others. Katz noted that many youthful circles and street subcultures afford respect mainly to the bardas sort of person who transcends the pressures to conform to societal norms, rationality, and ideals. This prized identity is cultivated in part by creating the impression of being unpredictably prone to chaos and irrational violence. Researchers from different disciplines concur in depicting these young men as egotistical in several ways, and they concur emphatically on the apparent preoccupation with respect and self-assertion. 21 to 22. It is hard to reconcile all the dimensions of black crime with low self-esteem. Internalized disdain for things black might dispose blacks to attack other blacks, but it would not explain black on white crime. Low self esteem translated into resentment might make blacks attack whites, but would leave unexplained the high rate of black on black crime. Explanations of black on black crime, in particular, that blacks are attacking the image they have been taught to hate or adopting the ways of the oppressor, tend to be particularly soft and metaphorical. In addition, the low self-esteem theory treats self-esteem as externally imposed, when, to the extent that feelings of worth are under environmental control, they would seem to reflect an individual's assessment of his own abilities, and, to perhaps a lesser degree, those of the groups with which he identifies. These assessments, moreover, are comparative, being good at something is being better at it than most members of a reference class. A high school student who is good at science is better at science than most high school students, he may not be good at science compared to the average Nobel laureate in physics. Were black self-esteem a function of acceptance of blacks by whites, blacks in integrated schools should think better of themselves than blacks in segregated schools, whereas the reverse is the case, although even in integrated schools blacks are more confident than whites. See section 3.10. The comparative assessment theory explains this, most blacks in integrated schools find themselves performing below average at tasks everyone is asked to master. Contact with whites highlights black, white ability discrepancies less visible in segregated settings. 27.
Perhaps the most compelling common sense reason to doubt the self-esteem theory is that the criminal behavior of young black males just does not look like an expression of despair. In account after account, these individuals come across as full of themselves and unrepentant. Consider this description by a group of black teenagers of the escalation of violence in their subculture, Lee, Sip, and Tabor 1992, 28 italicized words the commentators. Everyone wants some kind of rep or reputation, and one way to earn one for being tough is to carry a gun, the teenagers said. No one wants to be a herb or wimp. Sean, if a guy steps on your foot, it's one of your peers says, oh, you gone let that happen to you. He stepped on your foot. You know, you have the right mind that's like I'm gone ignore that. But your friend says, you ain't gon' do nothing about that? That puts you to the limit. You be like oh, what I'm gon' do? It gets you thinking and you saying something, yo, what the hell are you doing? Or something like that. You start, you know, to break. Nathaniel Edwards, say I talking in the hallway and somebody bumped me and they meant to bump me. And now, me, I'm the herb. I will turn and I will walk away from them. Next day, he gone bump me again. Now it's a Friday, right? And he comes and bump me and he says, yo, what's up man? If you keep walking away, we'll keep bothering you. You can fight right there, but a gun gone come in sooner or later. Disputes can start over what the teenagers acknowledge to be the stupidest things. Kareem Smith said he almost fought a friend who tried to grab his cheeseburger. Others have fought when someone stepped on their sneakers or looked at them the wrong way. Rumors, he said, she said, as Kenesha Warren put it, also lead to beef. Kareem, you get beef on a basketball court over a call or something. Be ready to fight. People got shot over basketball right there at Gershwin, high school. Got shot dead two times in the head. It wasn't in school but it was after they had played basketball. One way to assure status and protection is to join a posse. Larry said he was a member of V. I. P. Van der Veer, Housing Project, International Posse, until two years ago and, among others things, they stole money from kids who earned tips bagging groceries. Threats to establish within group dominance and alliances for exploiting the weak are not efforts to attract the attention of an indifferent world. They resemble instead what Hobbes called quarreling over glory. Every man looketh that his companion should value him, at the same rate he sets upon himself, said Hobbes, making men apt to use violence for trifles, as a word, a smile, a different opinion, and any other sign of undervalue. The social relations of young black males strikingly bring to life Hobbes' war of all against all. 9.15. Root Causes 2, Individual Factors. Racism, poverty, low self-esteem, and the circular culture of violence offer less plausible explanations of black crime than do individual crime relevant traits more prevalent among blacks. The principal such trait is intelligence. Jensen writes, across various racial and social class groups, the prevalence of delinquency is approximately the same at any given IQ level, 1980, 359. Hence Tyne and Wilson, 1985, Chapter 6, estimate that the mean IQ of the prison population is in the low 90s, with violent offenders lower. Gordon, 1975 A. 1975 b, found that in a cohort of black and white 18 year olds in Philadelphia, 51% of black youths and 17% of white youths had appeared at least once before the juvenile courts. This difference is explained almost completely by the assumption that both black and white criminals come entirely from the IQ range below 85 a section of the bell curve that includes 16% of the white population and 50% of the black. The assumed distribution is somewhat artificial, as Gordon himself observes. Taking the mean white IQ to be 101.8 with an SD of 16.4, 
and the mean black IQ to be 83.4 with an SD 12.9, Gordon's figures, a more realistic model assumes that all black criminals are recruited from the IQ range 75.7 to 91.1, with a mean of 83.4, and all white criminals from the range 72.5 to 87.7,28 nearly homologous bands containing 50% of the black population and 17% of the white. In this sense as well. Most of the difference in rates of black and white juvenile crime disappear when IQ is held constant. While 13% of the blacks and 2% of the whites had been incarcerated in the 12,600 person sample studied in Herstein and Murray, 1994, only 5% of the blacks had been incarcerated when IQ was held constant at the white mean of 100. This indicates both that IQ explains a great deal deal of the between race variation in criminality, and that other factors are involved. The correlation between crime and IQ does not by itself establish causation, but it is natural to direct the causal arrow from IQ to crime. As Gordon remarks, low IQ explains the impulsive irrational quality of many offenses, 1975b. 278. Criminals have difficulty conceptualizing remote consequences for themselves and the way their actions look to their victims, although this latter factor shades over into the non-intellectual factor of empathy. Gordon observes that the race difference in crime rates, like that in IQ, decreases but does not vanish when social status is controlled for, and suggests regression to the mean as an explanation. Mention of empathy and impulsivity leads to the role of temperament in black crime. Hence Tyne and Wilson note the higher black scores on the MMPI scales, 1985, 469, typical of the US prison population, 1985, 189. Prisoners, in studies cited, deviated from the population at large in the typical way. In those traits associated with high values on the psychopathy, schizophrenia and hypomania scales of the MMPI, namely, deficient attachment to others and to social norms, bizarre thinking and alienation, and unproductive hyperactivity, 189. The reader will recall from chapter 3 that black scores exceed white on just these scales, particularly hypomania. Black males are also more mesomorphic than whites, 1985, 89, and criminals tend to be more mesomorphic and less ectomorphic than the general population. In general, mesomorphs low in ectomorphy tend to unrestrained, impulsive self-gratification, hence Tyne and Wilson 1985, 469. The reader will also recall Hacker's plea that black children be allowed to move around in the classroom because they are more attuned to their bodies. There is no need to repeat here the evidence that race differences in IQ and temperament, variables which significantly affect criminal behavior, are significantly genetic in origin, and that, in light of the Minnesota Transracial Adoption Study, race differences in these variables seem to be significantly genetic as well. Genetic factors need mediation, and one mediating mechanism may be the race difference, mentioned in Chapter 4, in serum testosterone, known to facilitate aggression. Much current speculation has also focused on the neurotransmitter serotonin, whose presence seems inversely correlated to impulsivity and aggressiveness. Investigating possible race differences in levels of serotonin might shed a good deal of light on black crime. Because the temperamental difference is relevant to crime go farther than rates of discounting future appraisals, a purely economic analysis of race differences in crime will probably prove incomplete. Most people who obey the law do so not from fear of punishment or abstract respect for legality, but from habit. Since most laws prescribe aggression and deception in its various forms, this habit is rooted in empathy. The emotional pole of Kantianism, a tendency to see other people as centers of experience like oneself, rather than as obstacles or resources. A common demand of blacks is that they be treated with respect, usually understood to include deference and fear. Yet the high rate of violent black crime, 
a show of contempt for one's victim if anything is, indicates an unwillingness on the part of black males to treat others as they wish to be treated. The black advantage in criminality seems best attributed to lower cancianism, facilitated by lower intelligence and greater impulsivity themselves probably biological in origin. Thomas, 1990 argues that the bloodier wars waged by whites show that, far from being less criminal than blacks, whites are worse. Judgments of value aside, it is pertinent to ask how can blacks be more innately prone to violence when, collectively, Europeans and Asians have been more destructive. The answer is probably the superior technology of Eurasians made possible by their greater intelligence, and a superior capacity to organize into large armies, also an effect of greater intelligence and ability to subordinate the self. Although tribal conflict is endemic to Africa, Africans have been unable to invent weapons of mass destruction or assemble themselves into million-man forces. Greater black criminality requires only that individual blacks be on average more aggressive than individual whites. The very individual aggressiveness that yields a higher black crime rate may well obstruct the formation of effective black armies. As Africa has disintegrated politically at the end of the 20th century, civil wars are not being fought by disciplined units but by small bands with few lines of command and few goals beyond spoils. The result is not the fragmentation of large political units into smaller ones, but anarchy. Natural experiments indicate that blacks do kill with unsurpassed ferocity when western weapons are available. King Mutasa of Bugunda, on being given a rifle by a visiting explorer, immediately used it to shoot a woman, Baker 1974, 389. The accessibility of handguns in the United States has produced a homicide rate among young black males an order of magnitude greater than that among whites. In 1994, after the publication of Thomas, 1990, Rwandan Hutus, using small arms and machetes, killed a million Tutsi in a few weeks, an episode matching in ferocity the great slaughters of history. In the course of discussing race as a predictor of crime I allowed that racy and crime are causally unrelated, and distinguished predictive validity per se from explanations of validity. In retrospect, this concession was unnecessary, race, crime correlations meet the more stringent causality requirement, since race, or, strictly speaking, the observable indicators of race, share a common cause with the criminal behavior they predict. The indicators of African ancestry and mean black levels of intelligence and aggressivity appear to have been joint adaptations to an African environment, so, while indicators like skin color do not cause the behavior with which they associate, the association is not accidental. If a predictor may be used only when causally related to its criterion, race remains an admissible predictor of crime. 9.16. Free Will. The conclusion that genetic factors contribute heavily to black crime raises some old problems in a sharp new form. Nobody is to blame for his genes, so the race difference in crime rates is no more the fault of blacks than it is of whites. Yet this very concession seems to deny black criminals and blacks in general the responsibility for their behavior necessary for human dignity. 29 The issue of free will, hovering in the background, now steps to the fore. I approach this topic by first taking up the general question of free will in the present section then applying the results to black criminality in section 9.17. Many of the ideas in this section will be familiar to philosophers, and, in my experience, new to non-philosophers, but the eventual conclusions are less expected. Like many philosophers 30 I am a compatibilist. I hold that the causal determination of behavior, indeed universal determinism, is compatible with freedom of the will. To understand this doctrine, reflect that, as free is ordinarily used, a man is free when he does what he wants to. 31 A free afternoon is one which you can spend as you please. You enjoy freedom of speech when you can say what you want without fear of reprisal. You eat lunch freely when you eat because you feel like eating, rather than being force fed, ordered to eat at gunpoint, or, 
as in prison, during a prescribed lunch hour. One's own wants are not coercive, it is silly to think of your desire to visit a museum as forcing you to purchase admission. Now, to say an action is caused by a desire implies nothing whatever about the origin of the desire itself. The desire causing your museum visit might have had causes of its own, such as genes and environment, which had causes of their own, and so back to the Big Bang. Inasmuch as free actions are simply actions caused by desire, the notion of freedom is likewise non-committal about the possible causes of free action. An action can thus be both free and caused by factors outside the agent's control. It is free as long as it is caused by desires, wherever those desires came from. That is why free will is consistent with determinism. Common sense is compatibilist. A snacker freely chooses to munch pizza, even though, as everyone knows, his hunger resulted from involuntary changes in body chemistry, which resulted from usually involuntary food deprivation. You are free to eat lunch when you can eat when you want to, even though you do not control when you want to eat. Our snacker is freer than prisoners in a mess hall even though his appetite has physiological determinants. Universal determinism does nothing to erase the difference between the two sides of a prison wall. Belief in human freedom amounts to the conviction that to some extent we control our lives, and are not mere playthings of external forces. Compatibilism endorses this belief, since the everyday contrast between what is within and what is beyond one's control matches that between what happens because one wants it to happen and what happens despite one's wants. Under normal circumstances a driver controls his car because it goes where he wants it to, a car in a skid is out of control because its path is uninfluenced by his efforts. A driver would misleadingly alarm his passengers by telling them the car they are in is out of control as a way of saying that his decision to maintain a steady 60 miles per hour is an effect of his genes and experience. Indeed, uncaused events, which many people imagine is necessary for freedom, would lie as far outside anyone's control as can be imagined. 32 The last thing anyone would call free are actions based on random choices, unconnected to preferences and unforeseeable by the agent himself. 33 Free will is of compelling interest because it is needed for moral responsibility, no one can be blamed for what he could not help, and compatibilism deftly makes sense of ordinary ascriptions of responsibility. People are ordinarily blamed for and credited with actions they choose to do, not for what happens to them independently of their choices. No one is blamed for his eye color because no one chooses it. You can desire green eyes all you want and it will make no difference. The mugger on the other hand is caused to rob you by his desire to rob you, which is why he is not excused despite his larcenous desire having been caused by his genes and upbringing. His desire did not force him to rob in the way in which a muscle spasm might force him to stop swimming, or his genes forced him to have green eyes, an individual is forced to do something when he does it whether he wants to or not 34 whereas the robber did what he did precisely because he wanted to. People are not punished for what they do not choose for a closely related reason. The point of punishing an action is to reduce its frequency by inhibiting the desire to do it which is accomplished by associating the action with pain. Punishing outcomes not caused by desire is pointless, since it cannot reduce the frequency of those outcomes. Fines for people with naturally blonde hair may make blondes wish they were brunettes, but, as hair color is unresponsive to wishes, the incidence of blondness will not fall. So the acts common sense says are punishable and creditable, namely those caused by wants, are the very ones the compatibilist calls free and responsible. Compatibilism makes good sense of not punishing a man for what he did not do freely. People may do what they want, replies the metaphysical libertarian, 35 but, if their wants are determined, in the end they have to do what they do, so are not really free. In saying this, However, the libertarian follows the critic of sociobiology in confusing intermediate causes with epiphenomena. When a choice is causally inevitable given its antecedents and necessary for a subsequent action, 
the inevitability of the choice does not mean the choice's antecedents would have produced the action in the absence of the choice. Jones frequents the Museum of Art because he likes Picasso's, and he likes Picasso's because of a genetically determined taste for distortion, but under normal circumstances it is simply untrue that he would have frequented the museum anyway, even if, per impossible, that same genotype had made him dislike distortion. Had Jones not wanted to go he would not have gone. He didn't have to visit the museum, that is, he would not have ended up there even if he had not wanted to. A desire can be inevitable, in other words, yet still matter. The question could Jones have done otherwise than visit the museum, given his genes? Is to be answered yes. He could have done otherwise because he would have done otherwise had he not liked Picasso. It was causally necessary that Jones want to do what he did is consistent with Jones would have done otherwise had he had different wants, equals he could have done otherwise. 36 Bertrand Russell once quipped that we can do as we please but not please as we please, I am free to have lunch whenever I get hungry, but I do not go hungry freely.37. These victories may seem purely verbal. Perhaps we are free responsible and occasionally culpable in their ordinary senses of those words, but do freedom, responsibly and culpability in the ordinary sense justify blame and punishment? Given determinism, is it right to punish criminals for acting on preferences they did not choose to acquire, whether or not so acting is free? These qualms rest on a false contrast between people and their characters. People don't choose their characters, it is true but character does not happen to anyone, either. A person is his character, not a featureless wraith to which drives, preferences, and personality attach like barnacles.38 The murderer neither chooses his violent impulses, nor finds himself saddled with them, without those impulses, that personality, there is no him. A murderer is not and cannot be punished for having a personality he was unlucky enough to be saddled with, for the same reason it cannot be unfair to punish a murderer for a personality he did not choose. Had he had a different personality, he would not have existed. Libertarians admit the practical value of deterrence, but consider it wrong to punish what cannot be helped. They do not suggest that we change our formal and informal punitive institutions but they would like us to feel uneasy about them. Certainly it is wrong to punish what cannot be helped, what, according to the compatibilist, did not proceed from choice, but, observes the compatibilist, punishing those behaviors is not deterrent, either. Society penalizes disvalued behaviors resulting from choice to extinguish the choices that cause the behavior. Since painful associations do not weaken involuntary behavior, People should be punished only for what is, as we say, in their power. The thief can't help wanting to steal, but that is not what he is punished for, he is punished for stealing, so he and others will subsequently find stealing less attractive.39. To bring these reflections to bear on race and crime, that we are free when we do what we choose to do, although our choices are caused by unchosen genes preserves the freedom of individuals whose unchosen genetic aggressiveness leads them to chose law-breaking. The corollary that blacks in particular attain the freedom needed for dignity despite higher mean aggressiveness is reinforced by two ancillary points. The first is our old friend that social causes of behavior lie as far outside individual control as genetic causes, so environmental causation, indeed any causation short of impossible self-causation must be allowed to diminish criminal responsibility as much or as little as genetic causation does. The balance of genetic and social factors in criminal behavior is irrelevant to responsibility. Second, allowing a genetic proneness to aggression to diminish the responsibility of black criminals requires, in consistency, that a genetic proneness to xenophobia and racial animosity diminishes the responsibility of xenophobes and bigots. Cattle. 1992, and Rushton, 1989 b, 1995, argue that a tendency to xenophobia may be innate, since preference for bearers of observable correlates of genetic likeness, such as skin color similar to one's own, is adaptive and likely to have been selected in. 
yet critics of racism would almost certainly not take this conjecture, should it prove correct, to excuse bigotry. Xenophobes would be told to fight their genes, and criticized, should they succumb, for not struggling hard enough. Why should genetic factors relieve black criminals but not bigots of responsibility? 9.17. Race Differences in Free Will the previous section applied to black crime what for centuries compatibilists have been saying about everyone. A genetic explanation of race differences in crime does not threaten black dignity because, while no aggressors choose to be aggressive, all are responsible for their aggressive acts. However, a final refinement of compatibilism significantly weakens this reassuring conclusion. On reflection, freedom must be more than simply doing what one wants. Animals and infants act on their wants yet evidently lack some capacity possessed by adult humans. Compulsives doing what they want, smoking or gambling, also seem less than fully free. According to several recent writers, Frankfurt 1971, Jeffrey 1974, Sen 1974, Levin 1979, Davis 1979, Slug 1980. 40 The missing ingredient is that fully free, autonomous action proceeds from desires the agent finds acceptable. Animals and infants are heteronymous because they are incapable of assessing their own desires. A lion doesn't ask himself whether his taste for gazelle might be hard on gazelles. Compulsives can and do assess their desires, but are unable to act on the desires they desire to act on and end by acting on desires they find unacceptable. Their second-order desires are impotent. Although the compulsive smoker wishes his yearning for a cigarette would vanish, it remains strong enough to cause him to light up. 41 Non-compulsives, by contrast, can weaken their cravings. A non-addicted smoker who wishes he didn't want to smoke will munch candy until the craving passes. Contrary to Russell we can to some extent control how we are pleased, and the more we can the freer we are. 42. It follows that free will is a matter of degree, varying with the agent's capacity to step back from and reflect on his desires. The depth of this capacity depends in turn on his intelligence and self-control. A person of limited mental ability not given to worrying about the quality of his desires or the likely consequences of following them, is relatively less free. So are people who follow an impulse as soon as it enters their heads. Compared to self-restrained, thoughtful individuals, neither acts on desires he finds acceptable, because their desires are subject to comparatively little internal scrutiny. That is why children, lacking the necessary self-critical attitude, are not held fully responsible for what they do. Every post-adolescent is considered to have crossed some threshold of autonomy, but adults too vary in reflectiveness. Just as individuals differing in intelligence and self-restraint differ in degree of autonomy, groups differing in mean intelligence and self-restraint differ in mean degree of autonomy. Some group comparisons are uncontroversial, although there are mature ten-year-olds and immature adults. The average 10 year old is less responsible than the average adult. By the same token, the white advantage in intelligence and self restraint implies that, on average, whites are more autonomous and responsible for their actions than are blacks, and Asians more autonomous than whites. There is some empirical support for this conclusion. Tashikari, 1993, reports that, a, Black children and adolescents more than their white counterparts see what happens to them as the result of uncontrollable external constraints of the environment, yet, b, while this perception predicts lower self-esteem for whites, it does not affect the self-esteem of blacks. Tashikari tentatively links this finding to the smaller internal self-control of African American children, adolescents, 1993, 597. The link may be that blacks are less inclined than whites to see events in the world, including their own actions, as flowing from a self. Presumably, if blacks are less aware of themselves as causes of what happens in the world, they are less capable of scrutinizing the self and its choices.
Appalling as it may sound to say that blacks have less free will than whites, many individuals, including a number nominally sympathetic to blacks, appear to agree. Consider those commentators, mentioned earlier, who subordinate criticism of black violence to a search for root causes while never subordinating criticism of stock fraud or lynching or the Holocaust to a search for root causes. One factor in this inconsistency, no doubt, is the belief that the external causes of black crime, but not white crime, were wrongs. Since whites rather than black criminals are thought to be to blame for black crime, the issue of responsibility for black crime is deemed closed, with only the question of causes left open. But another factor, I believe, is a sense that reflection plays a relatively small role, hence external causes a larger one, in black behavior. A white stock swindler is assumed capable of realizing that what he is doing is wrong and thereupon stopping himself, whereas a black mugger is assumed much less capable of such self-monitoring. What looks like special pleading is an inclination to treat black crime as akin to an amoral natural force. Consider the following comments from a leading newspaper on two recent incidents. The first concerned the unmotivated stabbing of a white woman on a city street by a black vagrant, the killing of Alexis Fix Welsh on June 8, 1991, came to symbolize the failure of the mental health and criminal justice systems to deal with the mentally ill homeless, even when there have been repeated danger signs, Perez Payne 1992, B3. The second incident was the killing of five-month-old Jeffrey Harden by the mother's boyfriend, not the biological father, who immersed the infant in boiling water when it refused to stop crying. Even in New York City's troubled child protection system, this oversight was remarkable, none of the caseworkers who investigated allegations that Doris Harden, the mother, had mistreated her children discovered that she had previously served three years in prison for holding down a seven-year-old girl while another young woman sexually assaulted the child with a toilet plunger. The four workers missed other important details as well, ignorant of the prior abuse conviction. They initially did not speak with the mother's parole officers, who knew she was a crack user who had refused treatment. The workers interviewed Miss Harden, but never talked to her boyfriends, despite warnings that one of the men was prone to violence and drug dealing. Whether the caseworkers in the city's Child Welfare Administration could have prevented the child's death will never be known, but the flaws in handling of Jeffrey Harden's case illustrate what experts and advocates for children have long called the Achilles heel of the child protection system in New York and the nation, the frequently poor quality of casework. Duggar 1992, A1. In both instances, responsibility and blame are reserved for the institutions charged with controlling violence. For its victims black violence is a tragedy, Perez Pena and dreadful intervention of fate. This attitude, which extends to non-criminal matters, 43 but raise the belief that blacks are not fully responsible for their behavior. I venture to guess that this belief is also why conservative exhortations for blacks to take more control of their own fates seem perfunctory and pro forma, and are seldom taken seriously. Implicit reluctance to treat blacks as moral agents is not confined to the left. The Turner Diaries, a self published book popular on the far right, whose author's name, Andrew MacDonald, is apparently a pseudonym envisions a war waged by white Christians against what are represented as alien elements, particularly blacks. Yet the target of the author's special venom is not blacks themselves, but white women involved with black men and like white collaborators, long passages describe the hanging of these race traitors, as well as detonation of an atomic bomb in front of a government building in Washington, D.C. The author, without perhaps quite realizing it himself, treats blacks as akin to germs that must be eradicated, holding whites alone up for moral condemnation. 9.18. Appropriate Responses to Diminished Responsibility Black crime provokes anger in some, sympathy for black criminals in others, who sense, I conjecture, that blacks are not fully autonomous, responses that do not coexist happily in the same society. Putting emotion aside, 
How do lower levels of responsibility constrain efforts to control crime? Contrary to what many people think, diminished responsibility does not imply greater leniency, only a lower degree of what might be called punishability. Since punishment is by definition administered for wrongful acts, it is less appropriate for the less responsible, who do not act in the full sense of the word. A child does not deserve to be punished for defacing property in the way a normal adult vandal does. The subject of punishment must understand why he is made to suffer. Compatibilists of course agree, there is less point in threatening to discipline individuals whose behavior is less apt to be changed by the threat. But lesser punishability is consistent with incapacitation, and with the infliction of aversive stimuli for other reasons. A naughty child may not deserve punishment, but he must be curbed, a disease carrier like typhoid Mary, not responsible for being a vector and unable to see the threat she poses to others, must still be restrained. All that morality and logic require is that such measures not be called punishment. In fact, lower levels of self-control often warrant prompt infliction of unusually intense aversive stimuli. One often must be harder on a more difficult child to build especially firm associations between forbidden behavior and negative consequences. Less deterrable robbers and killers must be stopped, even if deterring them requires especially harsh methods. Lower levels of self-control do not of course require harsh treatment if rewards for good behavior prove more effective, and there is no point in punishing wholly undeterrable madmen who can only be restrained or destroyed. Just what methods effectively deter at what levels of self-control is an empirical question, the philosophical point is that intermediate levels of responsibility permit the application of any otherwise appropriate measure. Just don't call it punishment. Equating responsibility with deterability gives explanatory power to the hypothesis that blacks are less responsible than whites. I have remarked several times that the major environmental change coincident with the rise in black crime during the past 30 years has been the expansion of black rights and social mobility, the treatment of black and white offenders by identical rules, and an overall relaxation of the sanctions against crime. One must not omit aid to families with dependent children and other forms of welfare which have made once reckless behavior cost-free and allowed most black males to be reared without fathers, operationally, these changes have meant that a black who commits a violent crime, particularly against a white, is far less likely to suffer than previously. A black found guilty of a minor felony in the American South in 1920 would quickly find himself on a chain gang.44 The same acts today are punished less severely, less swiftly, and less surely. With so many inhibitors relaxed, more crime is to be expected from genetically impulsive individuals. I stress again that the environmental changes that triggered a change in black criminal behavior did not trigger a like change in white criminal behavior, indicating, in light of the overall convergence of black and white non-correlated environments, a genetic group difference. Higher rates of black crime may be accepted as the price of the current array of legal rights, but should that price seem too high, the following ideas might be worth thinking about. 1. One intangible disinhibitor is current public opinion, which reflects constant reiteration of the statement that black crime is an understandable, excusable response to mistreatment. Through crime, says Hacker in a book that received dozens of adulatory reviews, blacks are paying back whites, 1992, 187. Violent assaults on whites are retributions for injustices, 187, and the rape of white women is displaced rage against the real centers of power, 186 to 187, attitudes, Hacker implies, that should not be criticized, 219. After a group of black boys raped and savagely beat a jogger in Central Park, her employer, Salomon Brothers, donated several hundred thousand dollars to build a community center in the boys neighborhood, Walls 1989. Midnight basketball leagues have been introduced as an antidote to black crime, on the theory that black youths commit crime from boredom and feelings of rejection. 
blacks can hardly fail to notice that their violent behavior is being condoned and rewarded. These rewards should end, and presumably would end once people ceased attributing black crime to racism. 2. Race differences in maturation rates, evidence for which was mentioned in Chapter 4, might warrant treating blacks as adult offenders at an earlier age than whites. The justification once again is need for what statisticians call a powerful test of deterability, one that erroneously treats some offenders too harshly to avoid catastrophic failure to treat corrigible serious offenders harshly enough. Since not every offender can be examined individually for corrigibility, the state uses age as a proxy. As the regression of corrigibility on age for whites may underpredict corrigibility for blacks, the law might use age differently for the two groups. 3. The more rapid decay of reinforcement for blacks means that the same punishment will on average deter blacks less effectively than it does whites. Punishment schedules for given infractions might therefore be adjusted for race. The idea that punishment be person independent is ostensibly codified in the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment, but exceptions are recognized even now. Courts enjoy discretion in setting bail, and sentencing guidelines set ranges so that punishment can be varied from individual to individual, as a function, in part, of its probable effect. The principle that everyone who breaks a law should receive the same penalty may rest on the assumption that individual differences in conditionability are too small and uncertain to inform sentencing decisions. Were individual and group differences to prove significant and reliable, this assumption would have to be abandoned. 4. The more rapid decay of reinforcement might also suggest the swifter administration of punishment to blacks along with stricter limits on appeals. Once again, the idea that everyone is entitled to identical procedural justice may rest in part on the assumption that individual and group differences in response to delay are too small and uncertain to matter, another assumption that may prove false. Apropos, 2-5, the norm of equal treatment, on its face requiring identical treatment for identical infractions, might be interpreted to mean equally aversive treatment for identical infractions. The two interpretations coincide when the same stimuli affect everyone alike, but diverge when responses differ. It seems sheer common sense that electrocution would be inappropriate for a convicted murderer somehow impervious to electricity, so, in consistency, prison is inappropriate for offenders who do not mind imprisonment. Reportedly, Many young blacks view a jail term as a rite of passage into manhood, so the problem of equitable punishment across races is real. Use of reliable predictors of aversiveness to adjust punishment for all offenders would be race neutral, but these predictors would presumably interact with race. 5. Incapacitation. New technologies may make it possible to detect potential criminals early in life, track them and reduce their aggressive impulses, possibly by chemical means. I will not speculate further, except to note that sufficiently reliable predictors of criminality would allow such tracking to be race-blind. One dubious idea currently in the air is that, once the neurological basis of crime is discovered, the brains of criminals might be altered. An unhappy side effect of this practice would be elimination of any deterrent against a first crime. Anyone who wished to kill an enemy need only do so, then turn himself in for a brain treatment. After the treatment has pacified him he might regret deeply what he had done, but before treatment it would seem like a painless way to get away with murder. Suggestions, 2-4, particularly will be opposed on the grounds that they treat people on the basis of their race, not as individuals. Before taking up the overall issue of individualism in the next chapter, However, we must consider the possibility that everything said in sections 14 and 15 is wrong. What if black crime is caused by racism? 9.19. Beyond Causes. Common sense takes the right to avoid and defend oneself against unprovoked attack to be independent of the cause of attack. The police protection I deserve from a burglar breaking into my home does not vary with why he is breaking in. 
I do not deserve less protection if my grandfather harmed his grandfather or the burglar himself. How could the cause of someone's seeking to violate my rights compromise my right to defend those rights? Crime, like everything else in nature, has causes, some of which were injustices, the presence of a wrong in the chain of causes leading to a crime does not normally constrain police action. It doesn't matter that Smith plans to steal Jones' car because a swindle in 1950 impoverished Smith's family. It doesn't matter that the state acquitted the swindler in a fixed trial. Just conceivably there is warrant for contralegal acts to retaliate against or rectify a specific past wrong, and, just conceivably, the police should turn a blind eye. That is why defenders of black crime call it payback. But the reprisal must be immediate, and closely linked to the wrong. Jones may run Smith down in hot pursuit to retrieve a watch Smith has just stolen but he may not demand at gunpoint the return of a watch that Smith's grandfather stole from Jones' grandfather fifty years earlier. Past wrongs as far removed from the present as slavery cannot be relevant to state action. It follows that race-conscious safety-seeking is permissible whether or not black crime is due to white misdeeds. That the black male on the running track is more likely to attack the jogger because of discrimination or the jogger's suspicions of blacks does not diminish the jogger's right to escape danger. The jogger might be said to be obliged to break the vicious cycle of anger and fear, but his obligation to do so is no greater than his contribution to the cycle, weighted by the probability that self-endangering actions will actually weaken it. In everyday cases, the likelihood that this good can be achieved by continuing ahead is smaller than the risk entailed. Arguably the fleeing jogger worsens the prospects for future victims of black crime by failing to diminish black crime as much as he can right now, but even then common sense permits flight. I have every right to lock my door even if so doing increases the chances that burglars will break into someone else's house, a woman has the right to avoid a lonely stretch of road even if by frustrating a lurking rapist, she increases the risk of rape to other women. The potential victim has the right to increase the risk of harm to others because that risk is not the potential victim's fault. He is not himself a would-be burglar or rapist, he is merely defending himself against those who are. Unlike a private individual's flight or a locked door, the state's protective steps, such as heightened attention to young black males, are invasive. Police searches interfere with individual liberty. However, as we have already seen, common sense permits a certain level of preemptive coercion against possible threats. Preemption is permitted even when the threat is caused by suspicion itself, so long as the suspicion is generic. The sheer wrongness of the suspicions that alienate blacks forbids preventive action only if, absurdly, Preventive action may never be taken to avert wrongs caused by earlier wrongs. Nor does it matter whether the past wrongs that caused black crime were race based. For one thing, race conscious screening is generically dissimilar to the race conscious measures said to have caused contemporary black crime. Frisking black males is not enslavement, lynching, or restriction to separate public drinking fountains. So long as a crime is not caused by the specific measures taken to thwart it, its actual cause is irrelevant to how it should be treated. The intuition that the racial character of wrongs creates relevance is rooted in the idea that race consciousness is what started all the trouble. The countervailing intuition is, so what? Suppose the Holocaust turned many Jews to auto theft. A policeman sees a Semitic looking man with a Mojan David and a number stenciled on his arm ear in a car. Should the policeman disregard the man's ostensible background in deciding whether to enhance surveillance, because the crime perhaps being contemplated is an effect of anti Semitism? Consider the question from the point of view of the car owner who expects the police to protect his property. For that matter, consider race consciousness from the point of view of the social contractor in the street attacked by a black male. Imagine a policeman arriving just too late to intervene, who confides, I saw him approach you and I suspected he might attack. But I didn't intercede even to the minimal extent of showing myself to discourage him because my belief that he might attack was race based, 
I would not have been suspicious of a white male approaching you. I shouldn't act on thoughts I shouldn't think, and I shouldn't think that way. My thoughts were bad because your attacker's life of crime was a result of his great grandfather's enslavement, his father's inferior education, and his own limited opportunities, all the result of racial thinking. Doing anything to him because of his race is just the sort of thinking that caused him to attack you in the first place. Were you to retain your composure, you would insist that, whatever may have caused slavery and segregation, the policeman's suspicion was well founded. In signing the social contract, you created the office of policeman, when he agreed to assume that office he obligated himself to protect you. His belief that race predicts crime was untainted, innocently acquired. Why could he not act on it? I have already alluded to the two reasons, seldom explicitly stated but often clearly at work, for thinking racism and discrimination make black crime special. One is that oppression has driven blacks mad. Recall Box Hill's reference to the threat to sanity and equilibrium imposed by the impossibly unjust situation under which blacks have lived, a view which accepts the diminished responsibility for blacks but blames it on whites instead of biology. I doubt that proponents of this idea have thought through its implications. For if, for whatever reason, blacks are too unstable to be held fully responsible for their behavior, they are too unstable to be granted those privileges that depend on full rationality, including such aspects of citizenship as jury service and the vote. It would not be the fault of blacks that they are unsuited to vote or serve on juries, any more than it is the fault of twelve-year-olds that they are too immature or the fault of a soldier driven mad by combat that he must be institutionalized but deny them the franchise and jury service we do. The other exemption is bolder, white misdeeds reduce or cancel the obligation of blacks to obey the law. Bruce Wright, 1987, speaks of blacks breaking a social contract that was not of their making. Elaine Brown, a former Black Panther, writes of extorting whites, I don't know that I have to be moral with an immoral person. I don't know that I have to apply moral responses to an immoral situation, quoted in Bray 1993, 68. Hacker concludes two nations with a question clearly inviting a negative answer. A century and a quarter after slavery, white America continues to ask of its black citizens an extra patience and perseverance that whites have never required of themselves. So the question for white Americans is essentially moral. Is it right to impose on members of an entire race a lesser start in life, and then to expect from them a degree of resolution that has never been demanded from your own race? 1992, 219. Judging by the evidence, Hack arrests his question on false premises. Access to public assistance and an educational system better than any developed in black societies give blacks a better start in life than they would have gotten on their own and, with affirmative action, better than the one whites receive. But suppose blacks woes are an imposition of whites, and expecting blacks to commit no more crimes than whites asks more of blacks than whites ask of themselves. By ordinary standards the expectation remains right and reasonable, just as it would have been right and reasonable to ask any Jews still living in post-war Germany to refrain from robbing German citizens at random. The reason is simple, you cannot run a society in which one group feels less bound than the rest by rules against theft and violence. Let black crime be a cry for help, a call for attention, a demand for respect, some cries for help, some calls for attention, some demands for respect may not be uttered. Raping, stealing cars and packing guns may be ways to feel important but they are not ways that can be allowed by a society hoping to survive. Should black males be dissatisfied with the respect they can get while conforming to the laws of Caucasoid societies, as is possible, they must settle for less respect than they wish or go elsewhere. Indeed, if it asks too much of blacks that they conform to law to the extent whites do, may it not be asking too much of whites that they show restraint when provoked by black crime? War according to Hobbes, consisteth not in battle only. But a tract of time wherein the will to contend by battle is sufficiently known. 
without perhaps meaning to, those who accord blacks greater freedom than whites from the restraint of law are in effect endorsing race war. That blacks have no right to break the law is not to say that blacks can conform themselves to law to the extent whites do. While it may, perhaps, prove possible to reduce by some extent the current racial disparity in law abidingness, it seems highly likely that any multiracial society will find blacks less law abiding than whites. Correlatively, any measures to curb crime will, of statistical necessity, abrade blacks more harshly than whites. These biological constraints on crime reduction will just have to be lived with, like the weather. Notes 1. U.S. Bureau of the Census, Telephone Interview, June 14, 1993. 2. U.S. Bureau of the Census, Telephone Interview, August 6, 1995. 3. These variables did not mask race. For example, the typical black robber had no more prior convictions than the typical white robber. 4. Whitney, 1990A, estimates a mean difference in criminal liability of 1 SD, based on the surprisingly high figure of 0.14 he cites for the probability that a white urban male will be arrested for an FBI indexed crime in his lifetime. 5. Between 1979 and 1986, 44.3 out of 1,000 blacks, as opposed to 34.5 out of 1,000 whites, were victims of violent crime, Whitaker 1990, Table 1. 6. National Crime Survey, Department of Justice, Telephone Interview, June 28, 1990. 7. National Crime Survey, Department of Justice, Telephone Interview, June 28, 1990. 8. Numbers for rape of black and white women are given in Table 1 of Whitaker, 1990, but not disaggregated into single and multiple offender victimizations. Table 16 of Whitaker, 1990, disaggregates inter and intraracial rape rates. Table 9.1 results from applying the single offender rates from Table 16 to the numbers from Table 1. Whitaker's figure of 40% for the proportion of all rapists black is below the 50 plus percent cited by some authorities but close to hackers, 1992 43%. The Whitaker study was based on a survey of households, other figures are based on other methods of reporting. 9. Highly publicized incidents include the murder of a rabbinical student by blacks after a black child was killed in a hit and run accident in Crown Heights. Brooklyn. The murder of a white guard and six white inmates by black inmates in an Ohio prison, Colin Ferguson killing six whites on a commuter train, a black teenager shooting a white school teacher to death to steal his bicycle in Brooklyn's Prospect Park, O. J. Simpson's probable killing of his white wife and her white friend, Darnell Hilton cold-bloodedly killing three whites during a robbery. Other incidents buried in the back pages include, three black teenagers killing a white New York City school principal while shooting at each other, Lubashk 1992, a gang of blacks mugging old white women in 12 separate incidents, the leader of the gang reporting, that's the way we planned it. It was a pact we made, only white people, McConnell 1994. A 17-year-old black in Chicago raping a female gas company meter reader, then killing her to prevent her talking, a deranged black vagrant stabbing a white woman to death for no reason, Perez Payne in 1992, a black arsonist setting a fire that killed six white firemen, two blacks killing a white male and raping his sister, App, February 23, 1994, three black teenagers, 114. Arrested for the murder of a white grocery store owner, C. Wolf 1994, a black male prostitute stabbing a white attorney to death, Freefeld 1994, a black dental student hijacking a car, killing the driver, and wounding his companion, Hanley 1994, a black burglar raping a white woman in Queens, Raymond 1994, a teenager named Jamal Jefferson arrested for wounding Detective Joseph Vigiano, Triester 1994, 
I take Jimmel to be a black name and Vigiano Italian, a black arrested in the 13-year-old murder of a white doctor, McFadden 1994, a Jewish landlord slain while collecting rent in Williamsburg, a black section of Brooklyn, Perez Pena 1994, B2 a black executed for stabbing a pregnant white woman to death because the best way to get back at whites was to attack white women, App 1995, a black sentenced to life imprisonment for the murder of a German tourist in Miami, Reuters 1995. 10. Rodney King was drunk and speeding, Michael Griffith initiated the dispute with the whites who chased him by spitting at them, Yusef Hawkins was mistaken for a black thought to be dating a white girl. 11. Thus, where VA slash high is the value of A given the hypothesis high, the expected value E, A, of A is if A slash high P, high. AI is to be preferred to act just when E A I greater than E A. 12. G. Harmon, 1986. 22 to 26 stresses the unavailability of epistemic resources for the assignment of precise probabilities. Goldman, 1986, 90, 324 to 343, cites widespread de facto violations of the probability axioms, and discusses neurological models for transforming information into binary yes, no decisions. 13. In the definition in N. 11, let VA slash W be conceived as the moral value of A in W, and high as the hypothesis that the world is in state W. 14. Armour's discussion is marred by a tendency to knock down straw men, such as the involuntary negrophobe traumatized into irrationality by prior encounters with blacks. Still, his essay is a useful statement of views quite contrary to those expressed here. 15. Those who oppose drug laws may use another example. 16. This is another inverse inference. Let E be some evidence, and G the hypothesis that Blue is guilty. PG slash E equals, PE slash G times PG, PE slash G times PG, plus, PE slash tilde G times PG, so PG slash E varies inversely with PE slash G. 17. Single cases do significantly affect frequencies in small samples. 18. Presumably, the literature on statistics in the law restricts itself with this assumption to raise the question of statistical guilt in pure form. 19. On the uniqueness of security, C. Levin, 1982b, also Pennock, 1984c, Levin, 1984, Morris, 1988, Schmidtz, 1989, Levin, 1989A, and Kafka, 1986. 20. The state existentially generalizes on the disjunction of individual preemption rights. 21. For Hobbes, covenants are not contracts prior to the formation of the state, so an agreement to be a state enforcer cannot itself create a duty. Hobbes might insist that his third rule of reason and law of nature nonetheless tells policemen to keep their word, for the willingness of all to keep covenants is necessary for the creation of the state. 22. The court held in it around v. Payne, 1995, that federal affirmative action plans must be strictly scrutinized, without ruling that those plans failed the test, or commenting on the consistency of this holding with Metro. 23. While this book was in press, a number of Supreme Court decisions have modified government insistence on affirmative action. Racial districting is under a cloud. A California referendum has banned state affirmative action. By the time the reader sees these words, other changes in public policy may require modification of some of the comments about racial preferences in this and the previous chapter. The fundamental issues remain unaltered, however. 24. C. Wertheimer, 1971, on the effect visibly developing fetuses might have on the abortion debate. 25. Although biases in the criminal justice system exaggerate the differences in rates of violent crime by race, it may, 
tragically, still be true that blacks commit a disproportionate number of crimes. Given that the blight of institutional racism continues to disproportionately limit the life chances of African Americans, and that desperate circumstances increase the likelihood that individuals caught in this web may turn to desperate undertakings, such a disparity, if it exists, should sadden but not surprise us. Further, for purposes of this analysis, I shall assume, perhaps counterfactually, that the rate of robberies is significantly higher for blacks than for non-blacks. I shall also assume for the sake of argument that greater fear of blacks results entirely from their analysis of crime statistics, Armour 1994, 792 to 793. 26. They conjecture that violent aggression is triggered by challenges that produce uncertainty about the subject's self-appraisal which are apt to be frequent when the appraisal is unrealistically high. 12. This does not mean that the violent response really expresses a weak ego, they point out, since it begins with a sincere belief in one's superiority. 27. That the self-esteem of blacks in integrated schools still exceeds that of whites may indicate that blacks do not value academic success as much as whites do, see section 7.6, hair. 1985, 39. 28. Exactly half of a population lies within 6 Z on either side of its mean, 83.4, 12.9 times 0.6 equals 7.74, equals 75.7, and similarly for plus dot 6 Z. The mode of the assumed IQ range for whites is also the black mean but is 1.12z relative to the white distribution. One must move. 26z to the right and 98z to the left to catch 17% of the white population. 29. On the relation of freedom and blame with Enos to dignity, see Strassen, 1974. 30. Classic statements of compatibilism are Hume's essay of liberty and necessity. Chapter 23 of Mills An Examination of Sir William Hamilton's Philosophy, and Hobart, 1934. Aristotle's definition of the voluntary as that whose cause lies within the agent may anticipate compatibilism, although agency theorists, cn. 33 below, also claim him. 31. Here I ignore, a, differences between wanting, preferring, electing and other synonyms for choice, b, whether being caused by a want is necessary, sufficient, or necessary and sufficient for an act to be free, see Levin 1979, 252-255, and, c, constraints on how a want may cause a free act, a problem raised by benevolent telepathic Martians who bring about whatever I conceive a desire for. 32. A driver can at least try to escape a skid by manipulating distal causes like the angle of the tires, a man can at least try to influence his own caused desires by a program of conditioning, see below. But by hypothesis nothing can influence a causeless choice. 33. Libertarians, such as Thomas Reed, and in modern times Chisholm, 1964, reply that actions are not caused by the onset of wants or the occurrence of decisions at all, but by a self. These thinkers allow that natural events are caused by other events, and allow that a natural event uncaused by another event would be random, but, they insist, actions are caused by substances, selves, or persons. Standard usage seems to support this theory, the breaking of a window is caused by its being hit by a brick, an event, but I, a substance, order lunch. This support is quite weak, however. We commonly shorten the impact of the brick broke the window to the brick broke it, so I ordered lunch may abbreviate the onset of hunger caused my ordering. Everyday talk about agents thus need not be taken to imply agent causation. Anyway, the agent causation theory must say why, in any specific case, an agent acts as he does. What caused me, I question mark to order lunch. If nothing did, we are back to randomness. If something such as the onset of hunger did, that something had a cause, 
which had a cause, and we are back to determinism. 34. Spinoza describes a falling leaf that tells itself now I'll go this way, now that, and he asks why we, whose behavior is also necessitated, are not similarly deluded. The answer is that the leaf is wrong to think that it would take a different course if it wanted to, whheras the corresponding counterfactual beliefs humans hold about themselves are typically correct. A man who believes he is driving at 60 miles per hour because he wants to is usually right to think he would change speed if he so decides. 35. For example, Walker, 1991, 455, and Chisholm, 1964. Ethical libertarians, who condemn coercion, need not be metaphysical libertarians. One can believe it is wrong to thwart causally determined wants. 36. TV weathermen say the hurricane might have hit the coast without implying that the hurricane's path was undetermined. What they mean is that the hurricane would have hit the coast had conditions been somewhat different. 37. Chisholm, 1964, says, of a murderer who would not have fired the fatal shot had he chosen not to, if he could not have chosen not to shoot, then he could not have done anything other than just what it was that he did do. Not so. That the murderer could not have chosen other than he did does not mean that he could not have done other than he did, he could have done other than he did if he would have done otherwise had he chosen to. To be sure, Chisholm would reject the analysis of could have under which the murderer could have acted but not chosen otherwise. 38. Or, see section 5.2, n. 3. A person is the neurological basis of his drives and preferences. 39. Deterrence theory admits proportionality. The severity of punishment should match the seriousness of the crime, it says, because, a, deterring more serious offenses is more urgent and, b, maximal sanctions against less than the worst crimes leave perpetrators of these crimes no reason to refrain from worse ones. Capitalizing armed robbery would encourage armed robbers to kill policemen trying to apprehend them. Deterrence theory can also explain the intuition that punishment is owed, as if entailed by an agreement to which the wrongdoer is party. Hegel, following Kant, saw the evil visited on a wrongdoer as a consequence of the universalization of his own choice, tacitly willed in making that choice. Having implicitly agreed that it is all right to take life, the murderer can't complain when his life is taken. The murderer, as we say, asked for it. Deterrence is not meant to be retributive, but deterrent punishments tend to give wrongdoers what they agreed to accept. 40. Locke's discussion of power in the inquiry anticipates the contemporary analysis. 41. On this analysis a smoker who doesn't mind smoking, who never regrets trading life expectancy for the pleasures of tobacco, counts as free, a conclusion concordant with common sense. 42. Ainsley, 1992, views freedom as the ability to keep rapidly rising discount curves from overwhelming more slowly rising curves with higher maxima, see Appendix A. Ainsley's theory is a version of the present one when the desires one finds acceptable are identified with higher maximum curves. 43. Milton Kotelchuk, 1994, found that, in a large national sample, Black mothers were twice as likely as white mothers to smoke, drink, and take drugs during pregnancy. He also found a slight difference, 36% versus 29%, in the proportion of black and white mothers told not to smoke. When Dr. Kotlchuk was asked in an interview to explain the heedlessness of black mothers, he said, is it because of implicit racism? That's probably too strong. But it is possible that people treat their clients differently on the basis of their social class, AP 1994C, I-16. Despite the ubiquity of warnings against smoking, drinking and drug taking during pregnancy, Dr. Kotelchuk does not consider holding black mothers themselves responsible. 44. Alabama reinstituted the chain gang in 1995 eliminating it again in 1996. 10. 
individualism and discrimination. Objecting to racial screening on the grounds that it ignores people's individuality is one of many routes to the topic of individualism, which the reader has probably wished to raise for some time. Let us call the rule that everyone should be judged and treated as an individual, not as a member of a group, the principle of individualism. This principle does not deny statistical race differences, but it bans appeal to them in practical contexts, especially legal contexts, and emphatically bans the application of statistical differences to individuals. It commands you to base your treatment of a person on his traits not traits he has or is likely to have in virtue of a group to which he belongs. The principle of individualism seems to forbid all race-based distinctions, and seems just as surely to be part of contemporary Western morality. Parents are expected to treat their children differently, teachers to respond to each pupil's particular strengths and weaknesses, and employers to judge an employee by his record. Yet, despite appearances, the principle disintegrates as soon as one tries to grasp it, or, to vary the metaphor, it shrivels in the light of analysis. What little of it remains is consistent with race consciousness. 10.1. Individualism and Racial Preferences However confused the principle of individualism may prove to be, it is clear at the outset that supporters of affirmative action must reject it. Preference benefits blacks on the basis of their race, without regard to the specifically demonstrated claim of any black beneficiary or the specifically demonstrated liability of any white male. On any of the rationales reviewed in Chapter 8, preference must categorize by race. Consider first the need to remedy injuries suffered by blacks, whether this is thought to require whites to restore a competitive advantage they themselves took or to forego an advantage innocently acquired but still illicit. This rationale for choosing a particular black over a particular white for a position assumes that the black has been injured, but does not base this premise on specific knowledge about him. The premise rests, rather, on the generalization about his race, namely that, since discrimination has harmed a large but unspecified portion of blacks, this black is likely enough to have been harmed to merit an advantage now. Such an inference about an individual from group statistics is identical in form to the estimates of danger which prompt whites to be wary of blacks. Nickel, 1975, who regards the correlation between race and injury as high enough to justify the administrative convenience of presuming all blacks to have been wronged, must and did agree that an equally high correlation between being black and untrustworthiness would justify discrimination against blacks. Classification by race continues to play a role in the remedy rationale even when all blacks are assumed to have been injured to the benefit of all whites, for this posit is a generalization about groups from which the right to preference of each particular black is deduced. Absent a direct showing of injury by the white he is being preferred to, a black gains his advantage from membership in a group all of whose members are thought to deserve one. In fact, the compensation argument would retain a probabilistic element even if all blacks were known to have been injured by the whites they are preferred to, so long as the magnitude of each injury were uncertain. Once grant that no one knows whether the very blacks preferred a head of brain Weber would have been senior to him in a racially fair world, preferring them is compensatorily just only if they would probably have been his senior in that fair world. Since preferences so justified do not rest on a direct showing that any particular black would have been better qualified than any particular white, they must rely on an inference from the races to which each belongs that that black probably suffered an injury that accounts for the shortfall in his qualifications. One, The compensatory argument for role models obviously inherits this reliance. Role models intended to promote some other value also require grouping by race although this may be a bit harder to see. Making it clear requires that we recur to the distinction in chapter 8 between the value allegedly promoted by role models being diversity itself, versus it being some independent end to which diversity is a means. On one hand, role models intended simply to increase the number of blacks in some sphere make race one, in most cases the unique, qualification for entry into that sphere. 
so the promotion of diversity patently classifies by race. On the other hand, enlarging the black contingent to promote some further end requires that blacks possess traits relevant to that end either exclusively or disproportionately. At first glance appeal to exclusively black traits does not involve probability, so I will put off considering this alternative for a moment. Appeal to traits disproportionately displayed by blacks clearly does involve probability, for the justification of racial preference now becomes that blacks are likelier to have some contributory trait. For instance, anyone who argues that blacks should be preferred for judgeships because black judges are more likely to respect the rights of the accused must believe that blacks on average are more sensitive to the underdog, a belief that classifies by race. The argument that preference for blacks helps the needy is statistical in the same way. To say that relieving need is a good, achieved more often if blacks receive the lion's share of help, is to treat neediness as a disproportionately black trait. Preferring a particular black without a specific showing that he is disadvantaged rests on a presumed correlation between race and need. When in Metro Broadcasting v. FCC The Supreme Court cited the need criterion as one reason to allow preferences for blacks competing to buy broadcast licenses, the court did not demand a showing of disadvantage by particular black purchasers, nor did the FCC policy upheld by the court extend preference to disadvantaged white purchasers. The thinking here is race statistical. Appeal to traits displayed only by blacks also involves probabilities albeit indirectly, a link most salient in the argument that racial quotas weaken stereotypes. Hiring blacks alone can have this effect, it is said, because only conspicuous blacks can change minds about the abilities of blacks in general. One assumes there should also be preferential hiring of incompetent whites, whose inadequacies will also change minds about relative white competence. This argument plainly classifies individuals by their suitability for undermining stereotypes, an odd sounding category but a category nonetheless, and one taken to contain none but blacks. The general point is one made repeatedly below, all judgments whatever classify in some way. This abstract formulation aside, the race consciousness in using quotas to attack stereotypes is clear at the concrete level more blacks are to be hired to raise everyone's estimate of blacks as a whole, and each white's expectations about the next black he meets. In addition, as the precise effect of preferring a particular black cannot be known in advance, hiring him is to be justified by its likely effect, resting the goal of destroying stereotypes on race-based probabilities in a second way. That affirmative action distributes benefits and burdens by race, contrary to the principle of individualism, is not a deep insight. But it is enough to keep preference advocates from deploying the principle against racial screening, race-based frisking, or other race-conscious proposals. If categorizing by race is always wrong, categorizing by race because of past discrimination is wrong. If categorizing by race is permitted when race correlates with victimization, Categorizing by race is sometimes permitted, the principle of individualism has been abandoned, and other race conscious policies too must be judged on their individual merits. Indeed, preference compromises the vague principle of Brown that separate is inherently unequal, for if, say, racially differentiated standards on a civil service exam can be considered equal because they cancel the effects of past discrimination, Segregated schools with the same facilities might be equal because they let black and white children each learn up to their capacities. At the same time, one can consistently defend racial screening yet oppose preferences, since classifying by race for some purposes does not compel classifying by race for all. By ordinary standards violence is so much worse than uncompensated discrimination, assuming quotas do compensate that the expected benefits of screening far exceed those of preference, so much so, it may be held, that screening lies above, and preference below, the threshold of permissibility. The expected morality of screening is the value of all the assaults prevented, multiplied by the probability that screening will prevent them, less the injustice of detaining innocent blacks.
blacks, multiplied by the probability that innocent blacks will be detained. To likewise, the expected morality of preference is the value of compensating each act of discrimination, weighted by the probability that preference will compensate it, less the injustice of passing over innocent whites, weighted by the probability that those whites will be passed over. Preventing assault, as I have urged is ordinarily thought more urgent than compensating discrimination, the average person would rather be denied a job because of his race than be assaulted. Furthermore, submitting to a search seems less onerous than being denied a job. Finally, it is known that a large minority of black males are felons, but not known that a comparable minority of whites have benefited from discrimination, indeed, given the conclusions of chapter 8, virtually none have. Hence, the expected morality of screening exceeds that of affirmative action. Moreover, any measure that reduced black crime would reduce crime against the innocent blacks the measure might incidentally penalize, while quotas of I know offsetting benefit for innocent whites. Whites cannot console themselves that their sacrifice serves justice, as Rosenfeld 1991, 310 appears to recommend, since, if they are innocent, their sacrifice is an injustice. Of course, a screening advocate can also embrace affirmative action. In defiance of chapter 8 he can insist that discriminatory injuries done to blacks are extensive and serious enough to raise the expected morality of preference as high as is necessary. The principle of individualism can be subordinated to both security and restitution. But the logical point remains, even on assumptions favorable to affirmative action, one cannot consistently support affirmative action while opposing other race-based measures on the basis of individualism. Nor can one consistently support race-conscious screening while opposing affirmative action on the basis of individualism. But a supporter of screening can oppose affirmative action for other reasons. The complaint against the compensatory argument in Chapter 8 after all, was not that it classifies by race, but that it classifies by race wrongly, incorrectly presuming that most or all blacks have been injured. Screening advocates can allow that, given this presumption, the typical white probably does enjoy an unfair advantage over the typical black against whom he is competing, and, given a probability high enough for an injury severe enough, race is a reasonable proxy for compensability. The objection is that the presumption is false. Race-based compensation is uncalled for because the white competitive advantage is not a result of white sins. Classifying by race per se is not an issue. 10.2. Treating people as individuals, outline of an analysis. The argument of section 10.1 was to quote, that the principle of individualism is unavailable to preference advocates despite their readiness to deploy it in other contexts, does not refute the principle itself. Still, the ease with which self-proclaimed champions of individualism abandon the principle does suggest there is less to it than meets the eye. In this instance, the instincts of individualists are sounder than their pronouncements, people are and must be judged by the categories they belong to, the traits they share with others. Judging someone consists in anticipating what he is like and what he will do, or assessing him on the basis of his past deeds. Anticipation is always based on correlations between traits a person is known to have and traits he may then reasonably be presumed to have. Retrospective assessment is general insofar as we judge a man by the sorts of things he has done. Jones who cheats at cards is contemptible because cheaters are contemptible. Judging people is no more a conscious process than is slowing down in heavy traffic. At the conscious level we size up situations, Matson 1976, but sizing up, of traffic jams or people, is the upshot of associations formed within one's own experience and learned from others. A driver's awareness of what often happens to speeders makes him slow down just as a person's past contact with and general knowledge of clergymen causes attitudinal adjustments when he meets one in a social setting. These adjustments are largely involuntary, whether our guard goes up or down, whether we feel excited or bored, 
depends on the resemblance of the present situation to others we have known. Three individual traits are simply those with proven predictive validity, traits on which it is reasonable, whether or not moral, to rely. You expect the clergyman you have just met to frown on smutty jokes, and you are right to expect this no matter how he may go on to conduct himself. Predictive traits are not always acquired voluntarily, so we will have to disentangle the traits deserving to influence judgment from its voluntariness, but to a first approximation treating someone as an individual means treating him on the basis of his predictive general traits. Since race is predictive, classifying by race is consistent with individualism. 10.3. Unsatisfactory Definitions of Individualism there are other interpretations of individualism that capture some at least of what people have, rather confusedly, in mind, but these alternatives render the principle of individualism absurd, impossible to heed, or reduce it to predictiveness. Perhaps the first explication that comes to mind of treating people as individuals is, assessing each person and assigning him benefits and burdens on the basis of traits he alone has. This explication makes nonsense of the principle of individualism, since few of the traits that make people unique constitute reasonable grounds for judgment. One's full name and fingerprints are unique, but no one is or should be hired or befriended because of his name or fingerprints. These traits do not, as we say, make someone the person he is. Unique traits can be unimportant. Perhaps, then, treating someone as an individual means, b, attending to his important unique traits, the traits that make him who he is. The trouble with, b, is that at first glance, and in the end as well, important traits may not be unique. The treatment a person does and should receive depends, for instance, on his intelligence, sense of humor, kindness, and attractiveness, none of which are anyone's exclusive property. Using the terminology of Chapter 7, our actual criteria of personal value are qualities people share. At the same time, the precise degree to which someone exhibits important qualities may be unique, and should be responded to as such. So perhaps individualism means, or should mean, c, attending to teach person's unique constellation of important traits. The relatively superficial problem facing, c is that in some contexts a person's constellation of important traits is not unique. Everyone may differ from everyone else in some significant way if you look carefully enough, but there may be no time to look. A college admissions officer finds that the two top candidates for a scholarship have identical high school grades and SAT scores. He may break the tie by using further criteria, such as extracurricular activities, but there is no reason to think that the eventual winner's grades, SATs and clubs distinguish him from all students everywhere. But even supposing each individual's unique mix of important traits can always be identified, what remains to be explained, without which, C, and in retrospect, B, get nowhere, is what makes a trait important in the first place, what distinguishes it from unimportant ones. No doubt a person should be judged by the traits that make him who he is, but the original question was how some traits but not others make people who they are. By being important just renames the problem, leaving us where we began. All right, it may be replied, individualism cannot be defined via individuating or important traits. The principle of individualism is really meant to capture the completely different idea that, d, people should be judged only by traits they choose. That is why race, an involuntary, immutable trait, is an improper basis for judgment. Voluntariness looms large in public discourse. The chief argument for the 1991 Americans with Disabilities Act, outlawing public or private practices which disparately affect the disabled, was that disabilities are unchosen. For the voluntariness criterion is often couched in the language of individuality, its advocates explain, because a person reveals himself, indeed creates himself, by his choices. It is for this reason that judging someone by an adventitious, immutable trait like race ignores his individuality. Yet, 
while choice is undoubtedly linked to the self, the link was insisted on in the treatment of free will in chapter 9, everyday judgments are frequently based on unchosen traits, by ordinary standards a perfectly acceptable practice. It is reasonable and, at this writing still, permissible for an employer to discharge an employee with a quick temper, even though no one chooses to be quick tempered. Reflex speed is unchosen, yet a baseball manager is justified in rejecting rookie prospects who react slowly. Nor do we think this policy more justified if reflexes are determined by choice of diet during a critical growth period, the manager's decision is also probabilistic, he can't be sure that a boy who boots a grounder in practice will be equally inept in game play, but this has been his experience, and common sense allows him to base his decision on it. Involuntary traits also play a large and blameless role in the spontaneous sizings up that determine personal relations. It is all right to avoid irascible people. Mates are chosen on the basis of appearance, intelligence, and personality, traits immutably determined by genes and environment, beyond the reach of the will. The law, too, classifies by unchosen traits as when it requires nearsighted drivers wear glasses and denies licenses to the congenitally and accidentally blind five because of the, merely, statistical connection between highway safety and performance on eye tests. The ability to read a wall chart is a highly sensitive but nonetheless imperfect indicator of the capacity to drive safely. Tests which a handful of capable drivers might fail are justified because a test passed by every capable driver might also qualify a few incompetents, with calamitous results. Conversely, many voluntary traits are irrelevant to personal or institutional judgment. A college graduate's laboriously assembled collection of beer cans of the world will not influence the admissions committee of a law school, and will affect his appeal to women only slightly and negatively. Voluntariness is neither sufficient nor necessary for relevance. It is in any case disingenuous to call race an extrinsic characteristic. People take their race very seriously. Blacks particularly, when asked to conform to white norms, are quick to mention their blackness as part of who we are, see section 6.8, efforts to make race inessential just when so doing works in the interests of blacks smacks of special pleading. One source of the perceived link between voluntariness and relevance has been the role of this link in civil rights advocacy. The original argument for banning race-based judgment was that everyone deserves to be free of discrimination whatever his empirical characteristics. But judgments based on race were also said to be irrational, because race carries no information about psychological or moral capacities. Any race differences and consequently any information conveyed by race, were due to the very discrimination that civil rights laws would end. But when race differences persisted after the Civil Rights Act, the cart began to drift ahead of the horse. Attention to race, or certain types of attention, were still to be banned, but a new reason was needed for banning them, a new attribute of race that made it irrelevant. Since race is patently involuntary, as a sex and disability comma six further traits to be brought behind the civil rights aegis, involuntariness was the attribute chosen. A more excusable error linking relevance to voluntariness is the notion that all goods, including jobs and housing, are rewards, and all evils punishments. Since only what is voluntary may be rewarded or punished, it appears to follow that the allocation of any good, including employment, housing, even self-esteem, should be based solely on traits that are directly or indirectly chosen. Hence race is a forbidden basis for allocation. In reality, relatively few goods are bestowed as rewards. This is clearest for emotional goods like affection. A man does not propose to the woman he thinks he ought to, or the woman he thinks has done the most to earn his love, but the one he happens to want to marry. In the job market, the traits relevant to hiring decisions are determined by goals or tasks, and there is no reason to expect every trait that contributes to a goal to be under voluntary control. A manager is forced to classify prospective shortstops by reflex speed because, given where they are positioned, shortstops must be able to react quickly. 
choice of the quickest prospect is not a reward for neural wiring, the goal of fielding a good team thrusts it on management, who in their turn wish to field a winning team not to reward skill, but to attract customers. Nor do baseball fans regard their attendance as a reward for winning baseball, they simply prefer teams that win to those that lose. Nor, finally, do fans decide to like winning baseball, nowhere in this chain of justification do the criteria for hiring a shortstop include mutable, chosen traits. To be sure, other things being equal, managers also prefer players who try all out and stay sober on the road, which are matters of will. Not all job criteria are involuntary. But many are. Confusion between goods and rewards is abetted by a tendency to view competition solely from the competitor's perspective. Aspiring rookies see a place in the lineup as merited by outstanding performance, from their perspective, blind as it is to the task relativity of hiring, retention feels like a reward and rejection like punishment. Since rewards and punishments are bestowed only on what people are responsible for, allocating jobs on the basis of involuntary traits appears, from this point of view, unfair and irrational. The best corrective is viewing the situation from the perspective of the team's owners, whose hiring decisions are dictated by the amoral, goal-directed criterion of winning baseball games. 10.4. WHY Some Traits including race, matter. Once uniqueness and voluntariness are dismissed as reasons for deeming traits important, little besides predictiveness remains. The traits our thought experiments have found unsuitable for judging people, fingerprints, scope of beard can collection, lack predictive power, while suitable traits, temperament, reflexes, possess it. So we may tentatively accept our initial conjecture that treating someone as an individual consists in judging him by those of his traits which are known to predict, and, so far as is feasible, looking for more such traits.7 Obviously, not all traits can be important simply because they predict other traits, which predict other traits, some qualities must be desired in themselves, particularly those involved in personal relations, while other predictive chains terminate at aptness for extrinsically specified tasks. But recognizing this does not force a retreat to uniqueness or voluntariness, for, as we saw, qualities valued in themselves are typically generic and unchosen.8. Proponents and opponents of race-based classification alike would agree in contrasting a student's high school grades with his race, as, respectively, individualistic and group criteria for college admission. But surely the use of grades is a paradigm of judging a student on his own merits because grades are a good predictor of academic success. Both before and after affirmative action was introduced, college admissions officers have favored white students with high grades because such applicants tend to do well. Students, like hopeful rookies, may see admission based on grades as deserved, but admissions officers do not. It strengthens rather than weakens this hypothesis that grades reflect effort and choice as well as unbidden native intelligence, for admissions policies do not partition applicants' grades into a voluntary effort and an involuntary intelligence component. Wholly voluntary activities like club membership are considered, but again because they are taken to predict contribution to the college community. The sovereignty of predictiveness is tacitly admitted by the defense of quotas in admissions that merely mediocre grades from blacks indicate promise because of the hardships black students face. This argument in effect contends that low grades for black students predict what high grades for whites do. The contention is erroneous, since grades predict college performance as well for blacks as whites, indeed, as admissions officers are doubtless aware over predict black performance. We have reached the central syllogism connecting race to individuality. Attention to any of a person's predictively valid traits, whether specific or generic, voluntary or involuntary, treats him as an individual, an individual's race is a valid, useful predictor of his intelligence, temperament and social behavior, therefore, the principle of individualism permits attention to race. 10.5 proxies. It might be objected, see Armour 1994, 
792, that race predicts only as a proxy for the factors that actually produce behavior. Whenever race predicts a further trait such as intelligence or impulsiveness through being a co-effect, along with it, of some underlying causes, the objection continues, it is these causes that should be attended to, not race. Race per se is never a cause, so attention to it is always irrational. It must be admitted that, ideally, we would ignore race in favor of true causes. The trouble is, we have relatively little information about what they are. At present the underlying mechanisms of behavior are either unknown or identifiable only by cumbersome, inexact techniques that cannot guide the quick, often informal judgments needed in everyday life. Intelligence and impulsiveness cannot be immediately discerned, and their neurological basis not at all, so observable surrogates must be used. More deeply, discovery of the deeper causes of behavior would probably not decrease race consciousness, and might well increase it. Evolution has made us efficient consumers of information, alert to observable predictors even when more recondite clues are available. Recall the speculation about genetic factors in race consciousness itself. Since aiding genetically related organisms enhances one's own fitness, alertness to observable predictors of genetic similarity, such as skin color, may have been selected for, indeed, discovering the causes of behavior can only strengthen the association of race with the criteria it now predicts, since race does correlate with these criteria, it must correlate with their causes. A superficial example that makes this point involves the ostensibly race-neutral variable of deportment. It has been urged, Thomas 1992, 38, that bopping, the bad black walk described by many writers, Thomas 1992, 38, Cockman 1981, 110, Wolf 1987, p. Harrison 1972, 73, rather than race itself be used as a sign of aggressive intent. But the very fact that young black males are unusually aggressive means either that this walk is more common among blacks than whites, or more predictive of aggression for blacks, or both. The same is true for the oppositional, defiant mode of self-presentation that adolescent black males adopt more readily than white. Anti-stereotypers who set themselves to take race-neutral swaggering as a danger signal will inevitably notice that black males swagger more or that a black swagger has more meaning, and fall back into stereotyping. A thought experiment may help the reader decide whether he himself favors using race as a basis for judgment. Suppose, never mind why, your young son is about to begin school in a neighborhood with many blacks, who regularly gang up on children. He will be in some danger starting tomorrow, and you want to advise him about whom to avoid. Telling him to watch out for kids who look like trouble is uselessly vague. Telling him to stay alert puts the onus on him, suggesting as it does that victimization would be his fault. The advice that one should avoid kids who sprinkle their conversation with motherfucker is impractical and your son will sooner or later associate the phrase with blacks anyway. But suppose beware of black kids would be an easy rule to follow. The warning becomes muddled once you start differentiating between kinds of blacks, cautioning that not all black boys are bad, or explaining that this generalization is an exception to the generalization that one should never generalize about people, but leaving it at watch out for blacks maximizes you son's chances of escaping unpleasantness. What do you tell him? 10.6 Caricaturing the use of race. Some critics of racial generalizations admit, overtly or tacitly, that race is a legitimate basis of judgment insofar as it predicts. I refer again to James Nichol, who disputes the right of racists to prefer whites on the empirical ground that blacks are equally trustworthy, yet consistently accepts the principle that one important way of distinguishing justifiable from unjustifiable uses of racial classifications is in terms of the soundness of the alleged correlation between race and a relevant characteristic, 1975. Flynn, 1980, is also clear on the essentially empirical character of racism. More typically, however, critics of race consciousness attack straw men, 
thereby allowing themselves to avoid the hard questions. Recall Dawkins' failure to provide any motive for discriminating against blacks less opaque than racism in political theory, and his confidence that except in very rare cases a white student prefers the company of other whites because he has racist social and political convictions, or because he has contempt for blacks. Rosenfeld, 1991, comes up with only two reasons for a racist wanting to discriminate an otherwise unexplained belief that the white race is superior, and that it is therefore of paramount importance to preserve racial purity, 149, and religious lunacy, the claim of a religious fanatic who believes it to be his divine mission to establish a racially segregated society to preserve racial purity, to force others to convert to his religion and to give up the right to make moral decisions for themselves, 254. Rosenfeld does not consider even the slightly less demented fanatic who prefers a segregated society but has no desire to create one by force. Naturally, Rosenfeld has no trouble showing that racist views, so construed, must simply be left out. Another caricature you touched on in Chapter 5 is that of describing any negative attitude toward blacks as race hatred, a word used of phenomena as disparate as lynch mobs and apprehension about falling property values when blacks enter a neighborhood. Even when not entirely off the mark, hatred may obscure the attitudes it is applied to. Many whites do seethe when required by law to live near blacks or send their children to schools with blacks but this animus may be directed as much against the government coercing them as their new neighbors. Hatred almost by definition is excessive and impervious to reason, dismissing all negative responses to blacks as hatred begs, or ducks. The question of whether some of those responses might be legitimate and defensible. An equally common caricature of race consciousness attributes to whites the disparagement of blacks because of their race with race often equated with literal skin color and skin color itself the imputed criterion of personal worth. One writer speaks of the United States as a society that accepts a person's being black, as, right and proper grounds for denying that person full membership in the community, Thompson 1977. Another defines a racist as one who derives happiness simply from a living in a racially segregated society for no other reason than that there are two races, Rosenfeld 1991, 112. The most extreme version of this caricature is a widely cited essay by the legal philosopher Richard Wasserstrom, 1985 a. For Wasserstrom, to be non-white, especially to be black, is to be treated and seen to be a member of a group that is different from and inferior to adult white males. This pronouncement can be fully understood only in tandem with Wasserstrom's own ideal, assimilationism. A non-racist society would be one in which the race of an individual would be the functional equivalent of the eye color of individuals in our society today and for reasons we could fairly readily state we could explain why it would be wrong to permit anything but the mildest, most trivial aesthetic preference to turn on eye color. The reasons would concern the irrelevance of eye color for any political or social institution, practice or arrangement. According to the assimilationist ideal, a non-racist society would be one in which an individual's race was of no more significance in any of these areas than is eye color today. To be sure, it is quite as absurd to treat people differently just because they differ in skin color as to treat people differently just because they differ in eye color. But hardly anyone thinks skin color in and of itself is more important than eye color. What some people think is that skin color carries information about other traits important by common consent. That paradigm racist, the southern white, did not wish to deny blacks the vote or access to white drinking fountains because of the reflectance of their skin, but because he believed their judgment unstable and their personal hygiene deficient. Segregationists did not want to exclude blacks from white schools because they are black, but because the presence of blacks was believed to weaken academic standards. These beliefs may have been false, dogmatically held and insufficient to justify the practices erected upon them, but they amounted to more than the belief that dark skin is inherently bad. Eye color differs from race, 
whose principal but not sole observable indicator is skin color, in lacking coral eights. Anyone who endorses race consciousness believes that indicators of African descent do predict traits important to everyone, including, one may suppose, Wasserstrom. If blue eyes predicted high intelligence and low criminality, Wasserstrom would care very much about eye color. Eye color is an inapt analog for race on its own grounds, since it is indiscernible from more than a few feet, while race is salient from a distance. For purely perceptual reasons, eye color is bound to figure less prominently in human affairs. At one point Wasserstrom backhandedly concedes the dependence of the assimilationist ideal on predictiveness, there do not appear to be any characteristics that are part of this natural, physiological, concept of race and that are in any plausible way even relevant to the appropriate distribution of any political, institutional, or interpersonal concerns in the good society, 23. As he realizes, this immediately invites the question, what if there were? And he admits in a footnote, certain people believe that race is linked with characteristics that are prima facie relevant. His reply is another caricature, even if it were true that such a linkage existed, he says, none of the characteristics suggested would require that political or social institutions, or interpersonal relations, would have to be structured in a certain way. True, a linkage may not mandate any arrangements, but it might nonetheless make certain arrangements inevitable or permissible, or explain why people opt for them. That, essentially, was the point of chapters 8 and 9, linkages between race, intelligence, and temperament, while not mandating racial stratification, show how stratification can come about without wrongdoing and in this sense justify it, the linkage between race and crime justifies heightened suspicion of blacks. However reluctantly, Wasserstrom recognizes that the propriety of race consciousness turns on the hinge of empirical correlation. A final and more subtle caricature, playing directly on the principle of individualism, is conflation of racial awareness with awareness of nothing but race. There may well be people who see others exclusively as whites or blacks, and treating every black alike regardless of age, sex, deportment or other available cues certainly denies individuality, just as it denies individuality to treat every white alike, or every woman, or every 17 year old. Sensible people know that there are revealing characteristics beside race. However, the irrationality of attending to race to the exclusion of all else does not make it irrational to take race into account. It is absurd, but rhetorically convenient, to conflate a bank officer who uses an applicant's race as one factor among many in deciding whether to grant a loan with one who refuses all black loans no matter what. At the same time, there are circumstances in which attending to race alone, or virtually alone, is appropriate. The jogger by himself, the woman in the elevator, a taxi driver scouting for fares, a policeman debating whether trouble threatens, have only moments to decide what to do when strangers present themselves, and the only data they have to go on is age, sex, and race. Race is decisive in these cases because it is a good enough predictor to be used by itself when snap decisions are called for. Do not think I am defending race consciousness by turning it into something else, crime consciousness or safety consciousness. Race consciousness is not only broader than the belief that race matters in and of itself, it need not include this belief at all. To observe that race matters because of its correlates is to explain why people notice it not to deny that they do. The lonely jogger notices race out of fear of being hassled, not out of a lunatic concern with purity, but it is still race he notices. Nobody would care about race if blacks and whites were alike in every way except skin color. But they aren't, and that is why race is noticed. 10.7. Two kinds of discrimination. Once it is agreed that race can be overriding when time leaves it the only usable predictor, it must be agreed that the use of race is reasonable when other factors, such as numbers, leave race the only predictor. Lloyd Humphreys raises this issue in connection with school and housing integration. 
reactions to the relative proportions of blacks and whites in integrated schools reflect more than racism. Achievement levels in a previously all-white school will decrease after a large influx of unselected black students, even if there were no effect on white achievement. Achievement on standardized tests is a principal criterion for judging the effectiveness of schools by parents and many others. Furthermore, unless great care is exercised and some differential treatment by race is exercised and some differential treatment by race is accepted, the standards for curriculum and achievement will drop. Teachers automatically adjust what they do in the classroom including the assignment of grades, to the students in their classes. The same large influx of black students, again on an actuarial basis, will result in an increase in interpersonal violence in the school, students against students and students against teachers. A large-scale housing integration poses a dilemma for which there is no easy answer. Or resistance is not racist. Placement of subsidized public housing in a largely white neighborhood does increase the probability that white residents will become victims. Evaluating each person in terms of individual worth as a neighbor is not possible when large numbers of blacks move into a neighborhood. The actuarial information available to the average citizen poses a dilemma. Or resistance is not racist. 1991, 346 to 350. Is resistance permissible? It is an actuarial fact that allowing 15-year-olds to drive would increase the number of traffic accidents. 15-year-olds cannot be tested for maturity singly, and law must be uniform, either all otherwise qualified 15-year-olds may drive, or none. Since not all 15-year-olds can be allowed to drive, the decision is obvious. The state permissibly classifies by a single, involuntary, predictor, age to prevent a statistically certain disaster, so individuals would seem entitled to use the statistical, involuntary predictor of race as a basis for classifying desirable neighbors, for instance by agreeing not to sell or rent to blacks, to avert what they consider disaster. We thus reach the issue of private discrimination. The predictive validity of race justifies awareness of race, whether alone or as one factor among others. What sorts of race conscious action is justified? There are now no laws, and I suspect that few people would want laws against leaving an elevator when a black enters. 9 But the Fair Housing Act of 1968 forbids exclusionary agreements, and most of my other examples of the rational use of racial information are also illegal at present. Taxi drivers must accept black fares. Employers cannot base hiring decisions on race except to prefer blacks over whites. Banks cannot consider race in extending credit, although consent decrees in discrimination cases involving banks and insurers have required banks and insurers to subsidize loans and insurance policies for blacks, see Zelnick 1996, 329-360. Yet I believe ordinary standards permit such actions. Declining to live or deal with members of any race is an exercise of freedom of association permitted by the Golden Rule. It is easy to imagine a world in which everyone associates and deals with just those individuals he wishes to deal with and who wish to deal with him. The reader probably does not want undesired associations forced on him, so as a Kantian he should have second thoughts about forcing associations on others. Actually, the Golden Rule plays a double role in the argument. It is the principle that permits whites to decline to deal with blacks, and the factor, the race difference in Kantianism, that explains the wish to decline. Let us take up these issues in order. Racial discrimination carries a bad aroma, in part, because of failure to distinguish its two different forms. There is aggressive, positive discrimination, or persecution, and non-aggressive, non-invasive, negative discrimination. Aggressive discriminators seek to harm individuals because of their race. Beating a man because he is black and mugging a woman because she is white discriminate aggressively. By ordinary standards such actions are wrong, some so wrong that others may prevent them by force. There are no enforceable rights against more trivial forms of aggressive discrimination, 
maliciously breaking appointments with blacks to inconvenience them, for instance, however, it is not necessary to reach their discriminatory character to criticize or criminalize them, that they are acts of aggression suffices. It is wrong to assault or break promises to blacks because assault and deceit are wrong. It might be thought that racial motives make an assault worse because they imply a willingness to repeat, but the badness of a series of acts derives from the badness of the acts in the series, leaving us again with individual race-based assaults, in themselves no worse than any other assault. Negative discrimination, on the other hand, is the race-based refusal to bestow benefits, refusing to hire a black, sell him a house, or cooperate with him in any other way because of his race discriminates negatively. The difference is that positive discriminators generally initiate interaction and leave their victim worse off than he was, they harm him, whereas negative discriminators are virtually always responding to an invitation to deal, and, more important, leave their victim no worse off than he was before interaction. You cannot refuse to hire a black or anyone else unless he volunteers to be your employee, and a black refused a job because of his race is no worse off than he was before he presented himself. Ten he lacked a job initially, and he lacks a job at the end. The whole notion of victims of negative discrimination is confused. It is not as if anyone minding his own business can be zapped out of the blue by it, you cannot be rebuffed because of your race unless you first ask a landlord firm, or bank for an apartment, job, or loan, and you can hardly claim to have been victimized if your subsequent position is unchanged. Negative discrimination is consistent with the golden rule, which lets people do what they want so long as they're doing it prevents no one else from doing likewise. Universalizable liberties such as free association can be exercised capriciously, but negative racial discrimination need not be capricious. In Chapter 7 the race difference in temperament was epitomized as a difference in Kantianism, among whites the central criterion of personal worth. In non-racial contexts, likelihood of low Kantianism is an excellent reason for refusal to deal, as when a landlord declines to rent to someone he believes will damage his property. Also, in non-racial contexts, inferences about Kantianism drawn from statistics are also reasonable. A landlord who knows only that a would-be lessor belongs to a motorcycle gang may refuse to rent, or ask a higher rent, because of what he knows of the character of typical motorcycle gang members. Inconsistency, permitting negative discrimination against some group's membership in which predicts locantianism permits negative discrimination against any such group. The passage of civil rights legislation might seem to show that contemporary common sense subordinates negative liberty to other values, such as racial amity or the dignity of blacks, but this appearance may be misleading. The few decades civil rights legislation has been in effect is too short a time to confirm a major shift in values. Its passage and current acceptance may rest on empirical errors the reader need only ask himself whether racial amity has improved, and conceptual confusions. I have already mentioned the most significant confusion, that between harm and failure to help. No matter what A does, he does not harm B unless B is worse off than he would have been had A not so acted. 11 A's refusal to hire unemployed B, for whatever reason, including B's color, leaves B exactly as he was, jobless before encountering A. B has lost nothing previously his. One reason for this confusion, I suspect, is the din of incessant talk of race hatred. But another reason this distinction is ill grasped where race is concerned may be the failure of blacks to produce on their own the sorts of goods common in white society. This inability of blacks to acquire Caucasoid goods without Caucasoid cooperation makes white refusal to deal with blacks appear to be a barrier and a barrier is indeed harmful, since those on the wrong side must expend more effort than previously to cross it, and are thus worse off. This perception is not unfounded, blacks would indeed have no television sets, automobiles, computers, or other products of western technology without the compliance of whites. But refusal to offset an inability is not a barrier. 
A's unwillingness to sell to B something B cannot produce on his own does not take anything from B or leave B less productive than he was. Africans centuries ago unaware of Europe were not harmed by the sheer existence of unavailable European goods. Nor would Africans have been harmed had they known all about and wanted to trade for those goods, but were unable to inform Europe of their desire. Those Africans would not have lost anything simply because Europe had more. But it follows that Europeans would not have harmed Africans had they learned of but spurned an offer to trade, for, once again, Africans would have ended up no worse off than they were before lines of communication opened. It also follows, from the fact that European refusal to deal with Africans would not have harmed them, that Africans would not have been harmed had the Europeans who refused to deal lived on the same continent, or shared the same territory, as do blacks and whites in the United States. The proximity of someone with goods you do not have may sharpen your desire for them but his refusal to slake your desire does not make you worse off. 12. I have also mentioned various empirical beliefs that have sustained civil rights laws, for instance that these laws would enhance racial harmony, and that, absent discrimination, blacks will come to act like whites. But the most important belief in civil rights theory has undoubtedly been that a wish to avoid blacks must stem from irrational motives. Americans value individual liberty for itself, but they grow suspicious of liberty they think is being misused. 13 Once it is accepted that the only possible motives for negative discrimination are vicious or insane, as are the motives customarily ascribed to racists the freedom to avoid blacks is seen as a questionable indulgence. When the Civil Rights Act was before Congress, it was faulted mainly for legislating morality, a silly criticism. Morality is legislated all the time, murder is illegal because the right not to be killed is considered enforceable, which also conceded the immorality of negative discrimination. It is hard to work up much enthusiasm for a right to do what is wrong. But the persistent poor performance and disruptiveness of black schoolchildren, the higher black crime rate, the preference of black offenders for white victims, the black self-presentational style and the overall lower cansionism of blacks are all comprehensible reasons to discriminate negatively. Some motives prompting white avoidance of blacks, negative discrimination, are by ordinary standards entirely reasonable, and have nothing to do with hatred or an urge to harm blacks. A final conjecture, when association was purely voluntary. Blacks could secure compliance of whites needed for access to white wealth only by behaving in ways whites found acceptable. 14 Requiring whites to associate with blacks does away with the discipline mutual freedom enforces. That blacks no longer have to worry about pleasing whites is, perhaps, one of the significant environmental changes which, working together with genes, has affected black behavior over the past half century. Although I do not see this as a major argument against civil rights legislation, it may have been another unintended consequence of abolishing freedom of association. An honest appraisal of black attitudes might find surprisingly little divergence. There is little doubt that blacks prize the amenities of advanced technological societies of the sort whites create, but it is less clear that blacks have any particular desire to associate with whites as an end in itself. Blacks and whites seat apart in every high school and college cafeteria in the country, and there is no evidence that black students want to socialize with whites any more than white students want to socialize with blacks. This voluntary self-segregation suggests that blacks wish to avoid whites for reasons having nothing to do with hatred. Inclusive fitness and kin altruism theory predicts that most people prefer associating with those who bear observable indicators, like skin color, of genetic similarity. It is received wisdom, endlessly repeated, that whites have no reason to wish to avoid blacks, and indeed that thinking that they might is evil. To give the thought a fair hearing, the reader should first ask himself whether the evidence concerning race and intelligence, academic performance, obedience to law, and personal deportment establish that differences exist. He should then ask himself whether they constitute a rational basis for negative discrimination, and if he thinks they do not to explain why.
the reader prepared to grant the rationality of negative discrimination should now ask himself how third parties can rightly intervene against it. 10.8. Race Differences and Public Assistance A quite different example of the relevance of statistical race differences concerns public assistance. Despite extensive discussion by sociologists and economists of the effects of welfare incentives on blacks and the population as a whole, little thought has been given to race differences in response to these incentives. Henstein and Murray observe that major race differences in welfare dependency and illegitimacy remain after IQ is controlled for, 1994, 331, 333, but say no more thereafter. The argument for public assistance is familiar. Some people do not survive in the free market, illness strikes, accidents happen, breadwinners die, charity is unavailable. As letting the helpless perish seems inhuman, the more prosperous are enforceably obliged to provide a safety net until another job is found. The children grow up, or health returns. 15 The conflict between public assistance and the negative liberty of taxpayers to keep their earnings may mark a confusion between negative liberty and the positive liberty of welfare recipients to get things they want or a fundamental shift in values. Relief begun modestly during the New Deal as temporary aid for widows and abandoned wives with children, expanded dramatically in the 1960s to cover illegitimate children. Since that time there have been many debates and legislative shifts as to whether public support should be dispersed by the central government or localities, but public support itself has remained a fixture of American life. Yet from the beginning it has presented what economists call moral hazard. There is no reason to work when others will support you, or when the difference between relief and earned income is not worth the effort needed to procure it. 16 There is no reason to refrain from sex when others will pay for its possible consequences. The moral hazard problem did not become troublesome until the 1960s, most people continued to work and virtually all children were born and raised within marriage. In 1950 the white illegitimacy rate was 1.7% and the black rate 16%, Hacker 1992, Jaynes and Williams 1989. Since the extension of welfare benefits in the mid-1960s to mothers of illegitimate children, and the overall expansion of public support, the safety net has worked otherwise among blacks. At this writing more than two-thirds of black children are illegitimate. The majority of black female-headed households are on welfare, and altogether 21% of black women, as opposed to 4% of white 17 were receiving aid to families with dependent children when it was, nominally, abolished in 1996. No longer temporary, welfare has become a multi-generational way of life among the black underclass, the major source of income in Harlem, Detroit. Camden, East St. Louis and other black areas. 18. The important biosocial point is that, although welfare has been equally available to blacks and whites, these two populations have responded to it differently. In theory, white women could bear illegitimate children at the black rate and raise them on welfare until society went bankrupt, yet this has not happened. Despite the rise in white illegitimacy over the last half century, most white children are still born to married parents, most white women still insist that the fathers of their children work to support them, most white men regard unemployment as shameful, and most whites of both sexes despise men who live off women. Differential rates of teenage pregnancy and sexually transmitted diseases indicate that promiscuity is more prevalent among black adolescent females than white. Whether whites think of their aversion to welfare as pride or the desire to live a better life than welfare provides, from a behavioral point of view blacks find welfare more attractive, welfare incentives affect the races differently. Current black illegitimacy rates may be unnatural, since they reflect subsidies not found in African ancestral environments, but, since this environmental factor has been the same for blacks and whites. The race difference in response to the introduction of this factor indicates genetic variation. The hypothesis that blacks are more ready to devote effort to reproduction than child care, see chapter 4, 
predicts a more rapid decline in bear bonding among blacks than whites when others offer to support their children. Here, apparently, is more genotype, environment interaction, black and white mating and work behaviors are more similar in environments requiring self-support than under welfare. Welfare is too new for its long-term effects on any group to be gauged precisely. Perhaps all welfare states eventually collapse as too much of their population exploits the public treasury. But for now, by ordinary prudential standards, a safety net for whites appears feasible. Sufficiently many whites continue to work and socialize their children in families for welfare to maintain itself. The case appears otherwise for blacks who are more inclined than whites to regard public assistance as a legitimate means of support, and may be disposed to exploit welfare to a destabilizing extent. One implication is that welfare would be unstable in an all-black population, and another may be that welfare for blacks, at 12% of the population, will eventually bankrupt an otherwise prosperous white society. It thus may be imprudent to offer blacks the same safety net that whites make available to each other. Like racial screening, racial distinctions in welfare may be said to violate norms of equal treatment, the subject of the next section. Denial of welfare is also said to punish innocent babies, and, since it punishes blacks disproportionately, is sometimes called genocide. These charges simply abuse language. A woman who remains childless because others will not support her has not been prevented from having a child, nor has her non-existent, child been killed. The black population would probably grow more slowly were welfare eliminated, but demographic changes that are by-products of individual choice rather than coercion 19 are acceptable by ordinary standards. Ceasing to force taxpayers to support illegitimate children does not coerce the mothers no longer supported. A heedless couple who produce a child they cannot support, or the mother cannot support when the father absconds are the ones responsible for the child, and the ones who harm it by not providing for its support. Strangers not responsible for its existence do it no harm by refusing to help it. If through his own short-sightedness Smith is starving and Jones will not to feed him, Jones has not caused Smith's hunger, and only by fantastic hyperbole can Robinson's refusal to force Jones to feed Smith be called aggression on Robinson's part. A last issue inviting differential treatment is jury nullification. There is evidence that black jurors are much more inclined than white to acquit clearly guilty black defendants, vice and since Mr. 1996, rates of felony conviction in areas with heavily black juror pools, and much black crime, are significantly below the national average. In several well-publicized trials, majority black juries have acquitted with, to judge by their haste no attention to the evidence. Obviously, a willingness by blacks to ignore the rules of evidence out of racial partiality would undermine the jury system, necessary to preserve order within a framework of rights acceptable to whites. Thought might therefore be given to limiting black admission to juries. Welfare illustrates a general if incidental point. Conservative critics of government who point to the failure of the welfare system, or the decline of the public education as proof that these institutions cannot work may be moving too hastily. The failure of public schools, falling test scores, illiterate graduates, attacks on teachers, chaotic classrooms, physical decline, has only become a matter of great concern since the start of integration, and has occurred as expenditures have risen. As just noted, welfare became problematic only after becoming widely available to blacks. Perhaps certain institutions, like public education, are viable in a white population, but not in a black or mixed one, and conservatives have mistaken the unworkability of these institutions in mixed race populations for inherent flaws. 10.9. Individualism, Equity, Equal Protection, and the Golden Rule. Judgment based on group membership is said to violate the notion of equal treatment embedded in the 14th Amendment of the U.S. Constitution, indeed the very idea of equality embodied by the Golden Rule I have made so much of. 
the 14th Amendment requirement of equal protection under the laws has drawn so much commentary that almost everything said about it will be considered controversial, but one point seems clear, it cannot require that the law treat everyone alike. Any law discriminates, if only between those who obey it and those who flout it. Laws against jaywalking burden jaywalkers. Laws setting conditions for military service single out those who meet these conditions. A legal system that treats everyone alike would be vacuous. The minimal procedural reading of equal protection takes it to require only that the laws, whatever they are, apply to everyone in the same way. It is up to Congress, the states, and the municipalities whether and how to punish jaywalking, but under equal protection all jaywalkers must be punished alike. Where crossing mid-block carries a $50 fine, all jaywalkers, black and white, tall and short, must pay $50. So understood, the 14th Amendment puts no limits on classification by race. It allows black jaywalkers to be $50 and white jaywalkers $100. So long as all black jaywalkers pay $50 and all white jaywalkers pay $100. It permits school segregation, so long as no member of one race is admitted to a school reserved for another. So understood, equal protection is irrelevant to public race discrimination. This purely procedural interpretation, while logically the most defensible, is a historical, and violates the precept that legislatures do nothing in vain. The post-Civil War Congress could not have proposed an amendment placing no constraints on itself or the states with regard to race. The usual more expansive reading, see section 9.8, takes equal protection to forbid arbitrary legal classifications, defined as those unrelated to any proper government function. While this reading endows the equal protection clause with some content, its bearing on race is still limited. A ban on arbitrary classifications does not by itself determine which similarities are arbitrary, so cannot by itself exclude racial classifications. Race is engaged via the empirical assumption that no racial classification 20 can serve a legitimate government purpose, an assumption, as we have seen, very much open to doubt. Race is an immutable trait at best statistically related to government functions, but the 14th Amendment is taken to permit other classifications based on immutable traits related only statistically to a proper governmental functions. Recall that the state classifies by visual ability, denying the blind permission to drive, although eye problems are usually congenital and not linked infallibly to highway safety. The difference between the blind and the normally sighted is relevant, although unchosen, immutable, and imperfectly related to state function so discriminating between them is equitable. It is natural to reply that equity is observed in the driving case because a blind man differs relevantly from the normally sighted in virtue of his eyesight, whereas a black need not differ from a white in respect to any of his traits. A black differs from all whites only because of the group he belongs to, and it is merely blacks as a group that differ from whites as a group. Yet the distinction between a person's own traits and those he inherits from group membership is untenable. A person's race is as much one of his properties as his eyesight. The difference between each black and all whites may be and on the evidence is relevant to such government activities as control of violence. True, each black's race per se is irrelevant to any governmental function, but each black, but not each white, has the property of belonging to a class 30% or more of whose members criminally aggress at some time. 21 belonging to a class 30% or more of whose members aggress is a convoluted description, but the property it denotes is straightforward, and possessed by every black, just as belongs to a group 99% of whose members cannot drive safely is a property of everyone whose eyesight is 20 times 200. A less convoluted description of the same sort is, being 30% likely to be a felon. A legally blind man, whether or not he personally can drive safely, belongs, in virtue of his eyesight, to a class 99% of whose members cannot drive safely, hence has the personal property of almost certainly being unable to drive. Statistical Properties 
properties an individual possesses in virtue of the statistical character of the classes he belongs to, are perfectly real. Should they be relevant to legitimate government objectives, legal classifications on their basis are non-arbitrary. Under the conventional assumption that most whites have profited from harm to blacks, or whites and no blacks possess the property of probably having profited from harm to blacks. With the additional assumption that redressing discriminatory harm is a legitimate government function, differential treatment of all whites and blacks is consistent with equal treatment. This is, in fact, the very reasoning behind state mandated affirmative action. Statistical properties feel unreal because reality in itself is definite. A concrete individual is or is not going to commit a crime, to say that he might just express as our ignorance. Omniscient beings have no need of probability. But probabilistic judgments are forced on nescient humans who must navigate in a world about which their knowledge is fragmentary. A textbook way of putting the relativity of statistical statements to human knowledge is that they depend on choice of reference class. Suppose we know that Jones owns a bicycle and a television, that 78% of bicycle owners jog, and that 12% of television owners jog. Our estimate of the probability that Jones jogs varies with whether we think of him as a bicyclist, likely, or a TV viewer, unlikely, it makes no sense to ask how likely it is, absolutely speaking, that he jogs. Vexing as this indeterminacy is, sense can be made of absolute probability judgments, at least at any given time. Simply take the narrowest, most fully described class to which Jones is known to belong in our case bicycling television owners, and ask the proportion of joggers in that class.22 relative to a time. The right reference class for an individual with respect to some property, such as being a felon, is constructed from everything we know about him at that time that is relevant to the property in question. To ascribe a 30% chance of being a felon to an otherwise unspecified black male is to say that 30% of the narrowest class to which he is known to belong at the time of the ascription consists of felons. When the properties that are subject to statistical attribution are also relevant to some government function, discriminations based on varying statistical attributions support legal classifications, and are consistent with equal treatment. I have dwelt on situations in which common sense, defying individualism, allows the use of statistical group properties. A certain degree of race consciousness in everyday life, I have argued, is as permissible as make consciousness when buying a car. But people are not cars, I will be reminded, and asked, perhaps angrily, how I would like to be judged by statistical lights. Would I like to be judged on the basis of generalizations about Jews? Armour, 1994, constructs from the emotions behind such a question a novel reading of the 14th Amendment, one of its long-standing purposes, he says, has been the elimination of racial stigmatization, 814. Therefore, any state action which so much as countenances a racially stigmatizing practice will infringe on protections guaranteed by the Equal Protection Clause, 815. The courts must therefore eject a statistically justified fear of blacks as relevant even to a claim of self-defense, lest it reinforce derogatory cultural stereotypes. Positive state action premised on crime statistics would presumably be beyond the pale. The moral analog of this position, one imagines, is that any race consciousness that translates into the avoidance of blacks, what armor, following Covell, calls aversive racism improperly stigmatizes. Armour's psychosocial interpretation of the 14th Amendment is neither historically nor hermeneutically tenable. As for the moral outlook it expresses, and the hypothetical question about generalizations about Jews, the only reply is to turn the question back on the reader. How would he like it? To find out, I propose a final thought experiment. Imagine yourself born with an indelible strawberry birthmark, it being known that bearers of this birthmark tend to be less intelligent than those without it, and that 30% of its bearers commit at least one violent crime. These generalizations are not consequences of social attitudes toward the birthmark, 
Would you be outraged if the police and shopkeepers examined you with unusual care? Would you be offended by women, particularly women lacking the birthmark, clutching their pocketbooks when you passed? Would you consider it unreasonable for people to be dubious of your ability to do college-level work? If you would take such behaviors and attitudes amiss, why? What mistake are people making? Notes 1. Recall Rosenfeld's explicitness here, it seems reasonable to presume that the measure of the reduction in the prospects of success of blacks is roughly equivalent to the difference between the ratio of blacks with desirable employment to the total number of blacks in the workforce and that of whites with such desirable jobs to the total number of whites in the workforce, 1991, 290. 2. By rearranging terms in N. 11 of chapter 9. If P A I represents the assaults prevented by A in with and H A I the harm of detaining innocent blacks in with we have V A slash W equals P A I H A I so if A slash W P W equals I P A I H A I P W equals I equals I P W P A I dash I P W H A I 3. And possibly their fit with innate perceptual schemata, as in encounters between the sexes. 4. As drinking and drug use are voluntary, this rationale does not cover the Americans with Disabilities Act ban on firing alcoholics and drug addicts in rehabilitation programs. 5. This example is C. D. Ankney's, in correspondence. 6. But C. N. 4. 7. Thus does Dawkin ridicule the catchphrase of individualism, it is said that Bach has a right to be judged as an individual. What can that mean? Any admissions procedure must rely on generalizations about groups that are justified only statistically. Suppose the decision, to reject Bach, had been based on the following administrative theory, it is. Unlikely that any white doctor can do as much to counteract racial imbalance in the medical professions as a well-qualified and trained black doctor. That presumption is, as a matter of fact, more plausible than their presumption, that, applicants whose grade point average fall below the cut-off line, will fail. If the latter presumption does not deny the alleged right of individuals to be judged as individuals in an admissions procedure, then neither can the former. 1977 a 143 to 144 8 so importance is recursive traits valued in themselves are important traits that predict important traits are important and no other traits are important 9 it is not entirely clear that such behavior is legal civil rights legislation has been interpreted to ban harassment in the workplace and conceivably a black avoided by a female colleague in such an encounter would have standing to sue his employer. Whether such a suit would be successful cannot be predicted. 10. Displaying a no blacks or Irish need apply sign may cause blacks and Irish uninvited distress, but so do many exercises of free speech. A right implies a right to announce one's intent to exercise it. So a right to refuse an association implies a right to announce one's intent to refuse it. 11. B must stay above this baseline at all points during the transaction. A cannot drag B below the baseline, make immediate reparations, and claim not to have harmed him. 12. Arguably, a harms B by intentionally showing B something B will want but can get only from A but American whites do not create attractive goods for the purpose of tantalizing blacks. 13. Crystal, 1978, discusses this ambivalence. 14. Suggested by a conversation with Hans Hopp. 15. The claim is also made that we are all in this together, or, in Rawls' words, that society is a cooperative venture for mutual advantage. 1971, 4. Since the currently unfortunate have indirectly helped the currently more prosperous, the argument continues, the latter should help the former. Unfortunately, this is more metaphor than argument, and a flawed metaphor at that.
since not every taxpayer has literally been helped by every vagrant. 16. The incentives problem is intractable. Continuing benefits after recipients get jobs violates the point of welfare, helping those who can't help themselves, and produces the infuriating anomaly of those on welfare working less but earning more than those who never were. Workfare yields a return on tax dollars, but the jobs are often make work. Training to prepare current recipients for work also makes the taxpayer subsidize someone else's education, and workfare with childcare for unmarried mothers makes the taxpayer subsidize someone else's children as well. 17. A figure that includes Hispanics. 18. Natural experiments purportedly showing that welfare does not remove disincentives to illegitimacy suffer from range restriction, correlations between illegitimacy and the value of welfare will be indiscernible when the annualized reduction in welfare is small. A well-designed test would end stipends, medical care, housing, food stamps, and all other benefits. Absent this ideal experiment one must rely on common sense which says that people are more industrious and prudent when their survival depends on their own actions rather than guarantees by the state. 19. Less coercion, since the taxpayer will no longer have to pay. 20. I remind the reader that, since 1965, this has meant no racial classification burdening blacks. 21. Strictly speaking, belongs to a natural projectable class fitting this description. Each white belongs to many contrived classes most of whose members are criminals, such as the class consisting of himself, Charles Manson, and Jeffrey Dahmer, but which do not correspond to genuine properties. Why being myself or Charles Manson or Jeffrey Dahmer is not projectable is an open philosophical problem, but that does not make the distinction baseless. 22. Some descriptions may be redundant. Where O is an individual, F the criterion, and F1, Fn. The known properties of O at time T, F is redundant when P for slash F1 A and. And F and. And F na equals P for slash F1 A and dot and F plus 1 A and F plus 1 A and. F na and. Where I ranges over indices of irredundant properties. The probability of phi T is P. Slash and I fear. Afterward, a hypothetical address by the President of the United States of America to a joint session of Congress and the American people. My fellow Americans, I wish to speak to you tonight more frankly than is usual about the topic of race. You may wonder what remains to be said on this subject. Everyone knows there is a race problem, which has been discussed constantly for the past half century. However, these discussions, hobbled by taboos, have been misguided. The first step in tackling any problem is to define it precisely, and most versions of the race problem rest on assumptions completely at variance with reality. The problem is not racism. Common sense tells us that systematic adverse treatment of blacks ended decades ago. And, despite endless repetition, it has never been shown that negative attitudes toward blacks have the devastating effects they are supposed to. Nor is the problem racial inequality. Inequalities in and of themselves are not bad. Most people see nothing wrong with one athlete being better than another and gaining greater rewards from his skill, on with some groups outperforming other groups. Russians are stronger than Japanese and make superior weightlifters. Everyone accepts these facts of nature, and anyway nothing can be done about them, certainly not with our present knowledge. It has been denied again and again that racial inequalities are natural. But a review of the evidence, which has become increasingly accessible, has convinced me that they are. On average, blacks are less intelligent than whites and more impulsive, for largely biological reasons. This at bottom is why blacks don't do as well as whites in most of the endeavors our society rewards. I realize you may be shocked to hear me say this, but I assure you it is so. The cause of racial inequality is not malice or defective institutions. This is nonsense we must stop telling each other.
My advisors have urged me to enter disclaimers about race differences as soon as I mention them, to point out that they do not justify judging individuals solely by their race, that these differences are merely statistical, that some blacks are more intelligent than most whites. Such qualifications are correct, but what is the hurry to roll them out? Dwelling on them defensively suggests that the facts about race need to be softened, that mentioning them is something to apologize for, when more candor, not less, is needed. Most people realize that average group differences permit overlap. Nobody finds it necessary to say there are all Japanese. Why, then, does what goes without saying elsewhere have to be underlined about race? Rushing to say what race differences are not, I fear, is a way of avoiding what they are. The race problem, then, is the friction produced when two populations differing in intelligence, emotional intensity, and concern for the future occupy the same geographical territory. What can be done about this friction? What would count as doing something? I will put some possibilities before you in a few moments. But let me emphasize one absolutely vital, indispensable condition for making any progress at all, we must accept the facts as they are. Convincing you of this is the most important thing I can do tonight. Let me cite the words of the physicist Enrico Fermi, whatever nature has in store for mankind, however unpleasant, men must accept, for ignorance is never better than knowledge. I am convinced that once we recognize the reality of race differences, fully and openly, sound ideas will follow. But should we continue to pursue the illusion that our troubles will be ended by more anti-discrimination laws and more hand-wringing about racism, America will become increasingly balkanized, and perhaps cease to exist. Many people say the idea of racial differences is a rationalization for the status quo. This charge gets everything backward. If the races do differ, the reasons for the present state of affairs are not rationalizations, and the state of affairs itself needs no excuses. Suppose one day at the beach you announce that you are going to swim past the breakers. Someone, himself a good swimmer, warns you that you are not strong enough to fight the undertow. Do you instantly attack his motives, and assume he is rationalizing the status quo of his being thought the better athlete? Do you accuse him of trying to talk you into resigning yourself to an inferior status? No. The first thing you would want to know is whether he might be right. If he is, if you aren't able to swim past the breakers safely, there is nothing wrong with the status quo, his advice has probably been offered in good faith, and heeding it may save your life. We must stop attacking unwelcome news about race on the grounds that the messengers have bad motives, and then attack the motives of the messengers on the grounds that what they tell us are lies. When claims of race differences are said to discourage blacks, I ask in reply, if the races are truly not equal in ability, what is gained by pretending they are? What is gained by saying blacks would be as successful and prosperous as whites if the rules were not slanted against them? Which message, the truth or the flattering lie, is more likely to inflame blacks to anger over constant failure? Which one requires so much backing and filling that its dishonesty must sooner or later become obvious to everyone? All right, say my advisors, who in this respect are like most Americans, there are race differences. Now we know what the race problem is. What is the solution? My friends, if a solution is supposed to be some magic formula, some way to make these differences go away or keep them from counting, to make the United States as harmonious as a racially uniform society, there may not be a solution. Looking for that kind of measure may be like trying to build a perpetual motion machine. We had better stop looking for solutions and start trying to do the best we can in the situation facing us. And isn't it a little facile to expect that we can just announce that thinking about race has been misguided for many decades, and then move briskly ahead? New truths, like old ones rediscovered, take time to sink in. When the earth was found to revolve around the sun, refuting the age-old notion that man is the center of the universe, it would have been absurd to ask the very next day, now what? How should religion? 
philosophy and morality adjust to this new development. Major errors must be unlearned. We have to retreat along all the false paths we have taken before we can start up the true one. This process, of accustoming ourselves intellectually and emotionally to thinking about race in new ways, cannot be hurried. I believe the impulse to acknowledge race differences as quickly as possible, and then demand solutions, is yet another effort to avoid the facts themselves. At some point in the future we will have to take concrete steps, and it is my duty as president to suggest some directions in which we might move, as well as some of the obstacles we may encounter. In doing so I must speak in general terms because, as I have said, neither I nor anyone else has all the answers now. A few voices, with new ideas, are beginning to be heard, perhaps this talk tonight will encourage still others. But I must warn you that any useful idea is likely to be radical. As Claudius says in Hamlet, diseases desperate grown, by desperate appliance are relieved, or not at all. It is obvious, to begin with, that policies based on error must end. One such policy is affirmative action, conceived as compensating blacks for the harm done them by whites. No damages are owed when no damage has been done, and the difficulty blacks have in competing in a white world are not the legacy of past wrongs, however regrettable those wrongs may have been, but a result of biology for which whites are not to blame. Affirmative action is an injustice to whites that whites legitimately resent. Ending it will help calm racial tempers. As for more systematic approaches, there are three that can be taken, minimizing race differences, controlling their negative aspects, and laissez-faire. These strategies cut across the conventional classifications of right and left, and they are not mutually exclusive. Nonetheless, they represent different basic orientations. Minimizing, as the name suggests means large-scale social engineering efforts to reduce the race gap as much as possible. The government would undertake job training and job creation for blacks, daycare for the children of trainees and workers, childhood enrichment programs, programs to convince black girls not to have illegitimate children, programs for antisocial youths, and preferences for blacks in employment and the academy, all openly intended to create equality, not right past wrongs. At the international level, reducing race differences would mean support of Africa and Haiti by the United States and prosperous European and Asian countries. One drawback to this approach is white resentment. The richer white majority would have to fund the programs I have mentioned, and, once race differences are widely understood, whites may not wish to make sacrifices to end inequalities they did not cause. As I have said, equality as such is not a value many people find urgent. Advocates of minimizing the race gap might be forced to fall back on the rhetoric of fighting racism to defend policies whose aim is egalitarian, leading to hypocrisy and eventual exposure. A second drawback of the minimizing approach is the uncertainty, indeed the unlikelihood, of success. One of my predecessors thought to combat black crime with basketball leagues, on the theory that young black males turn to crime because of the dreariness of their lives. This theory is very dubious, and treatments based on misdiagnoses seldom work. Training programs geared to individual ability are more promising, but they too may be ineffective, for reasons that require a brief foray into science. Genes help shape human behavior, that can no longer be denied but exactly what genes accomplish depends on their environment. This interplay leads optimists to hope that the input of genes can always be cancelled by manipulating the environment. The truth is that genes often limit what environmental manipulation can accomplish. Some effects of genes cannot be overcome at all, others can be reduced but not eliminated, that is why I have spoken of minimizing, and others still can be reduced only at prohibitive cost. There is no guarantee that the race gap in intelligence, school achievement, productivity, or impulsiveness can be reduced to any significant extent. Certainly, intervention efforts to date give no grounds for optimism. We must be prepared to discover that no amount of training and childhood enrichment can shrink the race gap. 
we must be prepared to recognize, at some point, that further experiments in social engineering would be throwing good money after bad. We must be prepared, in other words, to find minimizing a dead end. Programs to help disadvantaged individuals of all races would avoid some of these problems. However, if training benefits whites more than blacks, another possibility that cannot be ruled out, race blind social engineering will actually increase the race gap. A longer range intervention is use of incentives, including cash payments, to encourage people with desirable traits to have children, and those with undesirable traits to abstain. Some have talked of licensing parents. Consider the fact that college educated black women have proportionally fewer children than college educated white women, while less educated black women have proportionally more children than less educated white women. Encouraging the more intelligent members of all races to reproduce, it is said, would shrink the race gap in intelligence, as well as benefit society in other ways. I oppose these programs. I don't think anyone wants to see the government deciding who should and should not have children. Even using public funds as an incentive to influence private reproductive decisions is highly problematic. And whatever their pros and cons, eugenic measures do not show results for several generations, which in human terms is close to a century. We don't have that much time. Rather than trying to reduce race differences, we might try to control their disruptiveness. Since it is black crime, illegitimacy, and unemployment that deviate from the norms of the dominant society, a control approach would aim to instill self-discipline, respect for law, and the work ethic in blacks. Among the measures that might encourage these traits are the easing of regulatory burdens on black businesses a more efficient criminal justice system, and the restriction of welfare to those employed on public works, or those with legitimate children, or unmarried women who agree to contraception. Perhaps welfare would be ended altogether. Black churches might be informally enlisted. I have no doubt that curtailing public assistance would necessitate more responsible black behavior. The problem with this course of action is that, for better or worse, a great many people have come to depend on public assistance. Hundreds of thousands of women, of all races, but disproportionately black, have illegitimate children, no husband, and no marketable skills. The problem is especially acute in cities, where living off the land is not possible. A little later I will give you my ideas on this subject. Crime control would emphasize discipline, swifter justice, and more effective punishment, possibly corporal punishment for those undeterred by imprisonment. Capital punishment would be a basic element of this approach. One can envisage new technologies such as brain scans and DNA testing that permit monitoring of potential criminals, although the most effective step might simply be a return to now discredited practices, like the chain gang. Measures like these, though they would affect blacks disproportionately, would not be inherently racial. Other anti-crime measures might well be. Race, for instance, might become a legitimate probable cause for police intervention. The police would be allowed to search all black males for weapons, confiscating any they found. The downside of many of these steps is their conflict with traditional civil liberties, potential overbroadness, and the risk of provoking disorder. At the same time, many blacks might be willing to surrender some civil liberties to restore the level of order their communities knew in earlier eras. It would be useful to poll blacks on this matter. Both the minimizing and control approaches call for government intervention, although they disagree about what sort. Opposed to both is classical laissez-faire liberalism, the policy, or non-policy of leaving almost everything to the free market. The laissez-faire approach would also end all forms of public assistance, on the moral ground that people should not be forced to support each other as well as the practical ground that it encourages sloth. At the same time, all laws against private discrimination would be repealed, allowing individuals to live, work, and trade with whomever they please. Private affirmative action would be allowed. Those who continue to feel that blacks deserve compensation, 
or that preferring blacks is desirable for some other reason, would be free to do so, as would those who prefer whites, and those who wish to ignore race. One can imagine various sorts of bargaining going on, as both black and white workers sought employment with discriminators by offering, for instance, to accept lower wages. Firms that prefer whites, those that prefer blacks, and those that prefer merit would compete against each other, in a real world test of which policy is most efficient. This prospect may be called turning back the clock, but if many people have a strong wish to associate with others of their own race, fighting this natural impulse by insisting that they live, work, and attend school with members of other races only heightens animosity. A laissez faire government, aiming at efficiency, would be largely race neutral. Merit hiring and contracting with lowest bidders are cheaper than quotas and set asides. However, as classical liberals regard control of violence as a key government function, they might permit some race consciousness in the area of crime. As they have traditionally been civil libertarians as well, a balance would have to be struck on measures like race based surveillance. The free market accommodates race differences more easily than the other two approaches, since it does not aim at a preset outcome that biology may have put out of reach. It imposes discipline. A woman who knows that she alone will be responsible for herself and a baby she bears will be more careful about having babies. In the long run, letting the racial chips fall where they may is an attractive prospect. But in the short run, as I have said, ending welfare will leave many in the lurch. Various temporary measures might soften these consequences. Announcing on a certain date that all forms of public assistance will end in five years, with support to be gradually reduced each year in the meanwhile, would give everyone time to seek work, help from private sources, or new skills from temporary public training programs. Present recipients of welfare with very young children could be grandfathered in. A basic problem during this transition and in a post-welfare world, again I will be blunt, is that the labor of many blacks is not valuable to most people, and will become less valuable as brain power becomes more important in an increasingly high-tech world. Consequently, I urge the repeal of the minimum wage. A black whose skills cannot command $5 an hour may yet find someone willing to pay him $1 an hour and it must be possible for him to accept employment at that rate. Many people recoil at such a prospect as if it were a return to feudalism, but it is surely better that a laborer with limited skills receive a low salary for work that snobs consider demeaning than that he find no work at all. Other legislation and regulation that increases the cost of hiring low-skilled labor should be repealed. A commonplace of contemporary Kant is worry that blacks can only get dead-end jobs, which forgets that it is the individual who is obliged to make himself useful to others. I cannot promise that that segment of the black underclass grown dependent on public funds will find the end of welfare painless. And similar dilemmas are developing at the international level. The African population is outstripping its capacity to grow or buy food, and is being ravaged by AIDS. Interventionists will want the United States to take collective action. Others will insist that American taxpayers not be forced to support anyone else. But above all, we must not assume that help is possible. Perhaps the cycle of overpopulation and starvation in black Africa is beyond human control. Triage, the denial of scarce resources to those past help, may be unavoidable. These are hard sayings, but I remind you again that not every problem has an agreeable solution. We must learn to live with reality as it is, not as we wish it to be. Cutting across the three approaches I have outlined is the divide between race consciousness and race blindness. Right now public policy is a schizophrenic jumble of both. For example, attorneys may not consider race in peremptorily challenging jurors, yet the racial makeup of juries is carefully monitored for enough blacks. Consistency and coherence should be restored. Now you might imagine that if race differences exist, it automatically follows that they should always be taken into account. This is not so. Social policy can acknowledge race differences while reducing the relevance of race far below its present level. 
the approach I have in mind might be called realistic race blindness, racial classifications are never to be used, but disparate impact is accepted as a natural consequence of race differences. Of any course of action, the race blind realist asks, is it a good idea apart from its racial impact? Would we follow it if races did not exist? If the answer is yes we should follow it, with eyes open to the likelihood that it will affect the races differently. Disparate impact is anticipated but discounted, never allowed to exercise a veto. Let me illustrate how this rule would treat an issue facing educators, the grouping of students by ability. The main argument in favor of tracking, as it is also called, is that it allows bright students to be challenged without being held back by slow learners, and slow learners to move at their own pace without falling behind. Realistic race blindness would accept tracking if the only argument against it were that it places disproportionately many blacks in the slower groups. Decide what is best on educational grounds, according to this attitude, and accept racial stratification as a byproduct of differences in intelligence. This rule would sometimes be difficult to apply. Reasons for balking are always ready to hand when disparate impact looms. I have heard educators say, to my mind preposterously, that tracking harms the bright student, when what really bothers them, I suspect, is white and Asian dominance of classes for the gifted. Race blindness is impossible without recognition that differences in ability will assert themselves in almost every facet of life. I have already mentioned that race might be used as one among many predictors of crime. Yet most crime control measures could be race blind. The basic equation of social order is that, other things being equal, crime falls when its cost rises, so crime can be reduced by making punishment swifter, surer, and more disagreeable. Limits on appeals, corporal punishment, and the application of new technologies are, as I pointed out, inherently race neutral. Realistic race blindness would have us evaluate such steps on their own merits, while recognizing that any measure to curb crime will affect blacks more than whites. It is hard to balance a tolerable level of crime against the measures necessary to attain it, but race blind realism keeps the prospect of disparate impact off the scales. Some issues, though, present a different picture. One is public assistance. A purely race-blind assessment of welfare would focus on just three points. The morality of taxing Peter to support Paul, the incentives created by welfare, and the consequences of ending it, all the while recognizing that, since black families are many times more likely than white families to receive public assistance, any cutback will affect blacks disproportionately. Yet black and white responses to welfare seem to differ in ways that must be taken into account. For many years before 1960, when public assistance as we know it did not exist, the black illegitimacy was a flat 16%. This was far above the white illegitimacy of that period, but still below the 70% it is approaching. White illegitimacy has also risen, but not nearly as much, and, while both trends are disturbing, the steeper black increase seems tied to a greater willingness on the part of blacks to rely on public assistance. If reducing black illegitimacy is important, welfare policy may reasonably take this race difference into account. Explicit consideration of race, or realistic race consciousness, would be triggered by a two-part test. A policy's racial impact is to be taken into account when individual reactions to the policy cannot be predicted, but it is known that blacks and whites will on average react to it in significantly different ways. Welfare reform meets this test because, while no one can tell how any particular teenage girl is going to be influenced by the availability of public subsidies for illegitimate children, teenage blacks are on average more likely than teenage whites to take advantage of it. Hence the two-part test permits race consciousness about welfare. Likewise, it is impossible to measure the maturity of every youthful offender, but if blacks mature more quickly than whites on average, which scientists tell us they may well do, black offenders might be treated as adults at an earlier age than white offenders. If blacks are on average less deterred than whites by the punishments currently attached to crime, 
and deterrence is an important goal. The two-part tests says that race can be taken into account in sentencing. It may be that, while the objectivity of particular jurors cannot be measured in advance, blacks tend on average to side with black victims and defendants regardless of the evidence in interracial cases. If so, the two-part test permits the exclusion of black jurors from such cases. It may be that blacks tend on average to be less subjective than whites about black defendants no matter what the victim's race, in which case the two-part test sanctions limits on the number of blacks in juries. I present the option of realistic race consciousness to make clear that there is nothing wrong in principle with taking race into account. Nonetheless, I expect that in practice realistic race blindness will usually prove superior. Equity and efficiency seldom requires explicit attention to race. I would also encourage people to use realistic race blind standards for personal behavior. Should you wish to write a letter to the editor criticizing rap music on aesthetic grounds, and all that stops you is fear of insulting the taste of blacks, write the letter. If your children and their friends want to form a science club, but you fear it will exclude blacks because blacks are less interested in science, help them form the club anyway if you think it is otherwise a good idea. Private decisions that are sound apart from their racial side effects are sound, period. Every course of action I have described requires complete candor. We cannot try to close the race gap unless we recognize it for what it is and assess progress or its lack, accordingly. We cannot control black crime unless we are honest about its causes. We cannot have a free market unless we are prepared for racial stratification. Classroom presentations of cultural diversity that evade race differences are deceitful. Speech codes and sensitivity training in universities should end. Centuries of warfare between enlightenment and obscurantism have made it plain that enlightenment is always better. I will give you two examples of what we cannot have. In 1974, a journal of social thought published an article one whose authors, while disavowing the use of force against hereditarians, accepted responsibility for the chance that their readers might misunderstand them and take violent action. During the same period, an article in Scientific American concluded, In the present racial climate of the U.S., studies on racial differences in IQ, however well-intentioned, could easily be misinterpreted as a form of racism and lead to an unnecessary accentuation of racial tensions. Since we believe that, for the present at least, no good case can be made for such studies on either scientific or practical grounds, we do not see any point in particularly encouraging the use of public funds for their support. Too. There is a case for limiting public funds for science to research that bears on national security. But defunding should not be used as a threat to silence unpopular opinions. I am not alone in deploring censorship, but I believe racial censors are often misunderstood. I am convinced they do not think of themselves as seeking to suppress harmful truths, but as protecting the public, and particularly blacks, from harmful untruths. Were they to admit the reality of race differences, to themselves as well as others, they would no longer see merit in censorship. The issue underlying censorship is, once again, whether the races do in fact differ, and that, I reassure you, can no longer be denied. I understand, and regret, that talk of genetic differences will upset many blacks. Nobody wishes to hear his group called unintelligent. I don't like to think that my words may distress or seem to demean my black friends and associates, and I wish I did not have to say what I am saying tonight. Let me emphasize, in this connection, that race differences are no excuse for personal unpleasantness. Members of each race should continue to treat members of every other race with the same courtesy they expect to receive. No one should adopt an attitude of superiority in individual encounters. The fact remains, though, that certain distressing truths about group characteristics need to be said, and everyone, black and white, must come to terms with them. It seems cruel to speak in what seems a negative way of a racial group because people don't choose the race they belong to. At the same time, 
Most people acquire their religious convictions early in life, and have no more choice in being offended by perceived insults to their faith than by slights against their race, yet we do not for that reason refrain from criticizing religion or otherwise saying things that give offense. Many religious persons are disturbed by Darwinism, but few people oppose open discussion of evolution. Loss of cherished illusions and abandonment of dreams is often the price of wisdom. The impossibility of our hopes is seen first as a crisis, then a chronic problem, then, finally, accepted as part of the human condition. So it will be with race. And, while the feelings of blacks deserve respect, so do those of whites. Not only have whites, particularly white males, been made to pay reparations for what they did not do, they have been vilified and ridiculed in public discourse to an extent unthinkable for other groups. They must be permitted to defend themselves, and if calling attention to unwelcome facts about non-whites is part of their defense, that too must be allowed. When Neil Spoer realized that atomic fission could be harnessed in a weapon, his assessment was terse, we are in a completely new situation. So is America at the end of the 20th century. There has never been a society as racially heterogeneous as ours, and we are just now realizing that almost everything that happens between the races has a biological component. Race matters. The rethinking forced on us by this great fact will not be easy. Let it begin, bravely and honestly. Thank you.